Chapter 26. The 220-Year Gap. Part 4. Yes. Especially the Magicians Association and the Medical Association will buy it at an expensive price. I heard from the princess that you put your life on the line to distract the dragon, so she could escape. It somehow worked out that way. Everyone is talking about that story. There are a lot of people who want to hear your tale of heroism. Ha ha ha. Azel laughed awkwardly. Truthfully, he did more than just distract the dragon. He had killed it, but he couldn't say that. He had decided it wasn't time to reveal everything about himself. Also, I'm too weak to boast about killing a dragon. The dragon Macon, which he was able to use through an arrangement made by Carlos, was the main reason why he was able to defeat the Earth Dragon. If he didn't have the dragon Macon, then he would have been eaten after losing. However, Azel had earned a lot of things through the fight. The magical energy from the dragon Macon had flowed into his energy pulse, and while it remained there, he was able to absorb it through meditation. Then he was able to take a part of the dragon's strength through the dragon slayer's ritual. This in turn made Azel's body more powerful. A seed of strength that could never be earned through training was planted in Azel's body. Also, his magical energy had greatly increased. His energy pulse became sturdier, and he had completed dual banding his first ring of life. Also, his second ring of life was nearly finished. The fact that he was able to construct the dual banding into reality was a huge accomplishment. From theory to tests, he had gathered enough evidence that said it would succeed but he had no idea if it would actually work. He succeeded in constructing an analogous model using animal experimentation, but when using the magical energy on himself, he didn't know what variables might pop up. However, he had deployed it in practice, and he had now confirmed the theory through the advantages he learned while building the structure. What would have happened if the dragon slayer's ritual didn't happen? His magical energy had steeply increased because he had taken the dragon's power, and the dual band was formed from it. This was his lucky break, but it also left much to be desired. He had skipped the trial and error process, and he was drunk off the fruit of success. He knew he should count his blessing and stop complaining. However, in Azul's perspective, he couldn't help but feel a sense of frustration. I was able to gather dragon demon magic to that degree. When he took the dragon's power, Azul's magical energy slightly took on the properties of dragon demon magic. Unlike regular magic, it was able to alter the present surrounding just by emitting it. It was the basis for making the dragon Macon. However, he still had to travel a long road before he was able to make the dragon Macon again. Giles spoke. Princess declared that you have the right to receive a certain portion of the compensation from the dragon's corpse. Who, Princess wanted to tell you directly about the compensation, so you could look forward to that. I'm looking forward to it. Azel didn't really mean what he said. Giles spoke. Also, I heard that you are following the princess back to the capital as an escort. It somehow worked out that way. I guess we'll spend a good amount of time together. I was also assigned to the troops escorting her. Ah, I guess so. I've lost a lot of subordinates so I'm not too happy being reassigned to this mission. Azel watched Giles smiling bitterly, so he kept his mouth shut. When the dragon's shadow attacked the ruin excavation site, Giles' unit suffered a major loss. He was able to recover a lot of them, but around one-third of his unit was killed. However, it is better to be inserted into a military force where I am needed rather than becoming an experienced rookie commander with nothing to do. Let's get along. The Western Border Guard wasn't able to transfer many troops into Arietta's escort. Therefore, they decided to reassign people like Giles, whose competence was guaranteed. Azel replied, Please take care of me. Soon, they arrived at the location of the dragon's corpse. However, the site was much different than what Azel had expected. The dragon's corpse wasn't transported here intact. It was cut and distributed into a couple dozen barrels. I guess they couldn't just move the whole thing. It would be possible if they used a large cart used to transport large scale of goods. However, one need a well-maintained road for it to be a workable solution. If they wanted to bring a dragon's corpse, which was fallen in the middle of a forest, then they had no choice but to hack it into pieces. Soon, Azel spotted Arietta within the crowd. 
I've come at your summons. Him. You came. I had no idea a dragon's corpse could be turned into money. In Azul's time, magicians used various parts of a dragon's corpse. If the dragon's blood was processed, then one could make magic recovery potion or wound medication. The bones, scales and leather was so tough that it was used as ingredients for weapons or armor. However, he never thought that it could be exchanged for money. Arietta spoke. I had no idea either. This is the first time I've seen a dead dragon. The scouting party's magician saw it and he advised us to collect it with haste. We followed his direction, so he brought it here after dismembering it. However, there is one thing that is bothering me. What is it? The dragon's eyes are missing. The eyes both disappeared as if it had been scooped out. Do you have any theory as to why someone would do this? Him. I have no idea. Azel shook his head from side to side. When he defeated the earth dragon, he hadn't damaged the eyes. However, the eyes had disappeared as if it had been scooped out. Arietta lowered her voice and spoke. Those bastards might have done it. The probability is high. The bastards they were talking about were, of course, the dragon's shadow. A magician would have known the value of a dragon's corpse. It wasn't strange that someone had avoided the eyes of the western border guards to only dig out the dragon's eyes. Arietta spoke. I've heard the dragon eyes are sources of powerful magical energy. This is unfortunate. Well, we can do nothing about it. We are fortunate that they weren't able to get their hands on the heart. I guess so. I heard the heart was entirely ripped apart. It's possible since it had fought against another dragon. Is that so? Arietta smiled at Azel, who was obviously lying. It was a smile of an accomplice that shared the same secret. Regina was a follower who had a relatively high position in the secret organization called the Dragon's Shadow. However, she couldn't be compared to the member that was considered to be the backbone of the organization. I see. You failed. The woman who spoke held a high position that couldn't even be compared to Regina. She had long black hair and dark brown eyes. She looked to be in her late twenties and she was a cold beauty. She didn't look like a dragon demon. She looked like a pure human. But Regina knew she had changed her original appearance through magic. She spoke. You lost a lot of your comrades. I'm sorry. You don't really look like you are sorry. For a mere job of kidnapping the dragon demon princess, you mobilized that much manpower yet you failed. Do you have any excuse? There probably won't be a better opportunity to kidnap her. When she thought of the powerful dragon demon princess Arietta, she thought it was ridiculous to use the expression, mere. However, the manpower she had rounded up would have been enough to finish the job. There were four dragon demon and two high-level human mages. It was true that Arietta was powerful, but if one assessed her power, three of the members deployed could have overpowered her. Nevertheless, Regina had failed. However, she had an excuse. There was an unexpected disruptor. Regina gave a detailed report about Azel. At first, the black-haired lady listened apathetically, but her complexion turned serious mid-report when Regina mentioned a certain event. Wait, did you just say Dragon Slayer's ritual? Yes, yes, I did. Did that man really say it was the Dragon Slayer's ritual? I'm sure of it. Can you guarantee it with your life on the line? A cold energy assaulted her senses. Her murderous intent made one hard to breath. Regina spoke, while she gulped. Yes, this isn't something we can dismiss. The black-haired lady mumbled seriously. Regina carefully asked a question. May I ask what this Dragon Slayer's ritual is? You may not. It is a level of information you aren't allowed to know. First, carefully tell me what you had seen and heard. At those words, Regina carefully told her the rest of the story. Azel had requested the Dragon Slayer's ritual, and the Earth Dragon had accepted. Then they started to fight. When she went back afterwards, the Earth Dragon had already died. The Western border guards were mobilized, so I was only able to bring this. Regina brought out two red globes and it was as big as a small child's body. It was the dragon eyes. As Arietta had guessed, Regina had dug the dragon eyes out, while she avoided detection from the western border guards. The black-haired lady held it up in her hands. Then the two dragon eyes started floating into the air. 
There was a person who knew about the dragon slayer's ritual, and he also killed the dragon. I have no idea if that man killed it. It is true that he possessed frightening skills, but it is hard to see him being able to fight one on one against a dragon. Moreover, if one considers the storm that occurred there, I think another dragon intruded. That is impossible. Regina gave a logical deduction, but the black haired lady flatly denied it. She spoke while she carefully observed the dragon eyes. There is no way such an event would have occurred if the dragon slayer's ritual was being held. Moreover, the proof is in the dragon eyes. Yes. How? There isn't even 20% of original magical energy left inside the eyes. The eyes of a dragon was a powerful source of magical energy. After the heart, it had the most magical energy within a dragon's body. However, Azel had stolen the essence of power from the dead earth dragon through the dragon slayer's ritual. Therefore, most of the power a dragon's eyes usually held was mostly gone. Since Regina had never killed a dragon, she wasn't aware of this fact. She just assumed the dragon eyes held powerful magical energy. However, the black-haired lady immediately saw through to the truth. She spoke. You should use this. Yes. But. It is your reward. Regina became confused at those words. She had failed in her mission and she had lost valuable manpower. She had thought she would be punished. To minimize it, she had told the lady about Azel and she also gave her the dragon eyes. Instead, she received a reward. However, the black-haired lady didn't elaborate any further. Who who, Azel Zestringer. For those who worshipped the dragon demon king, it was an unbearably ill-omened name. When they ran across anyone with the name Azel, they killed them all no matter if they were young or old. It is a name with a lot of sin. This is interesting. I'll have to see him at least once. The black-haired lady wore a cold smile and she started walking into the darkness. Chapter 27. Raised Social Status. Part 1. He had a dream. It was a dream about the distant past. However, his dream was vivid as if it had happened not too long ago. It was that kind of dream. This must be a dream. Azel dumbly thought to himself. He was familiar with having a lucid dream. A normal person would question how this was possible. However, spirit order practitioners learn how to control the mind, so he had experienced a lot of lucid dreams until he was sick of it. If he wanted to, it was possible for him to induce a lucid dream. However, this dream had nothing to do with his intent. In the dream, Azel was with someone within the ruins of a castle. At one time, the castle had boasted to be the most majestic in the world. This was the castle where the dragon demon king Atain had presided. There aren't any useful things left here. He heard an apologetic voice. When he looked to his side, Carlos was there. Azel was accustomed to his looks. He was a youthful magician with tidy brown hair, and cold grey eyes. Those hairs will disappear in a couple decades, and his head will be smooth. Those thoughts were the first thing that came into his mind. However, he couldn't help it since the aged Carlos look was too shocking. Carlos had no idea what Azel was thinking, and he started to sigh. That damn bastard Atain didn't leave anything behind in his research lab, even though he is a magician. Carlos had used every means imaginable to find a way to dispel the curse put on Azel by Atain. They had searched this castle a couple dozen times to find even a minor clue. However, it was fruitless. Atain's extensive collection of magical tomes didn't have any clues on how to release Azel from the curse. The lab had a surprising amount of magical products, but it didn't have anything of interest. Azel consoled his friend. Atain may be the very first magician. It is to be expected that he would be different from other magicians. The dragon demon race created the skill called magic. Moreover, Atain was the first of the dragon demon race to be born into this world and he reigned over them as king. This was why some magicians hypothesized that Atain was the progenitor of magic. Carlos became angry. Don't talk about it as if it's someone else's business. It is a problem with your life on the line. I know that. If you know that then why are you so calm? I can't be mad at someone who I know is trying the hardest in this world to solve my problem. Carlos' face reddened. He was embarrassed. Azel was dignified when facing the threat of death. 
yet he was the one who had lost it. I'm scared too, Carlos. The current Azel smiled bitterly when he saw the scene inside his dream. Yes, Azel was also afraid. He had saved the world, but his future couldn't be saved. Death was approaching closer by the hour, and he might succumb to it. Truthfully, he had been afraid and he wanted to cry. He preferred the idea of dying in battle, where he would die when he lost. He would be able to stay indifferent until that single moment would come. It was harder to bear the suffocating fear of a death that was slowly approaching him. However, he felt a fire burn in the corner of his heart when he thought this. Atain, the only thing you could take away from me was my life. Azel was determined to not let him have his own way. Above all, he didn't want to disappoint his friend who was desperately working for him. Even if his efforts were a failure, he never wanted his friend to see him in a disheveled state. He wanted to show a confident and proud figure until the end. It was all for show and it was a childish behavior. However, as a man who had charged into battle while grasping his sword, what would be left if one took away his bravado? He kept up this facade with his life on the line, so no one would disparage him. If he thought back on it, he thought the bravado definitely helped Carlos. Azel, I really, it feels like we have switched places. I feel the same. I would have never imagined this day would come. It was the opposite in the Dragon Demon War. Azel was still inexperienced, and whenever he couldn't hold back his emotions, Carlos's cool attitude acted as the cold water that doused him. Whenever the group was tired or desperate, he was the one person who didn't falter. In the moment when everyone faltered, he withstood everything like a steel beam. He was their support. Carlos was a man who had taken on this role. However, after Azel was cursed, their roles had been reversed. Azel should be the one in greatest agony, but he put up a front. He acted as if he wasn't shaken. He had to become the supporting pillar for Carlos, who at times, was about to fall apart from despair. As the two passed through the ruins, they finally reached a Tyne's office. There were words carved into the half-broken wall with magic. The one who treats the world with hate must be prepared to be hated by the world. The moment Azel read those words he could guess who had written it. Dragon Demon King Atain. He had tried to conquer the world yet did he understand the significance of his action? Carlos asked a question. What was the Dragon Demon King's thinking when he tried to conquer the world? The Dragon Demon race was born far back in the past. The very first of the Dragon Demon race, Atain, was a special existence. He had a much longer lifespan compared to the others of the Dragon Demon race. He had lived for more than a thousand years. He was the seed that started the dragon demon race. He might also be the progenitor of the mysteries called magic. Why did he join up with the others of his race to conquer the world? Countless number of people had put their life on the line to fight Atain, but no one knew Atain's real intention, which he held within his heart. Azel was the one exception. Inside Azel's mind, Atain's words brushed by. Unfortunately, this experiment was a failure. I'm still ignorant. I have no choice but to accept this truth. These words made Azel shiver. If Atain had revealed his ambitions, then he would have snorted. He would have laughed it off, if Atain like a typical magician gave a long-winded speech regarding his delusions of grandeur. However, when he was about to face his death, Atain boldly accepted his failure. Moreover, he said that the chaotic events that turned the world upside was merely an experiment, Azel. If you are the sword the world had aimed at me, then I'll break you using my life as the price. You and I will die together. After he said those words, the curse came down on Azel. Azel spoke after he briefly thought about the past. Carlos. Ha! Huh, you, your head will lose all its hair. What? The past had already happened, but he never had this conversation. That difference destroyed the dream world. Azel continued to speak as the world inside his dream crumbled. However, Carlos, you are one hell of a man. You deserve to be called an archmage. This was the praise Azel wanted to give wholeheartedly to his friend, who was long gone. While the dragon demon princess Arietta stayed in the western border fortress, Azel trained his body and spirit order. He also spent the time peacefully reading the sparse number of books in the library. 
Giles spoke. Your magical energy has increased considerably within the past few days. First, I'm not trying to train my magical pulse by expanding my magical energy. My progress is faster since I am trying to recover what I have lost. Azul's words were half-truths. In just four days of training, he had absorbed a considerable amount of power from the Dragon Slayer's ritual, and he was able to finish making his second ring of life. His magical energy had increased several magnitudes since he had left the ruin site. Since his magical energy had increased, it meant Azel could use his technique more easily now. The power he could release and the amount of magical energy accumulated inside his body was much larger. He could overwhelm Giles now if they sparred. However, Azel didn't reveal his cultivation, so he let Giles win. He decided he would be careful. He didn't want his action to be too preposterous. After he spent the four days this way, Arietta decided to leave the western border fortress to head towards the palace. Azel woke up early on the morning they would depart towards the palace. He mediated once and he lightly stretched his body. Then he put on the equipment he was given the previous day. Azel told the dragon princess that he only need one sword, but since he was guarding her, she insisted on giving him a leather armor. Him. It has been a while. Before he fell asleep, Azel was a prestigious knight so he used to wear a full body armor enchanted with magic. Prior to one becoming a knight and earning a title of nobility, most soldiers lived with having poor equipments. The leather armor was new and of good quality since it was from the military supply, but it made him think of those time. After he finished arming himself, Azel headed toward the infirmary before he went to the designated location. Yo! He gave a greeting. Rick had woken up early to get ready for his daily work. You are leaving today. Yes. I owe you a lot. Rick, I think you have already paid back enough of what was owed me. Rick put out his hand, and Azel clasped it. Then they shared a fierce handshake. Rick spoke. If you earn a promotion while serving the princess then don't forget about me. Then I don't think I'll ever return. I would do the same. Rick smirked while he spoke. I hope you recover your memories. I'm sure you, Azel, aren't of common birth. Thank you. Azel shared goodbyes with Rick and he headed toward the designated location. No one was there yet, but Giles and another person soon showed up. The other man looked to be a young knight, and he was of similar age as Azel. Azel gave his greetings. Good morning, Sir Giles. You are early. Azel had come 20 minutes before the appointed time. He decided it wouldn't do him any good to show up later than the others. However, no one was there when he arrived. Giles had arrived afterwards, but he was an exception. Giles introduced the young knight he had arrived with. This is Sir Bor. He is a member of the escort group, who had traveled here with the princess. Sir Bor, this is. I've heard of him. He was lucky enough to escape with his life, thanks to the princess. What? Giles stared back at him, while being taken aback. The young knight named Bor had tidy brown hair, and he possessed blue eyes. He gave off an impression of being an arrogant young noble. He had a condescending expression on his face, which reinforced this impression. The princess can't be helped. I have no idea what her intention are. I don't get why she would bring a man of unknown origin into the escort party, when she already has competent knights. Anyways, you better not get in our way. Just stay quiet. At that moment, Azel was flabbergasted. He blanked out for a moment, but he suddenly had a thought. Should I beat up this bastard? Before he fell asleep, after he became the Duke Kazakh, there weren't that many people that had big enough balls to be this rude towards him. Before the Dragon Demon War ended, there were some who were like that, but they all came to regret it in the end. Azel was trying to suppress his rising violent impulses when Bor spoke as if he had remembered something. He looked towards Azel. Well, now that I think about it, we don't have that many members. I guess we need a guy to be an errand boy. Sir Bor, your words are too harsh. Him, what about my words? When Giles butted in, Bor acted as if there was something wrong with him. His expression indicated that he genuinely didn't see what the problem was with his words. Giles was momentarily speechless when he saw the other's attitude. However, soon he put on a determined expression then he spoke. 
Chapter 28. Raised Social Status. Part 2. Azel performed a great meritorious deed by safely bringing the, the princess here. Are you going to ignore what the princess said? How could her words be true? Sir Giles, you don't know about this, but the princess is excessively lenient towards her underlings. Moreover, if she had faced an enemy that could threaten her, how could a man with an unknown background be able to perform such meritorious deed? Would that make any sense? Also, doesn't he look weak? How could he help the princess with such a frail body? Azul's body didn't have much muscles yet. Of course, his body was frail compared to a thoroughly trained knight. Even if that was true, Bor's every word had the power of being able to provoke a person. Azel suddenly poured too much strength into his fist, and it almost creaked aloud. However, he was barely able to hold himself back. This bastard's personality is really in the sewers. Ah, should I really just beat him up? Should I wait until the princess comes, and ask her to knight me then beat him up? Currently, Azel controlled the energy he emitted outward, so he evoked an atmosphere of familiarity without any pressure. However, it didn't matter what kind of impression Azel had possessed, the other had dismissed him at first glance. Azel's effort was all for naught since his opponent didn't bother to see what kind of person he was. He was armed with a firm prejudice. Bohr mocked him. Well, Sir Giles, you probably don't know much about the princess since you are in such a remote region. However, you are also going on a long journey back to the royal palace, so you better engrave my words in your heart. He was blatantly looking down on Sir Giles. He must have a high enough position in the royal palace to guard the princess, so Giles must have looked like a backwater country bumpkin to him. Giles glared at him. Bohr's expression looked down on him as if he was daring Giles to say something. The tension between the two was high. The volatile atmosphere was broken due to Arietta arriving. Everyone has gathered. Arietta and Honora appeared together. Unlike her usual self, she wore a voluminous hat, and it covered the upper portion of her head and her horns. It also covered her pointy ears. She wore a thick traveling cloak to hid her figure. Giles and Bors retracted the hostility they were aiming at each other, and they paid their respects to her. Azel queried in confusion, what do mean by everyone? I meant what I said. All the party members have assembled. Arietta answered him. Azel was surprised at those word. What? Five people is everyone? Yes. No. How is that? Arietta had asked him to be part of her escort, and Azel had thought there would be additional several dozens of troops that would also follow. Originally, didn't she come here with about twenty soldiers following her? My escort party members, the magicians and the scholars will return at a later date. Three from her thirty-member party was killed during the ambush by the dragon's shadow. Moreover, there were eleven wounded. Arietta ignored the objection from all the others, and she decided to take at most only two members. She decided to return to the royal palace in haste. Actually, I thought about putting on a disguise, but unfortunately it is impossible. A disguise? My appearance is too eye-catching, so I considered disguising myself with magic. However, after I consulted with the magicians, they did not have any magic that could do that. They said it was impossible for them to cast such magic. It is unfortunate. Arietta was a dragon demon, and the dragon demon magic resisted outside magic being used on her. Therefore, it was impossible for a middling magician to make changes to her. Arita asked a question. I tried to dress up so I wouldn't be too noticeable. How do I look? You look very noticeable. Is that so? Arietta was a little bit depressed when Azel spoke truthfully. She had insisted on wearing a large fluffy hat, and a cape. In her own way, she tried hard to hide her eye-catching appearance. However, the outfit itself was so ridiculous that it stood out. Even if she hid her horns, ears and the dragon demon stone on the back of her hands, her appearance was enough to draw everyone's eyes to her. Arietta let out a sigh. Honora was also opposed to it. Well, it's better than outright revealing oneself. Even if it is a platitude, I'll thankfully listen to it. Still, isn't it dangerous to go with such little manpower? Arietta seriously answered Azul's question. Him. If I'm being honest, I think it is more dangerous to have middling number of people. 
I guess that makes sense. The statement could be seen as overly dismissive of the escort's military prowess. However, he had fought against the dragon's shadow, so he agreed with her. If they had an overwhelming advantage in numbers then he would have no problem with it. However, the 20 to 30 party members would just make them a bigger target. Azel queried, is Muzanora leaving with us? Yes. Is it wise to do so? My thoughts exactly, so I tried to prevent her. Arietta looked at Anora, while sighing. Anora was making a stubborn expression. Arietta had told Anora in the night that she should stay here, and she should come with the other party. I can never do that. If I did, then I'll be hit with a bolt of lightning from the head maid. Does princess want to make my body ineligible for marriage? She had no idea why staying here would affect her marriage prospects. Honora cried and clung to her. Sir Arietta had given in. I had no idea this child was so fearless. Until now, her other personal maids hadn't been that courageous. Once she left the palace to go to the battlefield, every personal maid turned pale, and they wanted to quit. It really is as the head maid said. There aren't anyone else as competent as this child. Arietta had been taken aback when the head maid tagged Honora as her personal maid. She was still very young, and it had only been half a year since she had joined the palace maids. Amongst the palace maids, there were young girls. However, most of them were in charge of doing minor tasks, while they learned the duties of a palace maid. It was normal for a highly trained maid to be assigned to the members of the royal family, who held high stations. The head maid went against those customs, and she had assigned Honora to Arietta as a personal maid. She was not only tasked to serve her in the palace, but she was tasked to act as an aide when Arietta travelled outside. Her choice was correct. Honora had gone through hardship that couldn't even be compared to what the previous personal maid had gone through, yet she didn't show any signs of wanting to quit. She wondered how the poet Barry raised his daughter. Honora queried, There is no one here to take care of Princess, and I can't send you off with males only. Also, she spoke strongly, while looking at the men. Don't tell me you don't have any confidence in being able to protect me. Him. Does that even need to be said? Relax and follow me. I'll solve any danger we face. For a knight following the rules of chivalry, it isn't an exaggeration to say a knight without his pride is basically a corpse. Bohr had succeeded in entering the royal knights at a young age, so he was of this mould. After Honora's spoken words had bristled his pride, he immediately pounded his chest, and he boasted. Azel smiled bitterly. What you say has some merit. Him. Well, it can't be helped since everything has been decided. No matter how one saw it, Honora was a really tough girl. If she had grown up sheltered, then she wouldn't be this way. Maybe she had experienced many dangerous situations in her childhood. Arietta spoke. We are traveling as a small group, so we'll ride the horses instead of the carriage. Honora. Yes. I'm not sure if you can ride a horse. I know how to. Ha. Huh. I'm not proficient at it, but I learned it alongside my brother. That is surprising. Impressive. Arietta was surprised. She hadn't expected a 12-year-old noble girl, who had come to the palace to work, had learned horsemanship. Great. Honora, Azel and I will go pick some horses. The three of them immediately went to the fortress stable. When they were far from Giles and Boar, Arietta started to speak. I'm sorry you had to go through that unpleasantness. You know about it. My ears are unnecessarily sensitive, so I heard it even from a distance. Arietta laughed bitterly. Then she turned to look at Azel. Sir Boar was a knight recommended to me by the head of my escort party, who had travelled with me here. I told them I wanted to travel with small party. However, both the commander of this place and the head of the escort begged me to take at least one of their numbers. Arietta wasn't in a situation where she could turn down the request. When she said yes, the commander of Western Border Guard picked Giles and the head of escort party chose Boar. Arietta spoke. I don't know much about Sir Giles, but I've heard Sir Boar is quite skilled. If he wasn't, he would have been chosen in a situation where only one person can be sent. He is a cord rope master. How were you able to tell? Arietta asked in surprise. Azel smirked. He didn't make much effort to hide it. Well, he'll be of some help in a battle. 
Azel didn't like Bor, but he decided to make an assessment in a detached manner. Azel had read him instantly, and by looking at how he controlled his energy, he knew Bor's skill was up to a decent level. Arietta asked a question, while she put on a playful smile. How do he compare to you? Him. Do you want a serious answer? Yes. If I fight him in my current condition, I could cut off his head with three strikes. Azel spoke in a calm voice, and his brutal words made Arietta hold her breath. Azel saw Honora flinch, besides Arietta, and Azel smiled bitterly at his mistake. My language was a bit too excessive. Anyways, I think Sir Bor is completely overlooking me. I understand. Sir Bor has no idea about you, but he was able to get on your nerves. Will he not try hard to get on my nerves from here on out? This was why I thought of something. What is it? I'll bear it with my eyes closed. After Princess knights me, I'll challenge him to a duel. You'll shut your eyes and bear being knighted by me. I can't believe you said it that way. There are many men who dream about that exact situation happening to them. I'm sorry. However, I'm not in a situation where I want to be tied down, so I don't want to do this. I'll have to either be patient with him or... Or, I guess I'll rely on princess authority. That doesn't sound very manly. He seems to come from a decent family. He is acting this way because he trusts his background. What can I do? My origin is not known, so I can only fight back using my background as princess bodyguard. You spoke truthfully. Arietta was dumbfounded, so she laughed. I've never heard such pathetic words since I've been born. I can't believe you are this bold and shameless. You don't like it. I'm okay with it. It's really mystifying. Arietta shook her head and asked a question. So should this be your reward for all you have done for me? Ha! Huh, you don't have to be tied down by me. I'm saying I'll knight you. At those words, Azel stared blankly at her for a moment. If someone from the royal family with the qualification of being a liege appointed a knight then it was par for the course for the person to require the knight to serve only him or her. However, there were other irregular ways to structure the oath of loyalty made between a liege and his vassal when the knight is appointed. Instead of receiving a fief, it was possible for the knight to receive his rank without taking the oath of loyalty. These unconventional appointments didn't exist before the Dragon Demon War. In the past, the knights rode out into battle on a horse, so they were invaluable to the cavalry. This was why all the knights had to swear an oath of fealty, and they became nobles after receiving land. However, during the Dragon Demon War, the young emperor Harbin of the Nadic Empire succeeded the old and frail late emperor. He had put forth a radical idea. He changed how the title of, knight, was interpreted. One need not be a cavalryman. It didn't matter if one was a magician or even a dragon demon. If one had enough ability, then they could receive the title of knight, and they would be able to raise their social status. The appointing liege and the appointed knight didn't even need to agree to an oath of fealty. It was a time where they needed to find additional talents to fight the dragon demon race. It was a plan to stop the talented people from being unable to shine because of their backgrounds. They also had in mind of the magicians, who weren't of noble birth, that had left the empire, because of the problem arising from their caste. This change was quite effective. It especially succeeded in making the magicians, who were wandering around the world, join the battlefield. If only Emperor Harbin had lived a bit longer, the empire wouldn't have fallen. Azel reminisced about the past. The admired young Emperor Harbin was killed by the dragon demon King Atain during the time when Azel started to earn his fame. However, the act that was meant to change the world was still in place. He thought the world was very mysterious. After a brief thought, Azel asked a question. Aren't you getting the short end of the stick in this deal? Well, it is a power left over since I haven't used it too much. If anything, don't you think the price is cheap since you've saved my life? This is the time for me to show my vast generosity, and I'm going to invest in you for the future. What if I cut off all my ties from you? Then, him, I'll be sad. Arietta really tried to make a sad expression. Her speech and attitude was very formal, but her outer appearance was that of a pretty girl. She looked extremely cute. Well, well, Azel raised both his hands as if he had lost. Was it because she was a young woman, 
who grew up being fated to step onto a battlefield. Unlike her outer appearance, she was formidable. Eventually, Azel bowed his head. I'll receive it with thanks. I need witnesses for the appointment. Let us head back. I'll have Sir Giles and Sir Bor participate in it. That sounds perfectly appropriate. While he was nodding his head, he looked at Honora as if he thought of something. Ah, Ms. Honora. Yes, I'm not a civilian now, but a knight. Is that so? You aren't one yet. Well, I will be one soon so don't be so inflexible. So can I call you little miss now? Honora furrowed her brows and she asked a question to Arietta. Princess, may I hit this person? In the name of the dragon demon princess, I allow the punishment of the man who insulted my maid. Then I won't refuse. Whoa, how scary. Azel trembled in an exaggerated manner then he ran away from Honora who was raising her fist. Chapter 29, Raised Social Status. Part 3. That is why we are here to appoint Azel Zestringer as a knight. Sir Giles and Sir Bor will be the two witnesses. There used to be a rough atmosphere between Giles and Bor, while they had waited, but now they both stared at Azel with dumbfounded expressions. Azel grinned. He stepped forward, and he knelt on one knee in front of Arietta. Arietta unsheathed her white sword, and she spoke as she tapped both his shoulders with it. I pronounce this, as the dragon demon princess Arietta Vile Rulan. From this moment on, Azel Zestringer is a knight. Did you omit a lot of stuff? Do you want me to go through a long and annoying formal procedure? I have it all memorized, so I can do it if you want. I'm awed by princess progressive mind, which rejects empty formalities. Arietta snorted when Azel quickly changed his attitude. Then she spoke. I will hand down the knight's emblem. As she put forth her hand, a white light rose from her palm. The light made a three-dimensional shape of a white eagle, and it started to fly toward Azel. Ah! Azel's eyes widened. Arietta spoke. Put forth your hand and receive it. What is this? You don't know about the knight's emblem. Him. It's the first time I've heard of it. Azel tilted his head in confusion, and he slid his hand forward. When he did, the shape made out of light was absorbed into the back of Azel's hand. Is it a magic that is imprinted into the energy pulse? Azel puzzled over it, and he tried inserting his magic into it. This caused a faint shape of a white eagle to appear on the back of his hand. Arietta spoke. It is your proof of identification that you are a knight. It was created so people cannot impersonate a knight. Ha! Huh. Azel was impressed. While he was asleep, someone had come up with a way to prevent identity theft. Arietta smirked. Originally, we would have to call over the crest maker, and he would have to make your crest. However, you haven't taken the oath of loyalty, so we could do away with that. You can come up with your own crest, and have it made. I will do that. I guess I'll lose a lot of money. Knights have to have their own crest. The crest has to be something that had never existed before. The crest makers, who create the crest for the knights and noble families, have extensive knowledge about crests that already exists. They had the ability to make a crest that couldn't be forged, so they were expensive. Arietta spoke as she got on her horse. Let us depart. The party left the western border fortress. Arietta spoke to Giles as she opened a map. Sir Giles, I heard you visited the capital before. Yes, it was around two years ago. Then could you decide which roads we will take to the capital? Yes, sir. As soon as Giles answered, Bor butted in with a dissatisfied expression. May I say one thing, princess? Speak. I came here with princess as a member of your escort. I'll concede Sir Giles have more knowledge about the geography around here, but once we get close to the capital, it would be better for me to lead. Bor clearly balked at the idea of Giles deciding the path of their journey. However, it was widely known that Arietta had an impartial personality, so he didn't try to forcefully seize the leadership role away from Giles. Instead, he worked hard to persuade her. Arietta nodded her head. Your words have some merit. What do you think, Sir Giles? I believe Sir Bor's opinion is correct. I've lived in the capital before but I'm not too familiar with the geography around that location. I'll discuss it with Sir Bor before I decide the route we take. Giles didn't resist, 
and he passively accepted Bohr's interference. Arietta spoke. I'll entrust it to you. They had brought every item they needed for the journey, so they decided to bypass the town close to the western border fortress. Honora opposed against the decision. If we pass by this one then we will arrive at the next town during the night. Then Princess won't be able to have a proper lunch. If you are worrying about the meals, then don't worry about it. When I was on the battlefield, I wasn't picky on what I ate. But Princess, Honora, this isn't the palace. Moreover, I don't want such problems to delay us. Therefore, we'll stop only if the situation allows us to, and you'll have to make do. I'm not going to ask for something that we don't have. Arietta spoke in an uncompromising manner, so Honora had no choice but to give up. It was an inconceivable situation for the dragon demon princess personal maid, who served her in the palace. However, Honora's attitude was relatively flexible, so she didn't show any signs of discontent. Azel was amused by Honora. As they traveled slowly up an inclined path, he sidled up next to her horse, and he started a conversation. Miss Honora, you are pretty decent at riding a horse. At first, I had some difficulties. It has been a long time since I've ridden. When she traveled from her homeland to the capital, she had ridden a horse instead of riding a carriage. However, once she started working in the palace, she didn't have the opportunity to ride a horse. Azel asked a question. Do you perhaps know how to fire an arrow? How did you know that? Honora's eyes became wide. Azel smirked. I thought it was likely, since you learned to ride at that age. He didn't know what it was like in this era, but in Azel's time period, daughters of nobles learned how to protect themselves. One didn't need to be a daughter of a warrior to learn sophisticated martial arts. Amongst all of them, the most typical skill learned was horsemanship and archery. Azel asked, How skilled are you with the bow? I can't pull the string of a large bow. I'm lacking in strength. Honora answered shyly, and everyone looked at her with surprise in their eyes. However, Azel wasn't surprised. He just laughed. That's impressive. How about swordsmanship? I didn't learn that. Why not? He said a daughter, who'll marry someday, didn't need to learn it. The family's sword technique puts great stress on strength, so he said I'll become wild. Ah ha, so that is why. How about spirit order? It is a similar story. He said he didn't need to pass on his mysteries to a daughter, who'll marry into a different family. I see. During the dragon demon war, sons and daughters weren't discriminated. They were all taught spirit order in order to grow their military strength. Before the dragon demon war broke out, it was unthinkable for such things to happen. After the war, it became a matter of course for the males to succeed the techniques again. Arietta spoke to Honora. I had no idea you had such talents. These are unnecessary skills for a maid. Does the head maid know about it? Yes. I told her during the interview. Him. Arietta now knew the reason why customs were broken to make Honora her personal maid. Since most of her personal maids didn't last long, the head maid must have assessed skills not needed by a maid in her evaluation. Arietta was becoming curious, so she asked a question. I heard you have an older sister. Yes. Do you have any other siblings? I have an older brother and a younger brother. I see. Everyone is still at home. My older brother went to the capital to study. Honora was nervous answering the questions. Until now, Arietta had never been interested in her personal affairs. Arietta had never thought Honora would last long. She didn't ask her anything since she viewed her as someone who would be swapped out for a different person in the near future. However, after she looked at Honora's attitude and history, Arietta viewed her as someone she would get along for a long time. This naturally caused her to take interest in Honora. Where is the territory of Baron Balre located at? Ah, our territory is in a rural area. It really can't be compared to the capital. However, there are large fields, and it is a place where beautiful flowers bloom. Honora started telling stories about the sceneries of her homeland with soft eyes. From listening to her stories, one could tell that the territory of Baron Balre was quite rural. The territory would have a hard time financially supporting an heir being sent to the capital to study. Honora spoke as if she was homesick, but she suddenly looked at Azel as if she had suddenly thought of something. Uncle Azel is. Sir Azel. 
Hazel cut her words short. He had been promoted to knighthood, so he wanted to decline being called an uncle. Honora's lips pouted. You just became a knight. A knight is a knight. If you call me an uncle, then I'll call you little lady. Him. Should we do that? No. No matter how I think about it I seem to come out on the short end, so let's drop it. He didn't want to be called an uncle, so Rizel admitted his defeat. Honora, while putting on a smile of victory, asked a question. Why did you think I learned archery? You knew how to ride a horse. I just connected the two dots. Azel spoke as he laughed bitterly. Of course, it was an expression he made to put on an act as an amnesiac person, but it worked well on Honora. Ah, don't worry about it. I'm starting to remember bits and pieces. Do you remember anything about your homeland? Arietta queried. Those words caused Azel to fall briefly into his thought. I'm not sure. My homeland. Azel didn't know where he was born. He had lost his parents during his childhood. He couldn't remember anything. He had grown up, while wandering from place to place. However, when he heard the word homeland, he could only conjure up a particular scenery. It was after the emperor bequeathed him with the title of duke, and he became Duke Kazakh. Between the time the war had ended and up to the moment he had to emulate the dragon's hibernation, he had lived through a painful, but peaceful two years. He had fought for the land with his life on the line, so it became a symbol of peace to him. Azel spoke with softness in his eyes. There was a flying dragon. A flying dragon. Yes, when it was about the time for the sun to come up, it would fly towards the east to hunt. When the sun set, it flew back west into the mountain. As I watched the figure of the dragon fly west every night, I would realize that the day had come to an end. This is what I remember. Near the dukedom of Kazakh, there used to be three dragons. He had gone through countless dragon slayers rituals, and Azel had already completed his dragon demon sword. Humans and dragons couldn't converse with each other, but Lord Azel and the dragons held mutual respect for each other inside their heart. Their presence kept the peace in the dukedom of Kazakh. During the time they were restoring the damaged land caused by the dragon demon war, they were almost never threatened by monsters. For reasons the humans couldn't understand, the dragons never caused trouble, and they were able to rejoice in peace. I wonder if they are still there. Azel suddenly missed that scenery. In this current era, he wondered which country the dukedom of Kazakh belonged to. Had the name remained the same? Azel still didn't know about these facts. There were too many things he didn't know about in this era. Arietta spoke. Maybe it'll become a clue to finding your origin. It was rare to find a territory where dragons boldly showed themselves in front of humans. One should be able to pinpoint where that territory is from knowing just that. It'll be great if I could. Azel sincerely wanted to believe that. Chapter 30. Raised Social Status. Part 4. The first day of travel passed without anything happening. It wasn't known whether the people called the dragon's shadow had entirely given up on kidnapping Arietta or they were avoiding operating within the influence of the southern border guard after failing once. During lunchtime, they camped on the side of the road, and they reached the vicinity of a small town at night. Arietta didn't need to reveal her identity. At a glance, one could tell their party was of high station, so they were able to pass through the gate without any problems. Are you not going to notify the lord of this town? I think so. If I notify him, then our schedule would be unconditionally delayed. If she revealed her identity as the dragon demon princess, they had to hold a reception for her. The reception wouldn't end after she stayed for a night, and she would be put in a troublesome position. She had to maintain her relationships amongst the noble society, so she probably couldn't excuse herself unless she had an urgent matter. This was why Arietta refused to reveal her identity, and she decided to press on her way. Arietta spoke. I'll go wash and rest. I guess I'll go play with Sir Giles for a brief time. What do you mean by play? Arietta was unsure, so she asked a question. She couldn't understand what he meant by the expression. Azel replied back. We decided to spar against each other. Who? Arietta showed interest. As a dragon demon, her inborn magical energy stood out, but she had trained in swordsmanship since her childhood. She was also a martial artist, 
who had learned various martial arts. Do you mind if I look on? I don't mind. Sir Giles might find it a bit uncomfortable. He is also a knight, so he'll consider me taking interest as an honor. Of course, wouldn't he consider this an opportunity? Hmm, I guess that's how it's going to be. If one could show one's talent in front of the dragon demon princess Arietta, it might lead to a promotion. Arietta fully understood what her station signified. Arietta spoke. Moreover, he is a talent recommended to me by the commander, so I want to see his skills. He is still very young. Why are you looking at me like that? Well, princess called Sir Giles, young, and I thought it was really out of place. Arietta was a 16-year-old girl, and Sir Giles was a knight. No matter how young a soldier was, one would at least be 19 years old. When one heard such words, it was no wonder it felt out of place. A rater laughed bitterly. I can see how it could sound like that. However when I take issue with a person's age, more often than not I don't compare their age to mine. I can see you doing that. Sir Azel, what do you think about him? Do you mean Sir Giles's skills? Yes, I don't think he falls short when compared to Sir Bor. I can't predict how he'll do in a real battle. I'm just looking at his ability as a spirit order practitioner. I also thought he possessed a good amount of magical energy. His achievement is surprising considering his age. When Princess says those words, it's, you are making commentary on every word I say. If this was the palace, I would have hit you hard based on your insolence. No wonder she is staring daggers at you from the side. Arietta said this as she laughed. This caused Azel to sneak a peek to his side. Honora was fuming, and she glared at him. It looked like she was holding herself back from saying a word to him. If Arietta hadn't shown an indifferent attitude, she would have stepped forward, and said something. Arietta spoke. I'm not a spirit order practitioner, but, as a dragon demon, she couldn't become a spirit order practitioner. In the first place, spirit order was a technique made by humans for humans. However, dragon demon magic didn't use magic as its foundation. The dragon demon race and the dragon demons used something that was more sensitive than magic. The technique could be considered the parent of spirit order, and the technique called dragon spirit skill was passed down amongst them. Arietta was a dragon spirit practitioner. During a battle, this was the reason why she often used words of power as a medium for the dragon demon magic. I've seen a lot of spirit order practitioners around, so I have the ability to discern their abilities to a certain extent. It's hard to find someone like Sir Giles in my memories, who have this much achievement at that age. I've never heard of a family headed by Viscount Vince, but his offspring was well educated. I guess Sir Giles's family isn't that famous. At the very least, it is a family I have never heard of. There are as many noble families as grains of sand. Unless there is a relationship with the other family, one wouldn't know their names. I can see that. Arietta probably had numerous names she had to memorize. As the dragon demon princess, she would only remember the renowned families or those who held special significance to the crown. Also, after hearing her story, he understood why Sir Giles, who was born to a noble family and promoted to knighthood, was working as a soldier in the Western Border Guard. His family wasn't that high in status, and they didn't have any connections. It was hard to earn a proper rank with only his skills. Arietta spoke. Then let us go. Where are you going to do it? I saw a garden behind the inn. Arietta, Azel and Honora went towards the garden. Giles, who had arrived earlier, was surprised. Princess, I heard you two will spar. That, that is so, but, I want to see your skills, which the commander was so complimentary of. Can you show me? Giles, who was taken aback by Arietta's question, hardened his face. Then the light in his eyes changed as he answered back. It will be my honor. Azel was a bit surprised by his attitude. Unexpectedly, he might have ambitions for success. From Azel's point of view, Giles wasn't a person that was too attached to promotion or power. When they were in the Western Border Guard, he never imposed his authority over Azel, who was of unknown origin. Even today, he didn't react to every instances of Sir Bor trying to seize the leadership role. 
A person like that was overflowing with enthusiasm when Arietta expressed her desire to see his skills. It was odd. Maybe he always wanted to in his heart, but his personality didn't allow it. That might be possible. He probably wanted to show his aggressiveness on the battlefield. He probably wanted to be accepted for his skills, and receive a promotion through his accomplishments. However, there were those like him who were clumsy at creating various opportunities for promotions. Giles spoke in front of him as Azel showed interest. Azel, no, Sir Azel, could we change the arrangement? How? After Azel was promoted to knighthood, he spoke to Giles as an equal. Before he had done so out of respect for his rank, but he didn't have any reason to do so now. He also told Giles to treat him with ease, and he should drop the respectful form of speech. Unexpectedly, Giles smoothly accepted Azel's change in attitude. Giles spoke, let us spar, so we can show everything we got. We'll do that. However, let us restrain ourselves from using big technique with physical after effects, so we won't destroy the surrounding. Understood. The two of them raised their swords and they faced each other. Azel worried about what to do when he saw Giles, who was more serious than ever before. What should I do? Giles still didn't know about Azel's skill level. It was because Azel had faced him, while he somewhat adjusted to Giles's level. However, Arietta already knew about Azel's skill level. She was probably the only person in this current era, who possessed the most information about him. I guess I can't half-ass it. Azel thought about it for a moment, and he eventually came to a decision. However, it would be unfair for him to immediately show his skill against Giles. He decided to arouse his attention. Sir Giles, I'll be attacking first. This is unusual. Giles found it odd. Azel always waited and counter-attacked during their sparring sessions, and he had rarely taken the initiative. Azel had done this to sell the perception of, I'm short on magical energy, to Giles. Of course, Azel was still short on magical energy. The strength he had absorbed from the Dragon Slayer's ritual was rapidly processed, and it was used to complete his second ring of life plus its dual banding. He had started making his third ring of life, but it couldn't be compared to his glory days. However, if he compared himself from couple days ago, the difference was far apart as earth from the heavens. Not only did the amount of magical energy inside his body change, but the quality had also changed. When one used the first level of magical energy, there is a big difference between amplifying it through one ring of life and two rings of life. After the dual banding is complete, the difference was again much larger. If the person controlling the power was as skilled as Azel, then it goes without saying he'll be outstanding. Giles shivered as he looked into Azel's eyes. What is it? Until now, he felt a sensation he had never felt when facing Azel. He had already accepted that Azel was a spirit order practitioner with outstanding techniques. However, when he faced him right now, it was the first time he felt an imposing feeling emitted from him. It felt sharp enough to cut. In the next moment, a blade cut Giles, and it passed on by. I've been had. In an instant, Giles felt the sensation of being cut. The blade flew out without showing any signs, and it accurately cut at his body. However, even as this was going on, Giles swung his sword as he retreated. Clang! The swords clashed, and a sharp sound rang out. This sound woke Giles from his stupor. Giles panted as he breathed rapidly. What happened? As expected, Sir Giles has a keen sense. I don't know who his teacher is, but he trained him well. Very thoroughly. Azel was laughing in front of him. As Giles saw him smile leisurely, cold sweat started dripping down his face. When fighting someone, he would watch his opponent, and he would predict the next move. Gaze, expression, breathing, movement of the shoulders, etc. One had to process all the information from the five senses, and it became an ingredient for an insight. Therefore, if one faced someone who was skilled, then the opponent would, of course, try to disrupt the other's insight. The movement would blend substance and weakness to trick the opponent. It drastically cut down on the time needed to react. But, the previous attack by Azel, there were no warnings about when, where or how it would happen. He didn't even move. No, 
He moved after he thrusted. Giles' mind replayed the event from a moment ago. They had started to lightly spread their magic to probe each other. Then, Azul's magical energy suddenly hardened, and the thread of mental wave emerged into Giles's territory. The illusion of a blade sliced him. Afterwards, as El ran forward, he swung his sword. Giles blocked the attack by luck. When he was learning his family's martial arts, and spirit order mysteries, he had learned a technique which enabled him to separate his mind and body. If he hadn't learned to block with this technique, then he would have lost on that single strike. Giles spoke. Impressive. Even my father had never shown me a technique like that. I really thought I was going to be cut. It is akin to the hallucination magic used by magicians. How is this possible? At those words, Azel spoke as if he was a teacher lecturing his student. Spirit order is a technique that can manipulate the mind. When one train martial arts, you train your body, learn techniques, and then train your mind. However, spirit order is the opposite. As you train your mind, you are able to feel the movement of the magical energy, then you learn the technique. Finally, you apply it to your body. Basically, this is possible if one learns the techniques that control the mind. Yes, this was the reason why it was called spirit order. The dragon demons and the dragon demon race used dragon demon magic as their nucleus. It was an intuitive and sense-based magic used through one's body, so it had evolved into a different form of magic. Azel was mystified. The techniques that handle the magical energy and the techniques that uses one's body, is on par with my era. Instead, there are some aspects that are better. He didn't luck into the previous block. It is the result of training an established technique. However, the techniques dealing with the mind was of very low standard. Was Giles inexperienced? Probably not. When he looked back at the events couple days ago, it wasn't the case. At the time, a small group of monsters didn't hide their mental energies, when they were carrying out a sneak attack. Moreover, the troops couldn't read their mental energy. Even so, Giles had learned a high-level technique in shielding his mind. It wasn't an active skill. It was like erecting a castle wall around one's mind. It was a naive way to do it, but the quality was above average. It seemed like many of the techniques that could influence the minds of one's opponent was lost. If one thought about the origin of spirit order, this was totally absurd. Chapter 31. Raised Social Status. Part 5. Azel pulled back from asking his question then he spoke. Well, I guess this will be the end of our warm-up. Sir Azel, you are a very kind man. I would rather be called a fair man. Azel knew Giles figured out his intent, so he laughed. After the first exchange, Giles threw away any thoughts of looking down on Azel. At the very least, he accepted the truth that Azel was much better in terms of skill. Giles strengthened his mental barrier. The magical energy he could use in an attack was noticeable less, but he had no choice. Normally, he would erect an adequately sturdy wall, but wouldn't Azel pierce through it easily? Then Giles started attacking recklessly. It was a frighteningly fast attack. Every time the swords hit each other, sparks flew, and a brilliant silver light traced through the air. Giles, who was pouring on a dizzying attack, suddenly felt that Azel's movement was strange. Azel vigorously moved as he matched his rhythm, but now his movement had slowed enough to be different. Then he flowed smoothly to the side. As if he was toying with Giles's doggedness, the blade that broke through burst forth in an oblique angle. Giles retreated in fright. As if he was waiting for him to do so, the point of the sword tracked him like a dancing snake. Chang! Giles barely blocked the blow, and he distanced himself from Azel. Giles asked a question, while perspiring cold sweat. What are these sword technique? He realized a step too late. Azel was using several types of sword techniques. He had thought he had come to grasp Azel's sword techniques after couple sparring session. However, he didn't realize Azel had learned a highly heterogeneous sword art. Azel replied, I don't remember what it is called. However, I learned a lot of sword arts in a hodgepodge manner. His words were true. Azel had learned several dozens of sword arts during his lifetime. He comprehended all of it to make his own sword style. After the Dragon Demon War ended, 
the emperor decreed that his sword style would become the official sword style of the Nadic Empire's royal knights. I wonder if it survived. After 220 years, he wondered if the sword style he created was still in existence. If it was, it would have been his greatest honor. I'll accept my loss. Him, already. It's a shame, but I don't think I can be your opponent with my current level of skill. Even though I launched my attack at you, I couldn't even force you to take one step backwards. As his word indicated, the flashy attack Giles performed wasn't able to make Azel move a single step. He had stood in place like an embedded nail. Moreover, he had kept Giles in front of him, and he had deceived Giles's sense to create an opening. Giles had more magical energy than Azel, and he was also stronger and faster. However, Azel's technique was overwhelmingly superior that it was enough to overturn all the physical advantages he held. Giles spoke. This was a great lesson. May I ask you to keep being my opponent in the future? Of course. After Azel nodded his head, Giles bowed towards Arietta. I'm sorry for showing my shortcomings. No, it was an entertaining show. Sir Azel, you are a very mischievous man. Is that so? If you decide to teach someone, I'm sure the pupil will have many complaints about you as a teacher. This opinion seems to be coming from personal experience. Am I mistaken? No. Unfortunately, you are right. You have some similarities to my teacher. Ho oh, oh. Then you've been taught by a good person. You have an unusual talent of painting your face in gold. If my teacher, Duke Tarantos, heard you then he would most definitely. Him. He would have laughed. The person who taught Princess was the dragon demon Duke. Giles was surprised, so he butted in. This caused Arietta's eyes to move towards him. He lowered his head in surprise. I apologize. No, it's fine. We aren't in a grandiose location, so you don't have to worry about it. To tell you the truth, it's annoying. After she complained, Arietta continued speaking. Dragon Demon Duke. Yes, it is him. My god, that person rarely shows himself even on a formal occasion. Well, he is someone with a lot of ties to the crown. If the crown requests it then he'll comply without complaining. At those words, Azel tilted his head. Isn't Dragon Macon Duke a fairly high-sounding nickname? Well, Azel's own nickname was also grandiose. It couldn't be helped since he was the one who held the most accomplishment in the Dragon Demon War, and he had also beaten the Dragon Demon King Atain. Azel asked, What kind of person is this Dragon Demon Duke? You don't know who Dragon Demon Duke is. Giles stared at Azel with a dumbfounded expression as if to say he couldn't believe such a thing was possible. Azel felt a sense of deja vu since he had received the same kind of stare from someone. Ah, it's the same expression as Rick when I mentioned I didn't know who the Dragon Princess was. The Dragon Demon Duke was a figure as famous as the Dragon Demon Princess, so if one didn't know them, one would be treated as a spy. Arietta laughed. Sir Azel has lost his memory, so it is understandable. Truthfully, I didn't even know about you, Princess. When I asked if the Dragon Demon Princess was the princess of a country founded by the Dragon Demon race, Army Dr. Rick looked at me with the same expression Sir Giles made. This has been a very refreshing experience. Is that so? From the time I was born to now, no one has failed to recognize me. They might not know me personally, but they know about the existence called Dragon Demon Princess. Indeed, Azel nodded his head. For the past several days, he had studied about this era, and her existence was common knowledge. Azel asked, Is Dragon Demon Duke a title inherited like the Dragon Demon Princess? No, it isn't like that. The Dragon Demon Duke compared to the Dragon Demon Princess. Him. Yes, it is appropriate to think of it as the difference between legend and common knowledge. So you are saying Dragon Demon Princess is common knowledge, and Dragon Demon Duke is a legend? Ah. He had already heard about the dragon demon race joining the human society. However, it was refreshing to hear about a concrete example. The duke was from the dragon demon race, and he was a great noble in a kingdom built by humans. He was also the princess teacher. This is quite fun. Azel wanted to meet him at least once. The worshippers of the dragon demon race was everywhere. Currently, 
The world was misguided as it was ruled by humans. There were many people who believed in the fulfillment of the ideals set forth by the dragon demon king. Those believers had infiltrated all ranks and classes. Even if it isn't someone from the dragon demon race, who grew up discriminated, there were other numerous people cooperating with them, while hiding their identity. This was one form of religion. These were people who couldn't boldly step into the sun. They were waiting in the darkness for the savior, dragon demon king, to return someday. So that's how it is. The situation has become complicated. The secret society was called the dragon's shadow. Regina received a report from her underling, and she mumbled in a hoarse voice. Amongst the countless organizations worshipping the dragon demon king, the dragon's shadow was a high-ranking organization with many lesser organization beneath it. The fact that she was in this group signified she was a big fish. She could go anywhere in this world and request cooperation from the lesser organization connected to the main branch. The information network was especially frightening. When she was about to speak to her underling, who had his head down, she heard a woman's voice from inside. What is so complicated? Then time came to a halt. No, in reality, time hadn't stopped. However, it felt like it had for Regina. The underlings in front of her had stopped moving. They hadn't just stopped moving. They didn't blink nor did they breathe. They just stopped in place. Regina turned to look at the person causing this bizarre phenomenon. Niberus Nim. If you leave the humans in this state, then they'll die soon. Don't worry about it. Even I know that much. Niberus was a woman in her mid-twenties with black hair, and brown eyes. From her outer appearance, she looked like a cold beauty, but she wasn't human inside. She was a high-ranking executive, who held a much higher position than Regina. Niberus glanced once at the frozen underlings, and their status changed. They were still frozen in place, but they started breathing slowly. She didn't want to reveal herself to the worshippers, and this was a way to minimize information from getting out. Niberus spoke. Answer my previous question. Including the dragon demon princess, they are a small party with only five people. Five people. Yes. There are only that many people accompanying the dragon demon princess. Yes. What is she thinking? Maybe this is an imposter in disguise. Is this a diversion? We have confirmed that isn't the case. Him. Isn't that more convenient? Why are saying it has become more complicated? Niberus tilted her head in question. She didn't understand why Arietta chose to do this. Moreover, she didn't understand why Regina thought this mission had become more complicated. Regina mused inside as she looked at her. She grew up sheltered. Niberus was the offspring of a high-ranking executive within the organization. She possessed powerful strength, but she hadn't really gone out into the world. She was a high-ranking magician, but that didn't mean she was smart in the ways of the world. Regina explained, even if the dragon demon princess could bring as many troops to bodyguard her, there is a limit to how many she can bring. Even on the high side, it would be around 70 to 80 people. Even if it was the western border guards, it would be impossible to deploy any more troops. Wouldn't there be more troublesome than five people? From our perspective, it would have been better if she came with a somewhat large retinue. Even if there were a lot of them, most of them are ordinary soldiers. The large number means their traveling speed would be slow, and it would be easier to find their location. Him. The small number means most of them are elite troops, and they will have an easier time running away. Is that what you mean? Yes. Regina clearly saw through Arietta's intention. Moreover, she knew this was all done to make it more difficult for her pursuers. This region has almost none of our agents in place. It would be impossible for us to mobilize too many of our men. They are small in number, so why would we need a lot of people? We need it. If I go, do you think it will be lacking? Niberus' eyes started to fill with displeasure. Regina spoke haltingly. Of course, if it is Niberus Nim, the dragon demon princess and anyone next to her would be sufficiently overwhelmed. First, she spoke those words to quell Niberus' mood. However, this wasn't just a flattery, it was the truth. Niberus had grown up sheltered within the upper echelon of the secret society, so her sense of reality was a bit lacking. However, Niberus possessed enormous strength, 
which Regina couldn't even compare to. However, our goal isn't to fight and defeat them. We have to capture them. If a person of the dragon demon princess caliber starts to go on the run then it won't be easy to catch her. Moreover, there is a restriction on how we can act in a highly populated location. I see. Nibirus understood what Regina was trying to say. However, she refused to accepted it. Still, Regina, you only think of this situation based on your level. Yes, if I go forth, then you don't have to worry about such things. First of all, I'm going out to capture a mere dragon demon princess. This is like a king using his best sword to butcher a chicken. Nibirus laughed coldly. Regina's pride was rustled, but she spoke, while keeping her outer appearance blank. Nibirus spoke. This is the only time I will go out. I understand. Regina replied back. In the current world, the existence of a dragon demon king worshipper was not tolerated. If it was a land ruled by humans, this was the case everywhere. There existed secret societies that also tracked down dragon demo king worshippers Nibirus spoke. I'll leave the preparation to you. Since you are so worried about it, I want you to make me a stage with utmost caution. Yes. Regina bowed her head. Chapter 32. Those Who Teach. Part 1. Arietta and her party's journey was smooth. After leaving the territory of the western border guard, four days had passed without anything dangerous happening. However, this didn't mean there weren't any problems. The mood within the group was steadily getting worse. The culprits were Azel and Bor. As they finished their meals within the camp, the empty bowls were noisily flipped over. Then Bor let out his murderous intent. Stop trying to mess with me. We are in the same party, so I'm trying to assign the dishwashing duty. Is that me? Trying to mess with? You. That concept is new to me. That work is only suited for a base born like you. You dare to request someone with noble blood to do such work. Whoa! How scary! How dare a mere knight like me not recognize a lord? I treated you wrongly. May I ask how many knights are pledged to your service, lord? Azel was being sarcastic. Honora, who was far away, had a hard time breathing, because of the murderous intent emitted by Bor. However, Azel didn't show any signs of being intimidated. Bor growled. You are holding up your head too high, since the princess favors you a little bit. I don't know where you rolled in from, but your base-born blood doesn't know anything about honor. How dare you talk to a knight with such a dirty mind? I didn't realize the title of a knight was so important in the era after the rule of Nadic Empire's Emperor Haven. Even back then knights weren't considered to be so special. Also, Azel smirked in front of him. When a talent less bastard with a trash-like mind praises himself to be a noble, it really nauseates me. What? How dare you not know your place? I was being patient, because we are in front of the princess. However, I can't stand it anymore. Bor was enraged, so he unsheathed his sword. Azel looked at him as if he was pathetic. Bor made a request to Arietta. Princess. His man has insulted my honor. Please allow us to have a duel. Him. Arietta had a conflicted expression. The event had progressed this far, so her decision was simple. The party moved with an emphasis on speed, so they hadn't stayed in any of the towns. They had camped along the way, and Honora had been in charge of cooking the food. Azel didn't mind doing the odd jobs, and Giles, who was used to military life, also helped with the work. Arietta wasn't in a position to do anything. She didn't want to refuse doing chores, but her station didn't allow her to do these kinds of work. Most of all, Honora was resolute in blocking her from doing the chores, so she could take part only when her magical power was needed. During all of this, Bor did nothing. He refused to gather dead leaves and branches as they got ready for camp. He didn't help in the dinner preparation, and he didn't wash the dishes. When it was time to leave, he didn't pick up after himself. If one considered his past, it was a reasonable attitude. He was born into a noble family, and he was promoted to the royal knights. During that time, he didn't have much experience of traveling outside, and even when he did, he had his underlings do the annoying work. Even though, Azel could guess his circumstances, he wouldn't tolerate his attitude. Eventually, 
Azel told him he was doing less work than the princess, and that was too much. Azel tried to put him in charge of washing the dishes. When he did, Bor exclaimed, how in the world could he do such a thing, and he became angry. He is making such a fuss, because he really hates washing dishes. If I had to make an award for the world's most irritating noble, then he would probably be nominated. Originally, there were a lot of people like him in the ranks of the nobles. In any situation, they refused to do menial work. They insisted those works would damage their honor. During the Dragon Demon War, the population was going through such a harsh tribulation that such perception had thinned out. However, now that the world had become livable again, the dirty true nature had spread again like a disease. Azel took a peek at Arietta. Without moving his lips, he used whispering to relay his intentions to her. Please allow it, princess. After a moment, Arietta also used whispering to reply back. Whispering could be used with spirit order, but it was a technique that also existed within dragon demon magic, and magic. Him, but, anyways, wouldn't it be hard to order him to wash the dishes in your position? If it is needed, then I will. Miss Honora will stop you. We need to use this opportunity to step on him once. Moreover, I want to. Him, this feels like participating in a bad prank. Geez, I know you find him annoying, princess. I won't deny that. Arietta laughed bitterly. She had a much more noble bloodline than Bor, but Arietta was surprisingly very self-aware. She was taught by teachers, who possessed carefree attitudes. Also, she had grown up being influenced by the ideal that said, your power exists to protect the people. Arietta spoke. I understand. I'll allow it. Princess. Honora was surprised, so she turned to look at her. However, Arietta continued to speak in a calm manner. Except you can't forget about the mission you have accepted. I order you to do your best not to harm each other's life. At those words, Bohr spoke. I understand. No matter how insolent and lowly a person is, life is a precious thing. I just wanted to fix his attitude. I have no intention of taking his life. Azul's eyebrows shot up at those words. Who? His insolent words grated a little bit against his nerves, but his other words were a bit unexpected. I guess he wasn't scoundrel, who treated others' lives like flies, when his pride was involved. Arietta spoke. The loser has to respect the wishes of the winner. As the dragon demon princess Arietta Vile Rulin, I'll be the witness to the duel between Sir Bor Zilred, and Sir Azel Zestringer. Azel and Bor stopped at a location a little bit off from the campfire. Azel took out his sword. While they looked at each other, both of them placed their swords in the middle so it slightly touched. Arietta made the declaration. Start the duel. Azel and Bor stood face to face. Both their figures contrasted each other. When he set out as Arietta's guard, he had received a sword that was big enough to be used with either one or two hands. Azel loosely grabbed his sword with both hands as his sword pointed downward. If seen at a glance, the posture made him look like he wasn't interested in fighting. On the other hand, Bor had a long sword in his right hand, and a shield on his left. He was in a typical knight's stance. His shield was in front of him, and he was positioned to swing the sword at any moment. Bor taunted. Your body is so weak that I don't know where I should hit. Azul's eyebrows rose. For reference, Azul's body had improved quite noticeably. He had trained his body during the travel, so his body was taking shape incrementally. However, his body was still frail compared to a completely trained, muscle-bound knight. This guy really, he has a talent for annoying others. Azel didn't even think about the fact that he had also taunted his opponent. He glared at Bor. Even though he didn't have much muscles, his body was rapidly becoming strong. It was because of the dragon's power he had drunk using the dragon slayer's ritual. On the surface, there weren't much change, but a human body that has drunk a dragon's power becomes robust. Even if someone has the same body build, there are those who are stronger than the other. In the same vein, there was a difference between becoming sturdier through the dragon's power, and training one's body. Well, if we compare our pure physical traits, the bastard is on a much higher level than me. Azel passively accepted his fact. 
Azel was taller than him by a finger length, but Bor had a thoroughly trained body. He ignored his emotions, and he was able to coldly assess his opponent. This ability was something every one of his teacher had complimented on. Azel studied Bor, and he was able to analyze Bor's power in a flash. I'm different from you, who grew up in a nice environment. I'm able to think rationally. This is why I'll tell you this. You will be hurt badly. You will be hit until you feel pain akin to dying. However, I won't injure you in a fashion where your power will diminish. I'll promise you that. Azel had already completed his third ring of life in the past couple days. He had wanted to test out his power, so he liked this turn of event. Yes, I knew I needed to beat this bastard at some point. Bor responded to Azel's taunt. That is what I should be saying. As a knight, who knows about honor, I'll let you attack first. Come at me. Really? Azel decided not to refuse his offer. He took one long stride. In a flash, Bor became surprised. What is that? Azel had taken a step. However, the distance of five meters that existed between the two disappeared in that one step. The sword struck the top of the shield, and Bor's body shook. What is it? What is this damage? It was weird. The sword strike wasn't especially ferocious, but the moment he blocked it the blow traveled through his entire body. Even his bones hurt. He started to slowly retreat when Azel took another step. His light step looked like he was taking a stroll, but he had moved to an ideal distance for bring down his sword. After another strike was applied, Bor staggered backwards. When Arietta saw this, she let out a sigh of praise. That is an interesting technique. If one watched from the side, the move could be understood. Azel looked like he was taking a normal stride across the surface of the ground, but he was actually sliding to close the distance. It was like sliding across ice. When facing him from the front, it was hard for an unsuspecting opponent to decipher his movements. It ruined the timing and sense of distance of the opponent, so one would have a hard time responding to it. Even when he was sliding, there was no noise. This meant it was a spirit order technique. However, Azel was very adept at disguising his magical energy use that one couldn't read what he was doing. Giles spoke. His sword strikes are surprising. I wouldn't say it is surprising. It would be more apt to call it spiteful. Giles laughed bitterly at Arietta's observation. He completely agreed with her sentiment. Azel had broken Boar's timing and sense of distance. His attacks were like a bait being thrown to a fish. These attacks were perfectly made for a shield to block. From Boar's perspective, he wanted to block with his shield to make an opening, so he would counter-attack. However, Azel had foreseen his tactic, so he was using this spirit order technique. The impact bypassed the shield, and it spread across Boar's entire body. The same pattern repeated three times, and Boar finally saw through Azel's tricks. On the fourth sword strike, Boar didn't block it with his shield. Instead, he avoided it then he counter-attacked. Azel lightly flowed past it. Bor staggered a few step forwards before he was able to regain his balance. Ooh orc, that is a surprising technique. I can't hold back my excitement at being praised by such a noble person. Truthfully, I'm impressed. When an opponent is good, it is a knight's duty to acknowledge that fact. I'll acknowledge that you posse's high-level techniques. Bor glared at Azel with eyes burning with his fighting spirit. He already knew from Azel's first sword strike what he was trying to do. Even if he knew this, he couldn't block the second and third strike. Initially, he thought Azel had thrown an easily block able strike. However, the impact had passed through his shield, and he couldn't defend against it. If one was a cord rope master, one was able to easily bypass a wall to strike at an enemy. Even if the opponent was wearing a thick armor, it was possible to deliver damage past the armor. Also, when one uses such a method, the opponent usually uses an offsetting technique. However, he knew that Azel's technique was coming, but he couldn't come up with a move that would cancel it out. Chapter 33, Those Who Teach. Part 2. Azel hit Bor consecutively. By then the pain had seeped into his bones. He let out a moan and he started stagger. It wasn't just the shield. Whenever their swords met, the impact was being transferred to Bor. 
Azul's movement was too skillful. Boar had realized what Azul's intentions was, so he tried to avoid hitting against Azul's sword at any cost. He used the fact that his shield was round to shed the blows at an angle. He avoided exchanging blows, and he tried to focus on attacks that would put his opponent on the defense. However, it was all for naught. Azel read all of his movements as if he was reading a dictionary. It was inevitable. He couldn't block with his shield, and he couldn't hit his sword against the other's sword. It was basically fighting with both his hands and feet bound. The duel had been only going on for five minutes, but Boar was about to pass out. Sweat was pouring down like rain, and he was having a hard time breathing. This shouldn't be happening. He was a quadruple master, and he could easily surpass the physical limitation of a normal person. If he used spirit order, he could be in full body armor and fight for several hours. However, the continuous hits and the strain on his mind robbed his stamina in a flash. Let's end this. Azel spoke indifferently, then he started to swing his sword. Even though Boar was about faint, he still raised his shield. However, Azel's sword was like a lie as it passed through the shield. After passing the obstacle, the sword touched the end of Boar's chin. Don't insult me. Kill me. Boar spoke in a shaky voice. It seemed like he was trying to be dignified, but one could easily see he was scared. Before Azel could say anything, Arietta stepped forward. Stop. End it there. Azel Zestringer is the victor of this duel. Do you disagree, Sir Boar? No. I acknowledge my defeat. Boar answered as his body shook from humiliation. At that moment, Azel spoke. Truthfully, you impressed me a little bit. You have more guts than I thought, Sir Boar. At those words, Boar looked at Azel with surprised eyes. Azel guessed Boar didn't expect a compliment from him. He opened his mouth with difficulty. I, I'm also impressed by your techniques. I apologize for my rudeness. You are an outstanding martial artist. You deserve to be acknowledged by the princess. His face had turned red. It seemed like he was embarrassed. However, his words weren't forced, and he could tell Boar was speaking from his heart. What a funny guy. He had thought Boar was an arrogant and impudent prototypical wastrel of a noble, who couldn't put himself in someone else's shoes. Truthfully, he was acting that way. However, he had an unexpected side where he was able to quietly accept what he had experienced. Azel saw him again as a martial artist. He was young, and he was born with some talent. He came from a good family so he had received a lot of assistance. However, he had become a quadruple master, so he had a strong will and he showed signs of being thoroughly trained. He might be worth looking over for a while. Azel spoke as he thought this. It's time, Sir Boar. Ha, huh, you have to do the dishes. Boar made an expression as if he had chewed on a bug. It is humiliating, but I have to accept the result of the duel. I have no choice, but do it as a knight. I'll do it. If someone saw this, one would think he was smearing ink on their family's honor. He was acting like requiring him to wash dishes was a crazy request. Azel queried in dismay, when Boar acted as if this was some tragedy. By the way, I'm actually really curious about this, so I want to ask you. Sir Boar, why do you consider washing dishes to be shameful? Isn't it the work of a the base born? It isn't a work a noble knight should do. But I saw you do some miscellaneous works. Why is that so different? Azel carefully looked back on Boar's action as he asked. Boar never prepared the camp, prepared dinner nor washed the dishes. However, he didn't refuse any tasks that required strength. He did Arietta's work for her, but I discounted it since she was the princess. There were also instances involving Honora. Miss Honora, I might be presumptuous, but I'll help you despite it. I'll help you onto the horse. Honora was short, so he helped her get on the horse. Miss Honora, I'll move the belongings. He also helped Honora move the packs. Boar spoke as if he didn't know what Azel was talking about. Isn't it a knight's duty to use his strength for a delicate woman? If you see it like that, then wouldn't the preparation for camp be hard, also? Why didn't you help? Each person has their own roles. A woman doing her duty shouldn't wield a knight's sword. Vice versa, a knight shouldn't infringe on a woman's workspace. Of course, she has her own work to do, 
and isn't it a job she is capable of doing? This guy's code of chivalry was quite twisted. Azel turned to look at Giles in dismay, but he was nodding his head if he agreed a hundred percent with that sentiment. Azel let out a sigh. Anyways, even if he discount that, the preparing the camp isn't Mozanora's job, right? That, that is true. However, it is a job for those beneath me. If there was a servant or squire present to do it for you, then that should be the case. However, we don't have that person here. Tell me the truth, Sir Bor, you've never gone on a mission without a servant or a squire. Bor's face turned red as if he was hit in a sore spot. It was as Azel predicted. Azel let out a sigh. What would happen if you were chosen for a mission that requires a small elite group, and there are only knights of higher position than you? That, of course, you would have to divvy up the chores. This includes preparation for camp, dinner preparation and even washing the dishes. Do you think a fairy will show up to do the miscellaneous work for you? Him, I won't ask you to cook. However, you should take a portion of the work Giles and I do. Would that be so disgraceful? If you think so, please throw away that thought. Let's ask the princess. When Azel pointed the arrow at her, Arietta flinched. Azel asked her a question. Princess, have you ever been accompanied by only high-ranking knights? Yes, I don't have any battle experience with them, but we had a situation where we had to move quickly. For a whole day, I had to ride with Count Arhen, and Sir Jarston, the deputy of the royal knights. How was it? They knew how to prepare the camp, and they also prepared the meals. I helped a little bit, but they grumbled that I shouldn't do the work. You heard it, right, when Azel asked him a question, Bohr had a dumbfounded expression. His mouth was open, and he looked like he had just been punched. Did, did they really do those chores? Azel didn't know this, but Count Arhen was a warrior in his sixties, who gained his reputation as a blade master. Jarston was a dignified middle-aged knight from a great family. Arietta spoke as she thought about that time. Yes, they said it reminded them of their apprenticeship days. They had also complained about doing such work at their age, but Arietta omitted that fact. Azel asked a question. Didn't you do such work during your apprenticeship, Sir Bohr? Didn't you do some miscellaneous work? I, I've never done it. What, I've never apprenticed under a knight? Bohr spoke, while he became embarrassed. Azel was confused. Ah, how could that be if you are part of the royal knights? According to Azel's general knowledge, this didn't make any sense. Even if one is from an important background, one had to go through a step-by-step -step process to become one of the royal knights. One was made an official knight once one becomes somewhat serviceable. Arietta spoke. It isn't impossible. After becoming an official knight from outside, the prominent knights has to give a recommendation. Then one has to pass the evaluation given by the upper ranks of the knights. There is such a method to enter. I entered that way. Bohr acknowledged this fact. Azel thought as he looked at him. So this is why he is lacking in some fundamental concepts. He heard from Giles that Bohr's family was lead by Marquis Silred, and they were known to be a prestigious family. Bohr was the third son, but he possessed excellent talent. He had become a quadruple master at a young age, so the family had supported him extensively. It was understandable to see why Bohr's sense of value was twisted. It was surprising that he still had an innocent aspect to his personality. Bohr spoke. After hearing Princess' words, I realized my way of doing things is wrong. From this day forward, I will diligently share the workload. Moreover, Sir Azel. Ha! Huh, I would like to apologize once again for my rude behavior up until now. I was the one who was lacking, and I insulted you when I couldn't even recognize your skill level. Of course, you have every right to be angry. Even if you weren't a knight, you have enough skill that can't be ignored by anyone. You don't have to think of it so rigidly. Then I'll go do the dishes. After saying this, Bohr took off his armor. Then he picked up the dishes he flipped over then he went to the creek. Arietta mumbled. I can't get a grasp on what kind of man he is. Everyone there all nodded their head. After the commotion, everyone went to sleep. Azel, Giles and Bohr rotated to keep a night watch. Honora and Arietta was excluded, 
since Giles and Bohr strongly insisted a princess sleep shouldn't be bothered for such a task. Arietta had no choice, but to follow their words. She wasn't averse to doing any task, since they were already short-handed. However, she also knew the people below her would be uncomfortable if she insisted on doing the work. Him, Azel, had taken the first watch, and he spent the time meditating. He slowly resonated with the mana in his surrounding, and the newly produced magical energy seeped into his entire body to fill his energy pulse. Someone is watching us. At the same time, Azel detected someone observing them. Even though he was meditating, he didn't slack off on guarding his surrounding. Instead, he had opened his senses wide open, and he had sensed someone watching them from afar. Moreover, this person was using magic. When we were in the town, I wasn't sure. But this confirms it. When they visited a city or a town, he had felt someone's gaze on them. However, their party was eye-catching. There was also a lot of people around, so they inevitably received a lot of looks from others. The gazers didn't have any intent of attack, nor did anyone use magical sights. He had his suspicions, but he couldn't be sure. However, he was sure now. Someone was using magic in the night to view them from a distance. After we left the town, I didn't feel the gaze for a while. Either he has a specialized skill in tracking or maybe he is using a hunting dog. Azel and his party members hadn't covered their tracks while moving. There were numerous ways to track them if their group was the target. If it's those dragons shadow bastards. It wouldn't be strange if they attacked right about now. The party was camping at an uninhabited location. This would be a golden opportunity to attack. So why weren't they? Azel was puzzled by this fact. Chapter 34 those who teach. Part 3. When he thought about it, there were three possibilities. First, it might be, because we might not be far enough from the city. If they attacked, it wouldn't take too long for the party to return to the city if they decided to do so. At the very least, Arietta could. If she decided to move at a high speed by herself, she could move much faster than riding a galloping horse. They might be here to only track us. The main force might not be here yet. Azel thought this possibility was very likely. The dragon's shadow had already failed in their attempt to kidnap Arietta, even though they brought a powerful force. Even if it was an immense secret organization, it would be hard for them to mobilize a superior force to the one before. They were probably keeping tabs on their location in real times until enough forces could be gathered. Lastly, they might be setting up a trap on the road we are taking. When the party chose their route, they didn't worry about confusing the enemies, who might be tracking them. They just picked the roads that will allow him to reach the capital the fastest. This in turn made it easier for the enemies to predict their actions. It wouldn't be strange if they focused all of their best forces on the route they were taking to face off against the party. This is the worst case scenario. He couldn't guess the number of forces the dragon's shadow would mobilize. If it was like last time, then from Azel's perspective, it wouldn't pose him much of a threat. However, what if they were hiding forces that exceeded the last one? Since I don't know about the size of the organization or their structure, it can't be helped. The worshippers of the dragon demon king were a type of heretics. They were strongly ostracized by society, so they secretly moved in the shadow. Of course, there wouldn't be much known about them. Currently, the only thing we know is that their place of origin is in the north, and the location is called the Field of Darkness. We don't have any other helpful information. The north of the continent was a frozen land. It was the devil's territory named Field of Darkness. It is a place where the dragon demon race, who were against the humans, were assembled. It was also the place where the worship of the dragon demon king originated from. The dragon demon race hid themselves where human couldn't tread. They gathered worshippers from the shadow, and they managed the organization from there. Ha! Huh, he suddenly heard a rustling sound. Azel glanced up to see Arietta get up, and approach him. Azel spoke as he lowered his voice. Princess. Him. Somehow, I can't sleep. It's strange. It might be because you slept until noon, while missing breakfast. You are pointing out a woman's sleep pattern. Is it something an elegant knight should say? Arietta sat down next to Azel with a coy expression. 
It was something he had found out after the travel started, but Arietta slept a lot. If they were able to find a decent accommodations, she always slept in late. This caused their party to slow down a little bit. As this happened twice in a row, they decided to modify the schedule to allow her to sleep until midday. Azel spoke calmly as he looked at the campfire. There is an enemy present. What did you say? Arietta was taken aback. Azel didn't look at her as he spoke. They aren't showing any signs of attacking any time soon. They aren't even coming close to us. I can feel them using far-seeing magic to observe us. Him. Arietta frowned, and she asked a question as she looked around her surrounding. You also knew about it last time. How are you able to do so? In Arietta's life, she had never been told by anyone that her sense were dull. Even she wasn't able to notice them yet Azel had easily figured them out. Azel spoke. It is a technique. A technique. I'm able to check if someone's gaze is on me. It is a technique possessed by spirit order practitioner. What is the theory behind this technique? I would understand it if you were a magician. In the end, spirit order is another form of magic. It is possible to master the mind with a spirit order technique. That's surprising. I've never heard of anyone using such techniques except for you. Similar to me, I've seen people detect others when they detect signs of life within a certain range. Azel smiled bitterly when he heard Arietta's word. It was necessary for him to know these techniques in the Dragon Demon War. He was able to detect gazes, animosity and even murderous intent through the technique. It was strange to see these techniques not used in battle anymore. He wasn't sure when he faced off against Giles, but he was sure now after facing off against Boar. Both of them had the same weakness. The part of spirit order that could be considered the foundation was missing, and they had only developed the outer parts. From Azul's perspective, this seemed like a bad joke. Suddenly, Arietta asked a question. What kind of technique did you utilize on Sir Boar? May you teach it to me? It's simple. I slightly twisted his senses. You twisted his senses. Since Sir Boar is a quadruple master, he knows several defensive techniques. He can counteract attacks that can deliver damage by piercing through his defense. When facing an opponent like him, there are several techniques that could overcome the threshold of his defense. Amongst them, I used the most basic method. Spirit order is a technique that interacts with the mind. Bohr was like Giles. He was weak to techniques that dealt with the mind. The only thing they could do was to put up a barrier around their mind. The erected mental wall was sturdy, but it wasn't a problem for Azel. He used a clever method of finding a dog hole. He took a roundabout way akin to climbing over a castle wall, and he was able to disturb Boar's mind. This resulted in Boar's mind making a very slight error every time he blocked Azel's attacks. Therefore, Boar was either subtly early or late on his blocks. A good amount of techniques had survived. However, it was as if the energy pulse had been blocked. The true meaning of the skills, and the more advanced techniques seemed to have been lost. It wasn't as if Bohr didn't try to counteract his methods. He realized there was errors within his perception, so he strengthened his mental barrier. He also utilized differed defensive skills. However, Azel had countless skills he could use to deal with each situation. From the outside, it looked like Bohr was falling for the same trick, but the inside circumstances was different. Are all the spirit order practitioners like this? Azel was most curious about this part. During the Dragon Demon War, the sharing and learning of techniques happened actively. However, this generation had no incentive to do so. The knowledge of spirit order and magic not known to others itself became a form of power. During the Dragon Demon War, the united race had battled fiercely against the enemy, but it wasn't so anymore. If one taught the secret techniques to others, it basically amounted to throwing away one's fortune. Still, it would be too rash to judge the entire population's standard after seeing only Bohr and Giles. Arietta was impressed by his explanation. So that's how it is. I've often seen spirit order practitioners affect the opponent's mind, yet I was unaware of this possibility. Bohr and Giles had techniques that dealt with the mind to a certain extent. They could let out an oppressive energy, or they could paralyze the opponent by letting out a shout, which imitated a predator's roar. 
These kinds of technique was a great boon on the battlefield. Azul's technique was far more intricate and refined compared to theirs. Like magic, he was able to produce a variety of effect, and he was able to come up with new methods. Suddenly, Arietta spoke. Your teachers must be amazing people. Why do you think so? They were able to help grow someone like you. Well, I don't know about your personality, but at the very least, I'm very sure on your ability to teach. Him. Her words rekindled a memory in Azel. Arietta spoke with a sincere expression. Until now, I thought I had enough real battle experiences. After having her coming of age ceremony at 15 years old, she had experienced a lot of battles. At times she would have to show her strength in border disputes. She sometimes fought monsters, and other times evil black magicians. It was a brutal work for a young girl. However, Arietta carried out her mission without saying a word of complaint. As she did all of this, she started gaining confidence as a martial artist. She wouldn't be shaken up like her first battle experience, and she wouldn't have to see her allies be sacrificed. However, I found out I was in error in the recent events. Arietta's battle experience was akin to a child picking out her favorite food. She had never fought against a strong opponent, who was on even grounds with her. Even if she was tactically at a disadvantage, her martial arts had always been better than the others. When she was threatened by a small group with enough power to threaten her, she had been baffled. She couldn't properly use her skills, and she had been led by the nose by the enemy's design. Sir Azel, if you weren't there, then I'm sure I would have been captured by those wicked people. If my teacher saw it, he would sigh at my pathetic state. I thought you held firm, and you coped well considering the situation. You don't have to try to make me feel better. No, I'm telling the truth. Well, from my perspective, you were only out of your depth when the earth dragon showed up. For the rest, it wasn't too bad even if I wouldn't rate it a perfect score. Two years had passed since she had experienced her first battle. She was still 17 years old, so he had no reason to give a harsh evaluation when he considered her age. Arietta smiled bitterly. I thought you were going to flatter me, but you didn't forget to pinch me in a sore spot. Well I'm a bit of an honest man. You are an ill-tempered man. Arietta pouted, and unlike her words, she looked like any girl her age. After a moment, Arietta asked a question. Sir Azel. Yes. Do you have a lot of experience facing against strong foes? Him. I've done it a lot. He had overcome countless near-death experiences in the Dragon Demon War. Every single member of the Dragon Demon race possessed huge amounts of power. Amongst them, the ones with their names known to others were like moving disasters. Arietta spoke. Could you tell me some stories about your teachers? My teachers. At those words, Azel started thinking about his past. For him, it had been only a couple years ago, but it had become a distant past for humanity. Azel's first teacher was an old man, who was part of the civil militia. He had taught Azel martial arts in his childhood when he lived near the town next to the mountains. He used to be a mercenary when he was young. He taught Azel a sword art that required a strict structure. He was a very strict old man. Azel didn't tell her, but the old man's name was Rogan. He had taught the young members of the civil militia. Rogan took on the role of a drill sergeant. He had a high assessment of Azel's potential, who hadn't learned any martial arts, yet he was someone who had assassinated the thieves without an adult's help. Unlike the youths of the civil militia, he had taken in Azel as his disciple. If he thought of those times, Azel had learned under him for three years until his death, and he was the one who laid down his foundation. The old man thoroughly taught him the basics, and the system of his sword art. He also used his extensive experience as a retired mercenary to foster a flexible maneuverability in Azel. My second teacher, him, he was a weirdo. From his head to the end of his toes, he was weird in every way. After Rogan's death, Azel left the town, and he wandered the world for two years as a mercenary. He was young, so it was common for people to be ignore him. However, every man capable of fighting was needed at that time. In the presence of an arrow storm, Azel had returned alive after distinguishing himself, and he slowly started to make a name for himself. 
During all of this, he had met an one-armed swordsman. An one-armed swordsman, Arietta asked in surprise, and Azel answered. Chapter 35, Those Who Teach. Part 4. Yes. Moreover, he was also an one-eyed person. Azel's second teacher didn't have a left eye, or a left arm. He was an one-eyed and one-armed swordsman. His name was Balf, but he didn't tell Arietta his name. At the time, he was one of the most well-known name amongst the mercenaries in the eastern part of the continent. Logic would dictate a person with physical disabilities wouldn't be able to function on a battlefield. If he was any other mercenary, he would have been forced into retirement. However, no one could disregard Balf. He was a sextuple master. He was a sextuple master. A mere mercenary was able to rise to such heights. Sextuple master was a height only a select few had reached inside the entire Rulan kingdom. However, the person with such skills was a mere mercenary. Azel spoke. He wasn't even a master before he lost his eye and arm. When he was confined to his bed, he had fiercely cultivated his mind. He was undaunted by his disabilities, and he was able to reach such height with much efforts. Balf became interested in Azel when they had fallen into a devastating trap. The monsters controlled by the dragon demon race used the night as cover to ambush the humans. They were fundamentally nocturnal creatures, so their night eyes were much better than the humans. Of course, the humans knew about this, so they were very vigilant during the night. However, at that moment, the company affiliated with Azel and Balf had fallen into a trap set by the dragon demon race. Their command structure had been shattered, and they were in the process of fleeing. When the fleeing soldiers finally felt they had barely escaped, the enemies had tracked him down, and the night attack started. Confusion and fear started spreading like wildfire. The soldiers weren't even able to resist as they fell one by one. Few amongst them fought back, but they couldn't turn the tide of battle. Azel wasn't fighting to turn the tide of the battle. He just wanted to find a way to survive. During the confusion, Azel defeated the enemies one at a time, and before he knew it his back was against Balf. Balf eyed Azel, and he realized Azel wasn't a spirit order practitioner. However, he was surprised Azel was able to use his developed senses to stay alive as he accurately assessed the situation. Hey, kid, you want to be my disciple? After they were able to escape the enemy's encirclement, Balf made the suggestion. From Azel's perspective, he had no reasons to refuse his proposal. If he looked back on it, he was able to earn this opportunity because of his first teacher Rogan. Azel guessed Rogan was a noble in hiding. He suspected this since the sword art he taught was structured. Moreover, Azel didn't know this at the time, but he had taught him the foundation he needed to learn spirit order. This was why his senses were superior to others. My second teacher focused on developing my senses to the extreme. As a spirit order practitioner, it was natural for one to train the mind and senses. However, Balf had obsessively focused on teaching these aspects. A typical example was dodging attacks in the dark. In the latter stages, he would hang swinging knives on the ceiling, then we would spar in a room in absolute darkness. It was a brutal training method, but I would venture you had an easy time overcoming it. Truthfully, that is so. It wasn't that hard up to that point. Azel truthfully acknowledged it. If he looked back on it, he was a very talented student. Each obstacle thrown at him by his teacher was solved in order by him. However, Balf wasn't satisfied with this. He covered Azel's eyes, and Balf forbid him from piercing through the darkness with spirit order techniques. Later on, he even plugged his ears to seal his hearing. I even learned about reacting to threats with parts of my body tied. Sometimes, he had to fight with one of his arms tied. Another time, he had to block torrent of attacks sitting down with his legs tied together. He also had to train with both arms tied behind his back. Then he was taught to fight while he was hung backwards on his feet. The point of the training was to never lose one's senses in any type of situation. Balf's training was so harsh that Azel had almost died numerous times. Even a powerful spirit order practitioner like Balf couldn't completely control the dangerous training scenarios. That is, isn't it abuse instead of training? I won't deny it. At times, 
I thought he was really crazy. I thought my teacher had gone crazy. And he was trying to kill me. What happened to him? He died. He had an illness. This was the reason why Balf took in Azel as his disciple. He wanted to pass on his skill he had earned through overcoming his disabilities. However, once he took in Azel as his disciple, his potential was so high that Balf got greedy. He wasn't satisfied with just passing down his techniques. He wanted Azel to reach a level he was never able to. His impending death stirred up a madness within him. He lost all his sense of reason, and he drove Azel to the brink a couple times as Azel had to overcome numerous near-death experiences. Most of the enormous wealth Balf had accumulated during his mercenary days were used to treat Azel. I learned under him for two years. When Balf passed away, Azel was already a quadruple mast at age 17. Moreover, his senses had surpassed Balf's, and it had approached a level only Balf could dream about. His grave might still be there. After the Dragon Demon War ended, Azel had moved Balf's grave to the territory of Marquis Kazark. Did any remnant of the grave survive until the present day? After thinking up to this point, Azel asked Arietta a question. How is it for Princess? Him, you aren't going to tell me about your third teacher. You are asking for my story. My story had gone on long enough. When I have the chance, I promise I'll tell you the story. I want to hear about the teaching you received from the Dragon Demon Duke. You are trying to dig up a girl's past. It is rude and it isn't an action befitting of a knight. After Arietta made the joke, she started talking about herself. Well, that person, if I borrow a description given to him by others, he was a madman. What? Madman? Basically, he was a crazy person. The legendary figure in the kingdom, and the person, who had taught the dragon demon princess her sword art, was called such a name. Azel was taken aback, and Arietta could only laugh at this sight. Initially, my teacher was offered the position. When he came to the royal throne, he came to ask for a permission. What did he ask for permission? He didn't want any outside interference when he taught me. Moreover, he wouldn't treat me like a royal. If his conditions weren't met, then he wouldn't accept the position as my teacher. Teaching a royal family member was prestigious in and of itself. However, one had to be careful when dealing with the royals. This was the reason why the dragon demon duke refused to be the royal family's teacher. He declared he couldn't teach, while he had to ingratiate himself to his student. The dragon demon duke's attitude was well known, but they still invited him to teach the siblings Arietta and Saiga. Ah, Saiga is my brother. I've heard about him. The dragon demon prince, Saiga Vile Rulin, was two years younger than Arietta. He had his coming of age ceremony this year and he had entered into the battlefield. Anyways, we insisted on inviting the Duke of Tarantos as our teacher, because he is a relative of our mother. Arietta and Saiga was an indirect descendant of the Duke of Tarantos on their mother's side. Since they had that connection, they aggressively requested him to be their teacher. These children has to go out into the world to fight. We need a teacher who'll train him to be stronger than everyone. This was the argument given by the Dragon Demon Queen. In every generation, there could be only one Dragon Demon Prince and Princess. There were times when only one of them existed. After they have their coming-of-age ceremony, they'll be sent into battles, so their destiny was very arduous. After the crown was given to the next in line, the new Dragon Demon Queen weds the Sovereign. She would have to fight for the honor of the throne until she gave birth to her children. Of course, the throne was very selective in which battles they would enter. However, live battles were unpredictable, and unexpected events happened. Moreover, there were many people relying on their powerful strength, so some had died fulfilling their duties. This truth made the dragon demon queen want her children to possess enough power to face their oncoming destiny. The throne accepted his conditions, so I started receiving his guidance when I was eight. Did you train with your brother? No, from the beginning, he didn't have confidence in teaching two people. He told Saiga to come when he reached my age. Therefore, I was solely able to receive his instructions for two years. Arietta was dragged outside of the influence of the throne. Then she received instruction on the battlefield by the dragon demon duke for two years. 
That person was as much of an ill-tempered person as your teacher, Sir Azel. For example, after teaching me for around half a year, he dropped me deep inside a forest with only one sword in my possession. He required me to survive and live alone for one month. Around half a year. Weren't you still eight years old? Yes. How could he do such an act to an eight-year-old girl? It was also winter at the time. I really thought I was going to die. Arietta laughed bitterly. She was a young eight-year-old girl, but she was also a dragon demon. With instructions from the dragon demon duke, her physical ability had already exceeded a grown adult's capability. She had also learned the basics of the dragon energy. Still, she had to survive in the winter wilderness with only a sword, so it was a brutal tribulation. If she thoughtlessly made a fire then it would attract the monsters. She had also gone into dangerous areas as she chased after her quarry. She had to overcome frequent brushes with death. If she thought about it right now, she felt a more sense of crisis during that time compared to when she first stepped into her first battle. At that time, she was weak and inexperienced in every facet. There were also other unforgettable experiences. He dropped me in the middle of an unknown city rampant with criminals, then he ordered me to come back to the estate without being seen. She had received a lot of training in areas unrelated to martial arts and dragon energy. At the time she wondered what she was doing, but she understood the purpose of the training now. Azel was impressed. Indeed. I understand why princess personality is like this now. From Azel's perspective, Arietta was really weird. Even if one was part of the royal family, one develops a sense of reality when one come into frequent contact with the lives of one's subordinate. Even if he took this into account, Arietta was too informal compared to her station as a princess. It's because of her teacher. Arietta had a teacher with an excessively unfettered and disordered mind, so she looked at the world differently from the other royal family members. Even if one was of common birth, she treated them like people. She also developed an eye for evaluating the other's skill without any bias. Azel spoke. I want to meet him at least once. You want to? Yes, if you return to the royal palace, I could probably set up a meeting. I'm sure he would be amused to see someone like you. Well, I'm fine with that. Also, Arietta spoke after she hesitated for a little. If you have time, could you face off against me? Face off against you. What do you mean? I meant sparring. Him. It won't be a problem for me, but Mozanora will get angry. That is why I've been holding myself back until now. However, my body is restless when I see you spar daily with Sir Giles. Even if she was a 17-year-old girl, Arietta was a martial artist, who had trained rigorously since her childhood. During this trip, she wasn't in a position to use her sword, so she quietly acted as an authority figure. Therefore, she was a bit restless. Azel spoke. Muzanora won't stand for this. I'll just order her to watch us obediently. That is abuse of authority. Isn't authority meant to be used in a situation like this? Moreover, she can't do anything towards her superior, so she will turn her grievance towards me. Then just take the beating from Anora. I heard subordinates are supposed to be protectors for their superiors. Wow, you were too much. When Azel started to shake, Arietta laughed. This was how the night progressed. Chapter 36. When I met someone who was dead. Part 1. Nibirus loved the dark when there wasn't a single speck of light present. She could achieve complete serenity only in a space with this kind of darkness. However, she loved the darkness, not the silence. She was staring into the empty darkness when a whisper entered her mind. You haven't concluded your business yet. She heard a voice from a very distant place. From across the mountains, lakes and even beyond the boundaries drawn on the map by humans, the voice reached the dark snow-covered fields. Niberus answered. The preparation is finished. We'll have it wrapped up soon. Why are you taking so long? That place is a dangerous land for you. If you aren't careful, they will realize your existence. There is a danger of the dragon demon duke moving maybe even Count Michael. There weren't only one voice. From various places from the continent, the voices flew in, and they were having a conversation as if they were sitting next to each other. Do we have any reasons to fear them? They are parasites living off the humans. 
Nibiris revealed her distaste. The dragon demon Duke, and Count Michael was listed as people they had to be cautious around in the Rulin Kingdom. Dragon Demon Duke was of the Dragon Demon race, and Count Michael was a Dragon Demon. There weren't that many from the Dragon Demon race, who had integrated into the human society, so their names were well known. They were able to live longer than humans, and most of them held great power. There were few who didn't train their fighting technique and magic after assimilating into the human society. Most of them cultivated their talent to spread their fame with their strength. From the perspective of Dragon Demon King's worshippers, they were existence to be afraid of, since they'll indiscriminately kill the worshippers. However, Nibiris wasn't afraid. Her voice indicated she was unsatisfied. We can't underestimate them. Our forces are too weak to go against the Rulin Kingdom. If we let down our guard, then we might meet with disaster. Nibiris. We all acknowledge you possess great abilities, but I understand. However, there is a reason why I had delayed carrying out this mission. Nibiris felt disgusted. In the organization, she was considered to be young. Moreover, she was treated like a child. Now that she thought about it, the old elders were basically like senior citizens nagging at everything. She felt her irritation well up. Nibiris spoke. I'm being sufficiently cautious. I am waiting for the day when the clouds will cover the moon. When the world is blanked by complete darkness, I'll take care of them. The power of the magicians was significantly influenced by the surrounding. It also depended on what their specialty was in magic, and where they placed their source of magic. As a magician, Nibiris' source was the darkness. When the darkness grew thicker, her power grew stronger. Moreover, on a night without a moon, her presence wouldn't leak out. She could covertly put up a barrier that could isolate one from the outside. She hadn't attacked Arietta's party, because she had been waiting for this day. She had chosen a suitable location and the day to attack Arietta's party. Then she prepared as she predicted the climate. The one with the name soaked in sin has a secret. I'll definitely find out what it is. For good or for bad, a person doesn't change easily. However, if given a chance, a person could change in a surprising way. It had been a while since Azel was able to experience this truth. If, if you don't mind, could you give me some pointers, Sir Azel? Bor asked after he summoned his courage. The day after the fight, Bor didn't complain as he shared in the work. He did the dishes, prepared the camp and he also cleaned after himself. He even asked for things to do from his own volition and the discontent he had in his eyes from before melted away like snow. Still, he didn't get along with the other party members. Previously, he kept a natural distance between him, but now he hung back while he studied us. He knew why Bohr was doing this. Azel, Giles and Arietta discussed each other's techniques after sparring sessions, and he probably wanted to join in. After four days after the duel, he finally worked up his courage. Azel was a bit surprised at his change in attitude, but he readily accepted it. I'll welcome it any time. Arietta spoke when she saw this. You are really popular, Sir Azel. I guess so. Unlike me. Ha ha ha. Azel awkwardly laughed when he saw Arietta sulk. Since Giles sparred with Azel, Arietta wanted to spar with Giles. However, he said he was afraid his inexperience might lead him to make a mistake. He was afraid of making a mistake, so he declined her request. This caused Arietta to sulk. This was the same for Bohr, who joined them later. During the spa, Azel discreetly put out a feeler. The two of them told him they were uncomfortable by the fact Arietta was a woman. Him, that is. The fact that she is of royal blood makes it overwhelming. Moreover, she is a woman. I don't think. Bohr gave a similar answer. I've never pointed my sword against a woman. I want to fulfill princess expectation, but there were women fighters in the Rulin kingdom. However, the number was low compared to the male counterparts. Moreover, chivalry was a bit full of machismo and narcissism. These two young men were earnest knights, so from their perspective, they felt uncomfortable crossing swords with a woman. Azel was simultaneously baffled, and understanding of the two people's attitude. Well, what if your enemy is a woman? Last time there was a woman amongst the group called the Dragon's Shadow. 
him. That is. Azel clicked his tongue inside as he looked at the conflicted Giles and Bore. Geez. It turned out like this after 220 years have passed. During the Dragon Demon War, there were a lot of female enemies. Whether it was Dragon Demons or those of the Dragon Demon race, both males and females exhibited overwhelming power. Moreover, there had been a lot of human women, who joined the Dragon Demon King's camp. They recruited people who were shunned by the society. Then they guided those with magical talent, and they were commonly used as troops. Magical talent didn't discriminate between gender, so it was common to come across a strong female magician. This was why Azel faced a woman using all of his might. However, it seemed this generation of knights didn't feel the same way. These guys are being troublesome. It'll be trouble if I do nothing. If they hesitated when facing Regina, because she was female then their head will be severed in a blink of an eye. It was imperative to get rid of their awkwardness when fighting a woman. Azel gave Arietta a suggestion. This is why I want you to give them an order. Are you trying to make me a bad woman? It will be your noble sacrifice. You are skilled at putting a pretty package over it. Now I'm sure you are a bad man. You got me. Arietta snorted then she followed Azel's instruction. After that day, Giles and Bor was forced to fight Arietta. Moreover, they experienced getting absolutely annihilated by her. In the beginning, they forcefully insisted that they were worried Arietta would get hurt. However, Arietta snorted then she dominated both of them. Both of you are very prideful. Even the kingdom's famed knight tried their best against me without holding their skills back. How can the two of you, who are so young, be so arrogant? This made Giles and Bor embarrassed, but they still refused to yield. They acknowledged Arietta's skill, but their pride was hurt when they lost to a 17-year-old girl. From that point on, they faced Arietta with a serious attitude. Since this was a sparring session, Arietta didn't bull them over my using her dragon energy. This allowed her to experience a meaningful sparring session. However, a problem occurred on that very night. Him, Azul's eyes opened in the dead of the night. Originally, they had planned on staying in a village across the mountain, but several small accidents during the trip delayed them. In the end, they weren't able to cross the mountain, and they had to camp outside. One of the small accidents was actually coming across a party with a broken carriage axle. It had broken when they were running away from the monsters. His party chased away the monsters. While receiving their thanks, Arietta's party helped them return to the previous town they had just left. This caused a delay, so they had to sleep outside. They had hoped to avoid this. Sir Azel, Bor, who was standing guard, turned a questioning look towards him. Azel put a finger to his mouth. He signaled to Bor to stay quiet. Even though, there was a night watch, Azel hadn't lowered his guard. Since he already knew someone was watching him, he couldn't be careless. Even when he was sleeping, he put up a barrier fence that reacted to a specific set of triggers. Some might think this could be only done by a magician, but it was possible for a spirit order practitioner to use this technique. It was established as a technique in Azul's time, and it had been passed on since then. Something unknown was caught in the barrier fence. This evil energy. Is it a black magician? He felt a dark and damp energy of darkness. This energy was hiding magic. He could sense someone was trying hard to hide their existence. However, he had been trained by the one-armed swordsman, Balf. Azul's absolute senses was focused to detect the energy leak coming from the hidden one. He was sensitive enough to feel the reverberation caused by the energy. Moreover, this ground resonance. Azel touched the ground as he focused his mind. He used the vibration caused by the slight tremor to find the large numbered group approaching them from a couple hundred meter away. However, I can't sense the group thought. A big fish has shown up. If it was a normal person. No, even if it was a spirit order practitioner, they would have ignored the faint and barely existent vibration from the ground. However, Azel had used it to speculate the existence of the enemies. However, when he expanded his senses, he couldn't feel the group thought, so he knew this was the result of someone using the power of magic. This person was different from the dragon's shadow magician, who used the monsters to attack them in the Balan forest. 
There was a powerful magician here, who probably held the common knowledge used in the Dragon Demon War. Azel immediately woke his companions up. Everyone wake up. Don't make a sound. Just pretend to be asleep. He didn't open his mouth. He delivered his message using whispering. Then he used a faint mental energy to naturally stimulate his eyes to open. The reason why he used such a cumbersome method was simple. He felt gazes on him. It wasn't just one or two people. He was sure the enemy was observing their location from within visual range. Regina. That woman is here. Azel never forgot the energy signature he had once seen. Of course, this was limited to those like Sir Giles, who had magical energy. Also, Kyrian. From beneath the earth, he could feel Kyrian's energy signature. When the enemy starts their attack, he'll probably use his special skill. He'll use his magic that allows him to freely travel underneath the earth to ambush them. Still, how is the bastard hiding his dragon demon energy? He was able to sense their existence using the mental wave and magical wave that was faintly flowing out. However, he couldn't feel the dragon demon energy used by the dragon demon. It was the same last time. It was thoroughly hidden enough to fool Arietta and also Azul's senses. These bastards wasn't that skilled. Did they develop a new method during my sleep? The society treated the dragon demon king worshippers as if they deserved to die. Therefore, it wouldn't be too strange if they developed a technique that allow one to hide themselves. Wouldn't 220 years be enough for this? Azel had already asked about the skills developed during his sleep. For example, Giles used a defensive technique that could separate the mind and the body. Him. When he was deep in thought, Arietta opened her eyes as she asked a question. What's happening? Chapter 37. When I met someone who was dead. Part 2. The enemy is here. It is the dragon's shadow. What? I can't feel their presence at all. Several of those from the previous attack is present. Moreover, a more talented magician seems to have accompanied them. There are also numerous amount of monsters approaching us. But I can't discern their exact number. Him. Giles and Boar was taken aback. They tried expanding their senses, but they couldn't sense anything out of the ordinary. Boar queried. Are you sure? Sir Azel. I don't feel anything. I'm sure. Just put your body against the ground then focus on the vibration of the earth. They had increased their skills by sparring against Azel. But he hadn't taught him any of the techniques he knew. This era was different from the Dragon Demon War where one would disseminate one's technique. Azel had realized the mindset of the fighters like Giles had changed in this era, so he tried to imitate their ways. However, he had to convince them right now, so he had to pass them the knowledge that was common during the Dragon Demon War. Everyone followed Azel's direction. There really is a ground vibration. There was a slight vibration felt through the earth. Still, it was strange to feel this ground vibration in the middle of the night. The only other explanation was the vibration was a precursor to an earthquake. Azel spoke. Every should quickly arm themselves. Our enemies are observing us already, so we don't have to be quiet. They'll probably attack us right away. His speculation was correct. Their enemies were slowly closing the distance, and they were waiting for their forces to get into place. When the party members suddenly stood up to arm themselves, the enemies were startled into movement. At the same time, a strong magical wave started spreading. It started around a location about 50 meters away from the party, and it spread in a circular manner. As the wave spread, it started distorting the space. I knew it. A big fish has appeared. After he had awakened in this era, it was a level of power he had experienced with the earth dragon. Azul's senses became sharp and alert. From the surrounding, darkness fountained forth from various locations. It spread like a thick fog. When it swept across the campfire, the world turned pitch black. Azel was surprised when he saw this. We've been had. These bastards buried a magical item beforehand. Azel had finally realized this was a stage prepared by the enemy to capture Arietta. Until the hidden magical item receives a signal from the owner, it was in a sleep mode where one couldn't detect even the echo of its magic. There weren't any signs of the earth being dug up, so he guessed Kyrian had used his ability to move through the earth to perform this task. 
If someone was this through in their preparations, Azel had no chance of noticing what was happening. Azel thought about what happened during the day. Shit. Maybe those people were the minions of that bastard. They wouldn't have been able to pull this off unless they could confirm where our party would stay for the night. This meant the people in trouble they had met earlier were deployed by the dragon's shadow. There was a high probability that they were used to get the party's attention and delay them. No matter how I look at it I underestimated them since they were normal people. When he thought about it, their behaviors looked to be a bit forced. However, he knew they didn't know any magic nor did they practice spirit order. They were normal people. He overlooked their behavior since they were being chased by monsters and they had met a party with the high-stationed Arietta and her knights. However, it was quite possible for the dragon's shadow to have used them in their plot. They could be dragon demon king's followers or people simply hired with money. As the earth shook, the darkness fountained up like a tsunami. One couldn't see an inch ahead inside the darkness, but Azel was able to sense the large curtain of darkness. It had a radius of about about 100 meters, and it was dome-shaped. Moreover, from inside the darkness, he heard a bleak laughter. It gave one the creeps just from listening to it. It was a voice that would stimulate one's instinctual fear. Azel sensed someone with a sword approach him. You will die in fear inside this darkness. You possess the name of a sinner, and you deserve to die. When he heard the words directed at him, Azel mumbled as he frowned. Are you perhaps the dragon demon I killed from before? Your voices are pretty similar. You remember me. I am Jackal. From inside the darkness, the enemy dragon demon he had killed in the Balan forest approached him. It was Jackal. I've returned from hell to kill you. Jackal had been revived from death, and his glowing eyes were blazing in front of Azel. It was terrifying for one's eyesight to be shut off. One couldn't even see an inch ahead yet he, he knew something was aiming a sword at him with animosity. However, spirit order practitioners were more comfortable dealing with such a situation compared to a normal person. They trained their mind and senses first instead of training their bodies. Even if their sight was blocked, they had learned methods for comprehending the surrounding state of affair. Still, this situation might be a bit too difficult for the others. Even if one was a spirit order practitioner, they were still human. It couldn't be helped since all humans relied heavily on their sight. If one hadn't trained like a zell in reacting to situations where a part of one's senses was cut off, then it was a difficult proposition. A sharp sword flew towards Azel. However, Azel avoided it as if he could see the sword. Truthfully, he was able to see it. The one with the sword was emitting a yellowish light from his eyes, so one could see a faint outline of him. You dare look away when I'm in front of you. Well, Azel smirked. You look too ridiculous for me to concentrate on you. I can't help it if my eyes wander. You became a corpse that hasn't quite decomposed yet. Isn't that right, dragon demon? If you decided to go for the decomposed look, then you should go for it all the way. What kind of state are you in? Jackal, who had become a revived corpse, was a sight one would be afraid to see in one's dream. His body was decomposed about halfway, and his eye socket was empty as it let out a yellowish light. However, Azel looked at his figure with perfect composure. It isn't like there were only one or two bastard who had revived to take their revenge on me. It was quite common for Azel to experience such an attack during the Dragon Demon War. He had killed too many high-ranked enemies, so many of them attacked him after they revived. You bastard. You dare. Also, it didn't seem they didn't put too much effort into your revival. You were weaker than before. At Azel's mocking words, Jackal ran towards him in anger. Then a sharp flash of light gleamed. About half of Jackal's body was sent flying. Azel had easily avoided Jackal's attack and he had counter-attacked. I've become stronger yet why do you believe you can strike me? Did you think if you attacked me after your revival, I would exclaim, my god, this can't be happening, you should be dead, did you really think I'll be afraid? If you really thought that, then I feel sorry for you. My personality is a bit lacking for me to be considerate towards you. You have a weaker imagination than that of a three-year-old. You, you bastard, I'll kill you. The single strike cut his body in half, but he hadn't died. 
If it was a high rank revived being, it possessed heart and soul like a real living body, and it was able to resurrect again like a restored broken dish. Azel saw Jackal's mangled body come back together as if he was turning back the time. Moreover, Jackal couldn't wait for his body to be restored, so he charged Azel in his half-broken state. Oh well, he's hot-tempered since he woke up from being dead. This was Azel's intention. In a flash, a pure white flame wrapped around Azel's sword. Star's breath. This was a spreet order technique developed to deal with the revived beings. When Azel's sword cut Jackal, the white flame trailed the arc of the sword strike as it burned his body. Jackal let out a horrifying scream. When half of his body was sliced off by Azel's sword strike, Jackal hadn't felt any pain. It was a strike imbued with magical energy, so there was damage to physical body, and a little bit of damage to his astral body. Still, unlike a living person, his body wasn't paralyzed from the pain. However, this instance was different. The white flame stuck to his astral body like glue, and it was sending an enormous amount of pain to his soul. Azel spoke. If one still have a lot of one's body left, the deep-seated grudge is too strong to burn easily. However, I found out that beings like you will burn very well after you are finely chopped. There was a reason why he used a normal attack for his first strike. First, he had to cut the body into pieces before the star's breath could be used in an efficient manner. The revived being was maintained by negative energies, and the star's breath was a technique that attacked the energy itself. If the high-ranked revived being was whole, one had to pour out an overwhelming force or it would use its high resistance to hold out against the attack. However, the resistance decreased by a significant amount when the body was cut into pieces. You tried hard to live again. However, you had the honor of speaking several words in front of me, so let go of your lingering attachment and go back to sleep. Azel mocked Jackal's grudge towards him as he struck with sword. The fearsome sword strike flew toward Jackal's body. It cut Jackal's body once then a white flame trailed after him. The white flame stuck to Jackal's body, and it engulfed his corrupted existence. This. This can't be. This was all for nothing. The dead spirit's blood-curdling scream rang out. The white flame called Star's breath didn't give out any heat, but in a moment, it lit up the surrounding like daylight. Azel controlled the flame as he looked toward a particular direction. Recycling is a good thing. Still, I can't give you praise for reviving a dead being to use as troop. Well, he was quite useless due to his impatient personality. Most revived beings had explosive tempers. It couldn't be helped since they exceeded the limits of their bodies, and by their own choice, they revived into being undead. Moreover, most of them had experienced themselves being killed. Black magic was used to raise the revived being and it amplified the dark emotions within the dead person. It turned the dark emotions into an evil energy. If one held a grudge from being killed, the grudge was amplified into a berserk state. Azel knew about this phenomena. This was why he was able to easily defeat Jackal. You are more heartless than I thought. From across the darkness, he heard the calm voice of a woman. Then her oppressive presence started to spread. Arietta swallowed her gasp. This power, it is on par with my teacher. The woman with the long black hair was floating in midair. The magical wave she was emitting was oppressive. Giles, Bore and even Arietta was overwhelmed by her. How could such a young human woman possess this much power? Humans and dragon demon race had less magical potential compared to dragon demons, but those who reach the pinnacle surpass such limitations. Still, how could someone so young reach such heights? Chapter 38. When I met someone who was dead. Part 3. Amongst the party, Azel was the only one who wasn't intimidated. He asked a question towards the black-haired woman with a confused expression on his face. Why are you wasting your mental power in disguising yourself as a human? Do you hold some attachment to looking like a human? What are you saying, Sir Azel? Arietta was surprised, so she looked at Azel. However, Azel didn't answer her. He just stared at the black-haired woman. The black-haired woman also showed a hint of surprise. That is surprising. You are the first human to see through my disguise. It seems you haven't met that many humans before. 
Is my guess wrong? Hoo hoo. I heard you were a genius in getting on other people's nerves. I guess they were right. Don't think of it as a compliment. You of the dragon demon race. Dragon demon race. Arietta was surprised. As if she couldn't believe it, Arietta looked at the black-haired woman. No matter how much she looked at her she only possessed a strong magical energy. She didn't feel any dragon demon magic emanating from her. However, Azel was sure the enemy was disguising her looks. Azel had trained his dragon demon magic through the dragon slayer's ritual, and in the process of training his dragon demon magic, he had attained the eye of truth. He was able to see through every illusions. Since it is still working, the technique hasn't disappeared even if I lost my dragon demon magic. The eye of truth wasn't a special ability. It was a state one could also reach through spirit order. Even if one didn't train in dragon demon magic, one could train and pursue the absolute sense to achieve this technique. Of course, once one reaches this stage, it wouldn't just disappear. She spoke. My name is Niberus. At the same time, her appearance started to go through a change. Two black horns grew on top of her ears. Like Arietta's horns, it looked like an item crafted from glass. However, her two horns curved towards the sky, and it looked menacing. Moreover, her ears were much longer and pointier than a dragon demon. On the back of her hand, a red dragon demon stone emitting a bright light appeared. That was it. Dragon demons and human weren't that different in appearance. This was the same for those from the dragon demon race. However, one could tell at a glance that she wasn't human. At the same time, the feel of the magical wave completely changed. It was a power that could control the reality through one's will. It was the dragon demon magic. You, whose name is seeped in sin, should be honored at hearing my name. As you enter the road into the afterlife, this is my present to you, but it is probably too expensive of a gift for you. Who? Azul's eyebrows lifted. It really drives home the fact that I've met someone from the dragon demon race when I listen to your rude words. Who who? You have experience fighting someone of the dragon demon race. Well, just by looking at how you speak, you probably are experienced at running away in fright. I'm experienced in killing them. Niberus closed her mouth when Azel spoke in an indifferent manner. She furrowed her eyebrows. You are a worthless sinner yet you have a big mouth. Well, I don't care if you believe me or not. No, I insist you don't. Just keep thinking I'm lying. You can come to your senses after you die. Hoot. Niberus laughed. However, her anger was contained within it. In the next moment, lightning struck. The blue lightning strike poured towards Azel, and a cloud of dust rose into the air. Arietta was dismayed. Too fast. No spells were used. Moreover, she barely showed signs of using magic, so she couldn't even properly detect it. So how was she able to use such a strong magic? However, something more surprising happened in the next moment. The screams rang out from close by. Arietta looked around in surprise. Before she knew it, Azel had traveled across the darkness, and he was already within the midst of the monster, who were maintaining the perimeter. No one had thought he would ambush them like this so the monster fell in droves. Niberus raged. You dare ignore me. Azel didn't even answer her. He used his instantaneous movement to crisscross the terrified monsters as he delivered death blows. From the darkness, he appeared like a faintly visible ghost. One could see his afterimage as he repeatedly appeared and disappeared. Before his afterimage disappeared, the monster's blood flew into the air. The monsters collapsed as if they were drowning from the beads of blood raining down on them. Niberus raged at his attitude. He had completely ignored her. How dare you? She casted her magic. At a glance, one could tell it was a powerful magic. You, who aren't affiliated with the darkness, should die. The ground lightly shook, then a wave of darkness started to spread. It was a powerful curse aimed towards a person that fulfills a specific condition. This allowed one to kill only one's target when enemies and allies were all mixed together in a jumble. The spreading wave of darkness stopped expanding at a certain point, then it quickly converged on a single point. Of course, its target was Azel. Arietta shouted out a warning. Look out! At the same time, 
She activated her dragon demon magic and she tried to cut the wave of curse closing the distance towards Azel. However, Nibiru's attack ignored her attack as if it was a hallucination. You are a dragon demon, who doesn't know about the true strength of magic. Yet you dare point your dirty sword towards me. Nibiru's taunted Arietta. At the same time, Azel snorted. This is it. From within the darkness, a gruesome sound of destruction rang out. Seven fountain of blood shot into the air, and seven monsters fell as they lost their lives. The curse struck and exploded on the culprit, who was causing death. However, nothing happened. Nibirus was dismayed. What? She didn't make a mistake. Her curse was perfect. It was a magic she had used to kill many high-level spirit order practitioner up until now. Azel looked up at her with indifferent eyes. Look here. For a change, I thought I had come across the real deal. However, it seems I have come across a cub, who learned a little bit of technique. You were being so overbearing with only this much skill. What? Did you say? Nibiru's voice shook from anger. She had never been ignored all her life. At the Plains of Darkness, every one of her instructors praised her as a genius, and she had easily dispatched any humans or dragon demons she had come across on her missions. Yet a mere human, whose magic didn't look too strong, was ignoring her. She was about to attack on an impulse, but Nibirus stopped herself. What method did he use? Even though she was considered young amongst the dragon demon race, she was still a high-level magician with a good deal of battle experience under her belt. She used her powerful self-control to rein in her impulse then she used her cold judgment. It is a method I have yet to come across. However, if he was a high-ranked spirit order practitioner, then he probably has techniques that could rival great magical spells. Spirit order practitioners were basically warriors. It was easy to see them as simple brutes, but their techniques focused on their mind and senses instead of the physical body. This is why their techniques were as diverse and profound as magic. After she regained her countenance, Nibirus spoke. It is as Regina had said. I cannot tell where the floor is with this man. I thought you would give in to your impulse and go on a rampage. It seems you aren't too green, miss. If one meets an enemy one can't comprehend. One has to get a taste of them first. Nibirus spoke. When she raised her hand, the darkness vibrated. Azel clicked his tongue when he saw this. Chet. Was I too obvious? I made a mistake. He had made a mistake. He wanted Nibirus to get angry, so she would show her weakness. At the same time, he wanted to decrease the number of monsters, so he attacked them. However, his avoidance of the curse magic caught her attention, and now it much have awakened her sense of caution. The barrier technique Azel had used was simple. Nibiru's technique destroyed those, who aren't affiliated with darkness. He materialized darkness energy, and he surrounded himself with it. Of course, it sounded simple, but it wasn't a technique anyone could do. During the Dragon Demon War, he learned how to materialize his magical energy into magic. Then he had learned a technique that was capable of changing the attribute of the magic to anything he wanted. If she found out how I did it, it wouldn't be a problem. This is getting dangerous. I should be fine, but the others. He continued to make fun of her, but Nibirus wasn't an easy opponent. She had cut him off from the outside for a radius of several hundred meters. She had created a magical domain only she could use. Even if she had prepared this beforehand, this required a massive amount of magical energy. However, he couldn't see any signs of strain from her. At that moment, Nibirus spoke the words he had been worried about. Go block the man with the name soaked in sin. I'll capture the dragon demon princess first. Then Nibirus flicked her fingers. He might be too much for you all, so I'll give you a helper. A dense, evil energy that made one's blood freeze swept across the floor. Then it started gathering the dead corpses of the monsters in one location. When he saw this, Azul's eyes widened. Maybe this is. It was as he feared. The corpses were dragged into the center, and a ripple of purple light was expelled. Then a swamp of darkness appeared. The color of the swamp was something that couldn't exist naturally in this world. The corpse of the monsters continued to be dragged within, and they became part of the swamp. As the ground shook, 
a figure of a giant started rising up from inside the swamp. It was made out of pitch black darkness, but a purple colored flame burned across its entire body. It was a bizarre being. The awareness of this unrealistic difference made one feel extremely repulsed. It made one's chest feel uncomfortable. You raised a corrupted being. It seems you are a pretty accomplished black magician. Azel tensed. This was a great magic even a high-level black magicians couldn't easily use. He guessed she had prepared the spell beforehand for a situation like this. Still, if one wanted to use it as easily as Nibirus, one had to possess a massive amount of magic, and the quality of the magician casting it had to be very high. The pain and regret left by the dead, and the corrupted energy created by death was used as foundation to dissolve the bodies. Then a black magic construct, a corrupted being, was raised. This world wouldn't tolerate such a corrupted being, so it could only exist for a limited time inside the darkness. Of course, this meant its strength was superb. Nibirus put on a cold smile. It seems you have a little bit of a discerning eye. You are not worthy of being shown a magic like this. The corrupted being had a silhouette of a giant, and it let out a cry. The sound carrying the rough vibration attacked everyone standing on the earth. It didn't discriminate between allies and enemies. In a flash, everyone's movements were paralyzed. Nibirus spoke. Him. I forgot about that detail. Nibirus saw her allies frozen in place, so she added additional magic to it. This caused the corrupted being's roar to only target Azel's party. Azel was amazed. It seems she isn't normal. Nibirus easily fixed the problem as if she had forgotten something minor. However, she had used a very advanced magic. She took the sound attack, and it was modified to be able to discern between her allies and enemies. Then the corrupted being started moving towards Azel. Even though it was over three meters tall, it moved creepily towards him as if it was sliding across ice. Chapter 39. When I met someone who was dead. Part 4. When Nibirus saw the corrupted being and her underlings running towards Azel, she turned her back on him. Well, now, Arietta swung her sword down towards her. A barrier formed automatically, and blue sparks flew as it clashed with the white sword. Arietta didn't hesitate to charge her when she had judged Nibirus had put her guard down. Oh evil darkness, rend apart. Arietta had used the repelling force to retreat as she swung her sword. Then a sword made out of light struck towards Nibirus. However, Nibirus didn't show any signs of nervousness. As if she was on a leisurely stroll, she walked across the air then she slightly shook her hand. This resulted in Arietta's sword of light sliding off of her barrier, and it collapsed in the air. Arietta was taken aback. She was able to slip my attack so easily. Nibirus' attack followed afterwards. Arrow made out of light formed in midair, and it was shot towards Arietta in a dizzying manner. Sacred Valor blessed this sword. With a shout, a barrier formed and it blocked the light. However, a sound of an explosion was heard from behind. The projectiles exploded, and it blew Arietta away. Arietta was thrown towards the ground, and she was barely able to turn her body to kick the ground. She looked like a skipping stone as she kicked, rotated, kicked again and so on. Nibirus smiled as she looked at her. Hoo hoot. You are a princess of a country, but you are floundering about like a street performer. At the same time, she lightly shook her hand. This caused two sphere of light to form, and it head towards another direction. Bor let out a moan as he blocked with his shield. This was an attack aimed at the other party member, who was separated from Arietta. Nibirus spoke. My workload is too much for me to deal with bugs like you. What did you say? Bor became angry. Nibirus no longer looked towards him. Instead, the remaining monsters rushed towards him. Sir Giles. I already know. The two knights stood up as they looked at each other. During all of this, Honora had been shaking in terror. Bor assessed his surrounding as he spoke. Don't worry, Ms. Honora. Not even a single hair of yours will be hurt as long as I'm around. You stole what I wanted to say. Let's quickly get rid of these filthy bastards, then we can help the princess. Giles also spoke in a noble manner. However, several dozen monsters ran towards them. There are a lot of them. 
Giles's sword energy was swung towards the approaching enemies like a gale. The sword energy was fast yet delicate. It cut down the unruly monsters one by one. There were most definitely a lot of enemies. Most of them were larger and sturdier than humans. However, the spirit order practitioners who had reached the level of quadruple master were superhumans. They could cow them with their mental wave, and they used an electric-like attack to take the monsters' lives. They put fear into the monsters. Confusion and hesitation started to spread within the ranks of the monsters. Giles had faced large numbers of monsters in the Balan forest, so he was used to facing off against such opponents. Boar also wasn't outdone by Giles. Hong, dirty bastards. I guess you are desperate to dirty my shield with your blood. Boar had a shield, so the way he faced off against the monsters were entirely different from Giles. A group of orcs were running toward him. Boar smashed the lead orc with his shield, and it flew into the air. It looked like it was hit by a running horse. The orc's muscular body was much bigger than a human, but it flew several meters into the air. It flew over the head of the monsters. While the monsters were frozen watching the orc fly, Boar stabbed his sword over his shield. Another monster's throat was pierced like meat being skewered, and it fell to the floor. The flustered monsters ran towards Boar in unison, and they swung their weapons. Three of them ran in at Boar. Boar glared with his eyes. Instead of yelling like a person, he roared out a bestial cry. It was similar to what Azel had used. It was a roar containing a domineering mental wave. In a flash, the monster's movements slowed. As he blocked the discouraged enemy's attack with his shield, Boar stomped with all his might. Boom! Accompanying a heavy thud, the ground started to shake. The weapons swung by the monsters were deflected with great force, and the owners of the weapons fell to the floor. Ha! Boar quickly ran in, and he cut him down with his sword. Then he returned to guard his original position. Giles and Boar look at each other with sidelong glances after they killed a batch of enemies. The two of them didn't get along. From the start of the trip, Boar treated Giles like a country knight, and Boar had ignored him. They got on each other's nerves at every step, and they had fought each other for the leadership role. After Boar was annihilated by Azel, his attitude had changed. However, the relationship between Giles and Boar was still uncomfortable. Both of young knights were chosen as representative for their respective group, so this situation was inevitable. Sir Giles, how about we compete to see who could take down the most opponents? I'll take you up on that. However, at that moment, the two of them agreed on something. They had to protect Honora, and they had to help Arietta. This was why they didn't hesitate to fight with their backs against each other. Even though their movements were restricted from being surrounded by several dozen monsters, the two knights were in a difficult ordeal where they had to defeat all the monsters. Currently, everything was going as the dragon's shadow had intended. Their target was Arietta. She had been separated from Azel, who they were wary of, and the three others. If one discounted Azel, the several dozen monsters were surrounding Giles, Boar and Honora. They were in a significant danger. However, Arietta couldn't help them. Nibiris was walking towards her emitting an oppressive magical energy. Well, we've finally broken free from the disruptors. Dragon Princess. We share the same blood so I will show you some mercy. I have a proposal for you. A proposal? If you obediently follow us, I'll spare your underlings lives. What? I'm telling you to surrender. It's obvious what the result will be, so let's not tire each other out. Bullshit. Arietta kicked off the ground. She accelerated using her instantaneous movement, and in a flash, she had arrived at Nibiris back. Then she didn't hesitate to attack. However, Nibiris was gone. Arietta was surprised when she felt herself strike empty air. From her side, she heard Nibiris' languid voice. All those who wield swords are uniformly simple. Illusion. Nibiris had predicted what Arietta would do, so she had used set up an illusion. Nibiris' skill in magic was too fast and complex. Arietta didn't even realize what she had done. Boom! Arietta was struck by lightning, and she was sent flying. Arietta was barely able to right her body and land on the ground. Nibiris spoke as she looked at her. This is the second time. 
The rumors said you are intelligent. So isn't it about time you realize your place? Well, it's okay. If you want to be stubborn, I'll break that stubbornness. I'll make realize the reality of your situation. When Nibiris said, this is the second time. It was the number of times Nibiris could have taken Arietta's life. She aimed to capture Arietta alive, so even though she had the chance to deal a critical blow, she had refrained. Arietta shouted, Don't look down on me, you of the dragon demon race. Light of the ferocious beast that burns away the darkness, roar. An orange flame climbed up the white blade. Unlike a normal flame, it wasn't emitting a lot of heat. However, this was a magical flame with a massive amount of destructive force dormant within its magical flame. Go! When she swung her sword, the fire elongated like a whip, and it struck against Nibirus. This wasn't a one-off move. Arietta breathed in, then she let out a couple dozen malleable sword energy. It created a dizzying white trace across the empty air, and it hit Nibirus. The flame exploded on impact. From where the attack ignited to behind several dozen meter, explosive flames spread out in a fan shape. She proved that her reputation as the dragon demon princess wasn't false. She displayed a devastating power. It was an attack capable of killing dozens of enemy in a flash. However, Arietta wasn't done yet. She brought her sword down as she ran. Oh fire dragon, let out your anger. The orange flames surrounding the sword started to emit heat, and it changed into a real flame. Arietta's fierce sword strike was able to split even a castle wall. Aren't you satisfied after squirming this much? In the next moment, a languid voice entered into Arietta's ear. Boom! At the same time, Arietta was struck from the side with no warning. Arietta couldn't even scream as she was thrown to the ground. In front of her, Nibirus was walking out of the fiercely burning magical flame. Not even a single hair was damaged. After rolling several times on the ground, Arietta gritted her teeth as she got up. I guess it was another illusion. Nibirus was walking from a location entirely different from where Arietta had predicted. This time she had been prepared for Nibirus to use her illusion magic. However, she had still been completely fooled. Pitiful. Nibirus' words held pity within it. However, the voice didn't come out of the Nibirus walking out from the flame. Multiple illusion. Arietta's eyes widened. Nibirus was walking towards her from all direction. There were a total of seven Nibirus, and all of them looked like the real body. Moreover, there was a strong magical wave that was interfering with Arietta's senses. Even if she tried to sense Nibirus' life energy, she couldn't tell which one was the real one. Nibirus spoke. If you come obediently, then everything will be easier. As if her words were a spell, consecutive lightning strikes exploded forth. The lightning strikes exploded as it ripped through the darkness. Arietta mindlessly ran away. I can't read the signs. When a warrior fights against a magician, the warrior reads the flow of the magical energy. Once the warrior sees the sign that magic is being used, one could react to the magic. Even if one couldn't tell what kind of magic it was, one could still block it if one knew when the magic was coming. However, Nibirus didn't have a tell in her magic. It seemed like she wasn't doing anything when the lighting struck. This basically means, that woman is just playing with me. One after another she was hit with lightning that was powerful enough to instantly kill a normal person. However, Nibirus was just flicking her finger as if she was barely putting her strength into the attack. Even if one possessed powerful magical strength, one still needed an effective techniques to use. She hadn't even gathered her power in one place to amplify her magic. She had omitted steps yet she was able to produce this much power. Nibirus spoke. Your defense is pretty admirable. I heard you were taught by the dragon demon duke. It seems he taught you well. You know my teacher. I've never personally seen him. However, I've heard about his reputation enough times to make my ears bleed. Now that I see his student I could tell your teacher has great skill. Nibirus genuinely gave a compliment to Arietta's skills. Of course, this was a judgment made by a person who was in a much superior position. It was like saying, she's better than I thought. Nibirus continued to use lightning to incapacitate Arietta. 
Normally, even if you block the lightning itself, the clap of the thunder damages one's eardrum. It'll be impossible for the person to move properly. Afterward Arietta had been worried about this, so she had used her dragon energy to protect her eardrums from the beginning. Even if the lightning didn't incapacitate her, a single damaged eardrum would make her lose her fighting capability. I can't win against this enemy with just my strength. Arietta coldly calculated her chances. Chapter 40. When I met someone who was dead. Part 5. She came to a conclusion. She determined she had no chance of winning against Niberus no matter how much she struggled. The difference between their power was too overwhelming. She could see only one way out. It was Niberus' attitude. She knew Niberus wasn't paying much attention to her. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to do anything with this fact. She is taking me lightly, but she isn't careless about protecting herself. Niberus' inattention resulted from her trust in her own defensive ability. Even if Arietta was better than Niberus had predicted, she couldn't break through the barrier even if she caught Niberus off guard. This caused the magician to be arrogant. Unfortunately, Arietta didn't have the strength to tear down her arrogance. If she used all her power to deliver a fatal blow, then it might be possible. However, Niberus' carelessness didn't mean she would allow Arietta to prepare her strike. I won't be able to escape. The enemy's aim was to kidnap her, so running away was the best way to go. However, she was surrounded by a barrier of darkness, and it wouldn't allow her to escape. I guess I'll have to hold out by taking advantage of the enemy's indifferent attitude. Arietta decided to trust her allies. If she was able to stall for time, then Azel would surely do something. Arietta laughed bitterly at her thoughts. When did I start to? When did she start to rely on Azel so much? She had no idea. At this moment, she felt more secure by the fact that Azel was fighting in this battlefield. She'd prefer him over a thousand troops supporting her. Niberus raised her hand when she saw Arietta's relentless determination. You are foolish to continue this fight when the result is a foregone conclusion. It'll just make both of us weary. Your arrogance can't last forever, dragon demon. It isn't arrogance. After she spoke coldly, a dark flame-like darkness surged forth, and it surrounded Niberus' vicinity. She spoke as half of her figure was cloaked in darkness. I'm just speaking the truth. Azel frowned as he saw the corrupted being approach him. This is going to be a pain in the ass. That thing is annoying. Azel had plenty experience in fighting against a corrupted being. It was an oft-used method by the high-level black magicians in the Dragon Demon War. The magic didn't differentiate between allies or enemies when it gathered the corpses into one place. Usually, it would also cause massive damage to the allies when the corrupted being was born. Of course, the corrupted being wasn't a scary opponent for Azel. The problem was this opponent was annoying enough to delay him. I have no choice. Azel calmly took a single deep breath. Bar dump. His heart beat faster. The rings of life resonated, and his magic amplified. The magic flowing in his energy pulse accelerated, and it flowed into the rings of life. Then the magic amplified as it passed through the first ring, then it amplified again after passing through the second ring. As the magic passed through the final third ring, it was amplified more and more. Before it could go back into energy pulse, pulsation of the blood vessels and small vibrations of the bones added fuel to amplification. Then the magic amplified to its maximum point. His heartbeat raced faster, and the flow of magic in his energy pulse accelerated more and more. Every time the magic passed his heart, the magical energy expanded more and more. It filled up his energy pulse, and as if that wasn't enough, the magic spread to every part of his body. Still, the magic was overflowing, so it started wrapping around his body. This process happened in an instant. Before the enemies under orders could attack him, and before the corrupted being got in range for an attack, Azel had already finished amplifying his magical energy. He could freely control the beat of his heart. He could control each blood vessels in his body. This allowed the spirit order practitioner to perceive time differently from a normal person. The spirit order practitioner could slow down or speed up the perception of time one feels. At his moment, he was stretching out the time to the extremes. 
good, Hazel mumbled in a small voice. His body was far from being complete. The vessel that held his magical energy was too small. If Hazel compared himself to his prime, the amount of magic he could hold didn't even reach 10%. However, it was enough to deal with this situation. The reason being Azel knew of a method where he could temporarily control the overflowing magical energy. He wrapped it around his body. Azel had the time to amplify his magic in a relaxed state, and now his enemies would feel a different level of power from him. The corrupted being ran towards him. Just by looking at its size one could guess how strong it was. Its strength probably exceeded that of an ogre by a wide margin. This wasn't the end of it. The corrupted being was a crystallization of a curse, so anything it touched was deadly to any being in this world. Azel dodged the corrupted being's hand, and he retreated backwards. At the same time, he tilted his head by a marginal amount. Suddenly, a black blade burst out of the ground, and it barely missed the side of his face. It didn't end there. The blank blades continuously burst forth from the ground, and it tried to skewer him. Azel moved as if he was dancing, and he was able to avoid all of it. At the same time he came to a stop, he stomped hard on the ground. It looked like a light stomp, but the surrounding surface shook in its entirety. Azel's senses were developed to the extreme, so he heard the moan let out by someone five meters below the surface. It was the sound of Kyrian, who attacked his enemies as he moved freely through the ground. The vibrational energy caused by the stomp was transferred through the earth, and it had attacked Kyrian. Azel wanted to send an additional blow to end Kyrian, but he did have the time to do so. In that brief moment, the corrupted being had closed the distance, and it was swinging its arm. Claws of the Thunder Dragon. Azel let fly his sword strike on a similar trajectory as the other's attack. The sound of thunder overlapped with the sound of Niberus attacking Arietta. Azel's sword was emitting thunder strikes, and it ripped apart the corrupted giant's arm. At the unexpected sound of thunder, the enemies who were approaching Azel for an attack flinched. Azel moved using his instantaneous movement method, and it left his after image. The sword strike let out a blue light as it made a long gash on the corrupted being's back. The aggregate of corrupted power making up the body dispersed as it fragmented off. It's really sturdy. Annoying. Azel grumbled. Then he reversed the additional blow he was going to send with his sword, and he stabbed towards his back. Boom. Accompanying an explosive sound, a sharp cry rang out. It was a feminine scream, but the voice was very hoarse. It sounded very odd. Your scream is unexpectedly quite feminine. Mo's Regina. Regina moaned. She had used her stealth technique to hide herself. She had even used it to hide her life energy so she had thought this would be the perfect time to attack him. However, Azel had become aware of her ghost-like figure, and he had counter-attacked. Azel grinned as he pressed his attack on Regina. Transparent blades of force flew towards him in the air. Azel deflected it, and he suddenly retreated backwards. At the same time, he tilted his body towards the ground, then he let fly a sword strike at a very odd angle. Kyrian, who was about to burst through the surface, let out a yell. While Azel was focused on Regina, Kyrian had decided to ambush Azel. However, Azel had cut Kyrian as if he had been waiting for that exact opportunity. What? What the? Kyrian watched a fountain of blood burst forth from his body, and he moaned. He still had the wound on his face left by Azel. Kiron's eyes was burning with anger. Azel Zestring, you son of a bitch. Before Azel could reply, Kyrian disappeared from sight. Afterwards, a sphere of darkness crashed into the spot. In a flash, Azel moved a distance over ten meters as he spoke. You are trying to detain me with this. Your superiors have a very bad grip on reality. Azel was surrounded by four enemies. The cursed being, Regina, and Kyrian surrounded him. Moreover, a black magician Azel had never seen before was hiding inside the darkness. He was the one who had shot the sphere of darkness. Kyrian was severely injured, and he was swaying. He had stopped the bleeding for now, but he was in a poor shape. He had tried an ambush yet he received a counterattack instead. Azul's eyes shone with a terrifying light. I don't have time to play with you. 
I'll take care of you quickly. His magical energy were overflowing from his body, and he would use it to defeat his enemies quickly. He was emitting far greater power than normal, so it was a big burden on his body. Moreover, it quickly exhausted his mental power, so he couldn't maintain this state for a long time. In the next moment, Azel disappeared. What? Regina was taken aback. That wasn't it. She had thought he used the instantaneous movement to disappear. She was preparing for a strike from the back, when he appeared once again. However, there were more than one. One appeared behind the corrupted being. Another one appeared in front of Regina. One was next to Kyrian, and last one was behind the black magician. A cloning technique. Even the dragon demon with enhanced senses couldn't tell the difference between the real body, and the false image. At that moment, every one of them looked like a false image. Are you perhaps making the mistake in thinking I'm hiding somewhere? Azel spoke as he appeared behind the black magician. The black magician was terrified as he realized his back was taken and he was a beat too late. He reflexively activated his defensive magic. At the same time, the corrupted being and Regina headed towards them. That's the real one. When she was about to open her mouth, the false images disappeared as the presence of Azel came into focus. How was he able to find the hidden black magician so easily? And Azel was attacking him first. Even as she used her instantaneous movement, she knew her last-ditch effort would be too late. However, she froze when she heard a scream from behind. How? Azel was attacking the black magician, so why was Kyrian screaming? Kyrian, who was seriously injured, tried to hide himself again below ground when Azel moved. He had lost too much of his composure from receiving the large wound. He won't be able to attack again at that moment. Azel grabbed his throat then he stabbed him through the heart. This can't be. Kyrian's eyes widened in disbelief as he took his last breath. Azel confirmed that Kyrian wasn't breathing. Azel threw him away. This method works well against those who are confident in their senses. He divided his life signature of his main body, and he had made several clones. Only one of the clones would hold a life signature akin to his real body. His enemies didn't have the time to evaluate his clones properly, so they had mistaken the clone for the actual body. When the enemies focused their attention on the bait, Azel's real body attacked the weak link. He killed Kyrian. Also, I'm not done yet. What? At Azel's meaningful words, Regina couldn't help but turn around to look. The inattentive black magician was pierced by a sword that burst forth from below. How could this be? The black magician was horrified. Azel flicked his fingers. The sword that was lodged inside the black magician's body started to spread a destructive energy, and it destroyed the black magician's heart. The black magician breathed his last breath, before he could even scream. Azel had layered another trap on top of the first one. He attacked from the back after making them believe his real body was elsewhere. After his first trap ended, he activated his second trap while everyone had let their guard down. Azel shrugged his shoulders. I'm thankful since you guys keep falling for the same trick. The second trap was a variation on the method he used in the Balan forest. Azel had stolen a sword from a monster as he took killed the monsters. He used his stealth technique to hide it, and he carried it around in such a way where so no one would suspect he had it. Then he used this opportunity to throw the sword. The difference between the last time he used it and now was the fact that Azel was able to move the throne item in a more complex manner. The enemies were distracted by his clones, and before they could react to the fact that they had been duped. The hidden sword was sent flying low to the ground. He abruptly accelerated the sword, and it was thrust up and into the black magician. Except for the lady from the dragon demon race, all of you are simpletons. Why don't you challenge me after studying a little bit more? Regina trembled when she witnessed the frightening sight. She couldn't suppress her terror as it started to well up. What exactly is this man's identity? Chapter 41. When I met someone who was dead. Part 6. As she worked as a member of the dragon's shadow, she had fought and killed a lot of humans. She also had plenty experience fighting against spirit order practitioners. However, amongst them, no one fought like Azel. Of course, this was the case. 
the run-of-the-mill spirit order practitioners wouldn't be able to imitate the techniques devised by Azel. Azel had once reached the pinnacle level, so he could use such unreasonable technical skills. I can't win against him. The certainty of defeat ruled over her. If he showed an overwhelming strength, then it would have been easier for her to swallow this defeat. However, Azel used sophisticated techniques, and deceptive tricks to make surprise attacks. Her allies with great power were cut down so easily that it was absurd. She couldn't comprehend what was happening, and this created a fear inside her. Should I run away? However, she wasn't allowed to do so. She had to stall until Nibiris captured the dragon demon princess. She started to retreat haltingly when Azel suddenly appeared in front of Regina. The moment he sensed her agitation, he immediately used his instantaneous movement to charge after her. Sword hit against sword as sparks flew. Her balance was broken, but Azel pulled back from striking a critical blow. The reason being the corrupted being had ran in at that moment. Regina stabbed with her sword towards Azel in an almost reflexive manner. The enemy in front of her hesitated in attacking her, and her ally was attacking from Azel's rear. She had thought it would be the best chance for her to attack. However, Regina soon realized she had fallen into a trap. This was also planned by this person. Azel had a cold smile on his face. The moment she started her attack his figure disappeared as if he had been waiting for this moment. He had prepared his movement technique as if he had been waiting for her move. He activated it with exquisite timing where she couldn't pull back her attack. Regina's field of vision was swallowed by the corrupted being's enormous body. Then, Azel appeared behind the corrupted being and his fierce strike exploded. The lightning flash sliced and ripped into the corrupted being's large body. Regina, who was on the other side of their body, was also swept up in the attack. We were dancing on top of his palms from beginning to the end. Even one from the dragon demon race won't be able to face Regina who had fallen in despair, couldn't continue her thoughts. The exquisite pain swirling around her entire body made her lose her consciousness. Nibiris furrowed her brows. She's really tenacious. In front of her, Arietta was covered in dirt, and she was breathing raggedly. Arietta couldn't even harm a single hair on Nibiris. She was busy focusing only on defense. It was impossible for her to run away. Nibiris used a delicate magical fog to prevent Arietta from escaping a certain area. Her movements were being restricted. Unlike her calm exterior, Nibiris wasn't as relaxed inside. I never expected this mission to turn out to be this annoying. If she wanted to kill Arietta, this would have already ended. The problem was the goal of her mission. She had to capture the dragon demon princess Arietta, while causing minimal damage to her. She couldn't cause damage that couldn't be healed. She had to catch Arietta intact, and it was a really tricky proposition. It would have been easier for her if she could use a curse or a binding magic to subdue Arietta. However, Arietta's skills were outstanding. Nibiris had no choice but to send lukewarm attacks to methodically cut down her stamina. She smiled when she saw Arietta pant. Is this the end? Anyone could tell by looking at Arietta that she was refusing to yield. Nibiris didn't get angry. Instead, she let out a sigh. If my underlings were a little bit more useful, then this assignment could have been done more easily. What? It happened when Arietta was puzzling over Nibiris' words. A blue flame sparked in front of Nibiris' eyes. Before she knew it, Azel had approached her from the front, and he had brought down his sword. Nibiris spoke. You are a troublesome person like the report indicated. Azel whistled as he pressed against her barrier. I guess you aren't dumb like your underlings. Nibiris' barrier hadn't activated from conscious command right now. She had prepared for a scenario where she would be ambushed. The barrier magic was prepared in a way where it would activate when certain conditions were met. From the moment Nibiris' barrier activated, the magical pattern was changing fluidly. She used the magical alignment to negate, and cut off the backlash. Nibiris spoke. You with the name seeped in sin. Why don't you just call me Azel? Isn't it annoying to use such a long name? Nibiris Arjuma. What did you say? When Nibiris heard the word, Arjuma, her eyebrows rose. 
At the same time, a lightning strike exploded atop the barrier. It let out a bright light into the surrounding, and it felt like the white light could sear the eyes in an instant. Afterwards, the thunderclap shook the surrounding. Nibirus was taken aback. He's unscathed. Her thunderstrike had the power to demolish a mountain. However, he wasn't damaged at all, and he was looking down at her. Nibirus felt her heart sink when she saw Azel laugh coldly. Did you think insulation magic could only be used by a magician? Do you really think you can solve everything with a thunderstrike? You are sorely mistaken if you think you can take on the world even if you are a high-level magician. Azel changed his magical energy into an insulator. He wrapped his magical energy around himself. Then he let the thunderstrike pass through him. Magical energy could be changed into any attribute. Since it was obvious to Azel that the opponent was going to, to use a thunderstrike, he was able to easily defend against it. Azels continued to attack. Earth's Sage. He tilted his sword slightly as he moved in an odd fashion. Nibiru's lower body inside the barrier received a weak impact from the sword as it passed by. The impact wasn't enough to hurt her. However, Nibirus was shaken when she realized Azel had pierced through her barrier, and the attack had affected her. This is. In front of the surprised Nibirus, Azel used another technique. Storm Dragon's Claw. Azel slightly pulled his sword back, then he struck. The result was extraordinary. The movement shouldn't allow a human body to deliver such power. In a flash, the accelerating blade moved faster than the speed of sound. It ripped through the barrier, then a shock wave exploded. Accompanying an explosive sound, Nibirus was flung away. Before she collided with the ground, she was barely able to change the trajectory of her flight. Nibirus moaned. There was a slight rip near the clothes on her chest, and blood dripped down near her lips. As expected, your possession of the name soaked in sin wasn't for show. Nibirus was speaking, while refusing to yield, when she became startled. At that moment, Azel had appeared behind her back, and he had swung his sword. The barrier with the pre-programmed instructions barely activated in time. However, Azel had predicted this would happen. When the sword strike collided with the barrier, he didn't resist against the force. He was flung away as he rotated his body. Then Azel disappeared. He made use of the repulsive force. Then he used the instantaneous movement in midair even though he didn't have any place to push off from. Nibiru's instincts warned her of her imminent death. So she desperately yelled out. The dragon in my blood. Awake. At the same time, a strong shock wave exploded with her at the center. The ripple of destruction spread out in a circle, and the radius of several dozen meters were destroyed. Nibirus was dripping with cold sweat. She was breathing hard since he had quickly poured out her magical energy. She did it because the fear of death had crawled up to the back of her neck. If she hadn't prepared a trump card, her head would have been separated from her neck. I knew it, you bastard. You are a person who've studied the forgotten techniques. Nibirus spoke as she covered her face with one hand. She wasn't just speaking to him. Her voice itself was a magic trying to oppress the opponent. From across the dirt cloud, she heard Azel's voice. Forgotten techniques. Yes, I know about men like you. They are morons with swords, but they also know how to reach the great wisdom. I've watched what you've done. You did impossible feats that most others couldn't replicate. Since you are talking like that, it must mean your organization hasn't forgotten about the knowledge. They must have preserved it. The conversation between the two were a part of the battle. They used their voice in an attempt to overpower each other, and they were trying to confuse the other's senses. At the same time, they were furiously scanning the surrounding for each other's location. Maybe. Azel continued to speak, but she couldn't see him through the cloud of dust. She could only make out a faint silhouette. However, Nibirus already knew that the silhouette wasn't Azel. Did you guys steal the knowledge from humans? The voice kept coming from different places. Moreover, the silhouette's location kept changing. She was using her search magic to chase after his life signature, but Azel wasn't that easy of an opponent. He was overtly spreading his life signature to various locations. It basically made it impossible for her to determine where he was. Nibirus also tried to use his voice to determine where he was. However, 
Azel was able to bewilder her on that front too. Truthfully, if he said he was a high-level magician instead of a spirit order practitioner, I would have believed him. Nibiris knew high-level spirit order practitioners were a ludicrous existence. She knew it since her organization also had spirit order practitioners who had inherited the lost knowledges. Still, Azel was an enigma to Nibiris. You, who knew about and performed the Dragon Slayer's ritual? Nibiris asked in a quiet voice. Did you really kill a dragon? What if I did? It's weird. You most definitely possess outstanding techniques. However, Nibiris voiced her doubt. Your magical energy is too weak. You might be able to kill a high-ranking magician with that quantity of power, but it would be impossible to kill a dragon. When spirit order practitioners reach a certain level, their magical energy increases proportionally. As a spirit order practitioner becomes more skillful, the person can efficiently deal with more magical energy. The skills and magical energy shown by Azel was unbalanced. The magical energy couldn't be compared to Azel's skill. If Azel didn't have sufficient magical energy, then it would have been impossible for him to reach such a high skill level. However, you were able to complete the Dragon Slayer's ritual. What method did you use? If I give you an answer, will you let us live? I might. If you are going to tell a lie, why don't tell a better one? Azel snorted. Nibirus spoke. I'm telling you the truth. I'll guarantee your lives. I promise on my name. It basically means you are going to imprison us as new recruits. Yes. This negotiation has come to an end. That's a shame. Nibirus really felt regret. Many people wrecked their lives from trying to satisfy their curiosity, and magicians were the front runners in leading such a life. Even Nibirus couldn't escape from the magician's disposition. She felt regret at the fact that she had to kill Azel, who was a box full of mysteries. As the dust cloud slowly settled, Nibirus decided on how she should act. A whirlwind rose up and the cloud of dust disappeared. At that exact moment, Azel appeared in the front and in the back at the same time. Nibirus couldn't wait any longer, so she cleared the dust cloud. However, Azel was aiming for this opportunity. When she raised a whirlwind, the area around her fuzzed for a brief moment. From inside the dust cloud, Azel had created two clones, and when both were discovered, her attention would focus them. As I suspected, the person who felt a frightening sensation was Azel. Chapter 42. When I met someone who was dead. Part 7. From beneath Nibiris' feet, a tentacles of darkness extended itself. Azel barely avoided it as he retreated. Kook. I was outsmarted. I underestimated her too much. Blood was flowing from Azel's body. The leather armor was shredded as if it was paper. His chest had a wound as if a wild beast had scratched him. Azel had lost this round of the fight. Nibiris had seen through Azel's plan, and she had counter-attacked. The several dozen tentacles of darkness formed around Nibiris' surrounding, and they didn't reflect any light. The tentacles of darkness didn't look solid as it crawled. Nibiris spoke from within. I can't kill the dragon demon princess. But I can kill you if I want to. As expected, I was the one who had been disadvantaged. Well before Azel and Nibiris fought each other, both of them had eyed each other to see how the other fought against one's opponents. Nibiris was the one who had benefited from the prior investigation. Azel had shown his skills when he blitzed the members of the dragon's shadow to resolve the situation quickly. Nibiris couldn't kill Arietta, so she hadn't shown any of her real abilities. Nibiris was of the dragon demon race, and her magic was outstanding. She also used the latest magic techniques, so there weren't enough information to gauge Nibiris' true power. Nibiris spoke. The secrets within your head is valuable. However, Sometimes it is beneficial to throw away the small prey to catch a bigger one. I'm going to go all out now. Her voice was heard from behind Azel as a different Nibiris rushed him. However, Azel didn't turn around. Another Nibiris appeared next to Azel's side. Who? Sir I'm guessing you aren't fooled by the clones. Unfortunately not. Azel grinned, and he stomped his foot again. A vibration spread with Azel as the epicenter. It is the most basic method to deal with the clones made by the opponent's illusion magic. 
it is to see how the clones reacted to the vibrations, and one would also observe if the cloud of dirt affected the bodies. This was how one could differentiate a clone from the opponent's real body. Since Nibiru's clones were illusions, she couldn't do anything about these weak points. After realizing where her real body was, Azel unhesitatingly charged towards her. However, Azel's sword cut through empty air. I thought you were someone who was a little bit smarter. Nibiru's appeared behind the flustered Azel. The body that was determined to be the real body was a bait placed by Nibiru's. The tentacles of darkness stretched towards Azel. It tried to wrap around Azel's body. I am. Suddenly, Azel's expression changed into a smile. At the same time, his storm-like sword play blocked the tentacles of darkness. This situation was happening as he intended. Azel had the eyes of truth, so he hadn't been blinded by the clone in the first place. However, he wanted to trick Nibirus, so he used the traditional method to deal with her illusions. I thought you were a little bit smarter since you were of the dragon demon race. What? Nibirus became surprised at that moment. Something unseen passed by her cheek. When she felt the sharp cut on her cheek, she froze. What the? She couldn't understand what had happened. What had cut her cheeks? She knew her head had been nearly pierced. She took the risk of dividing her attention, so she could nest another barrier within the other just in case. This had saved her life. Nibirus turned her head without realizing it. She knew she shouldn't turn her head, but she couldn't stop her head from reflexively turning. She saw a single short sword on the ground a short distance away. That broke through my barrier. The surprised Nibirus immediately realized what she was doing, and her body shuddered. She was in midst of a battle yet she had took her eyes off her enemy. She desperately turned her head back to look at Azel. He was in front of her with five floating swords in the air. He levitated the swords he had secretly picked up from the dead monsters, and the swords were letting out light. Dragon's forces. Go to war. At his shout, blue lights in the shape of a dragon's wrapped around the swords. At Azul's shout, the swords shot forward like arrows. Nibirus desperately used her barrier magic. She was able to block every sword with a light dragon around it. At the same time, she was puzzled. Why is the power of the attack so weak? She had expected a dangerous attack since her eyes had been drawn away. However, the attack was weak enough to make her yawn. The reason was soon revealed. Princess. Right now, from behind Azel, Arietta charged forward. Under Azel's instructions, Arietta had recovered her stamina, then she had been waiting for this moment. The dragon demon magic injected within the white blade exploded forth, and it reacted to Arietta's command. O oh, evil darkness, rend apart. The flood of light assaulted Nibirus. At the same moment, Nibirus realized what trap Azel had readied. I never knew such a devilish technique existed. There were five swords stabbed into the top of the barrier magic. Each sword was letting out various pattern of magical vibrations, and the swords were resonating with each other. The pillar of light sent by Arietta struck on top of the swords. The swords continuously changed its magical pattern to disrupt the barrier. This was a technique that would give nightmares to any magician. Every second the magical pattern randomly changed at those points. This attack was ruthlessly breaking down her barrier magic. Moreover, Azel started to move from beyond the barrier. Dragon's forces. Bloom. The shout carried his command. With time stretched, he amplified his magic, then he poured out all of his power. The light dragon wrapped around his sword, and it let out a roar as it attacked Nibirus. Nibirus let out a scream. She was going to die like this. The rampaging dragon of light was going to absorb into her bones. Her brain felt like it was burning from just maintaining her crumbling barrier. With her desperate will, she activated another magic. Unlike human magic, she could use a power that could bend reality with her will. She concentrated her dragon demon magic to activate a magic that would have been impossible to cast in her normal state. Mirror of emptiness. Accompanying a shout that seemed to have been wrung out of her, the pillar of light heading towards her like hail warped. The light dragon bent as it was almost upon her, and it pierced towards the sky. The massive barrier of darkness covering the surrounding ripped, 
and the night sky showed itself. The thunderous roar quickly sped away, and the air started to change. A faint light shined through the space that had been completely dominated by darkness. The moon was barely there, but compared to the complete darkness of the curtain of darkness it felt very bright. Nibiru swayed as if she was going to fall over. However, Azel didn't attack her. It wasn't because he had used up all of his power. If he had, he wouldn't have grabbed Arietta, who was about to charge Nibirus. Arietta turned to look at Azel with a questioning look. Azel told her his reason. If you charge in right now, you will be hurt. What? Arietta was surprised. And instead of explaining himself, Azel twitched his finger. This caused the sword that had grazed Nibirus before to rise up from behind Nibirus. It flew towards her. When the sword approached Nibirus' vicinity, it was bizarrely distorted, and the sword broke. Azel thought to himself as he saw this. She had caused her magic to berserk in a fixed domain. She forced the uncontrollable explosive power into a certain direction. Normally, one couldn't control the berserk magical energy. The moment when one fails to control one's magic, the magician should expect death from the berserk magical energy. However, Nibirus purposefully caused it to happen, and she used a method only available to the dragon demon race to control it. Even if her control over the magic crumbled, she used her strong will to force change in the reality. She had poured a massive amount of dragon demon magic to cause this effect. In theory, it is possible to do this, but she actually pulled it off. She is a formidable young lady. The difference between magic, and dragon demon magic was simple. At its heart, will was refined into magic. Whether it is magic or spirit order, the technique could cause phenomenons that would occur in nature. On the other hand, dragon demon magic didn't have to go through a complicated process like magic. It can coerce natural phenomena through the owner's will. The being could just create a strong mental image of fire erupting as one focused one's dragon demon magic then the fire would form. The special attribute of dragon demon magic was only found in dragon demons, and those of the dragon demon race. This was the reason why they had more talent for becoming magicians. When one becomes a high rank magician, the gap between magic and dragon demon magic lessens. However, there were certain things that could only be done by those possessing dragon demon magic. The technique used to defend herself by Nibirus was an example of this method. She intentionally let the magic making up the barrier go berserk, then she used the special attribute of the dragon demon magic to coerce the magic into a certain direction. The light dragon that was about to break down the barrier was swept up into the magic going berserk and it was sent towards the sky. Nibirus let out a dark laugh. Hoo hoo, this is quite humiliating for me as a magician. Magicians strive to use elaborate magic to get the result they want. She had lost in terms of technique to an opponent, who was woefully lacking power. Moreover, her life had been saved from danger by using brute force. As a magician, her humiliation was endless. Once the magical energy goes berserk, the thrashing magical energy doesn't dissipate immediately. This was why Azel hadn't attacked. Nibirus looked like she wasn't doing anything, but she was blocking the magical energy from harming her. Nibirus spoke as she calmed her breathing. I lost this round of battle. I'll admit it. Her pride had been hurt. She stared at Azel with fearsome eyes. So, I'll ask you again. You with the name seeped in sin. Do you have more methods left you could use? Nibirus' murderous intent pressed down on Azel and Arietta's senses. Azel looked at Nibirus with a stiff face. Nibirus took one step forward. Your technique is much superior to any human I have come across. However, unfortunately, you don't have the power to back up your techniques. Azel used surprising techniques, and psychological traps to outmaneuver Nibirus. However, she would crush him with the absolute difference in their power. No matter how outstanding his technique was it was meaningless if one was short on power. Maybe if it was any other opponent, it might be possible for him to defeat them. However, Nibirus was someone he couldn't defeat with techniques only. Suddenly Azel spoke. Well, I had some idea things might turn out like this. What? Nibirus' eyebrows rose when Azel relaxed his expression. Azel spoke. You might be able to block my attacks. 
Azel had regarded Nibiris highly. Even if he compared her to the dragon demon race from the dragon demon war, she would considered to be on the strong side. However, he had put down two traps to deal a great blow to her. He had tricked her into believing he had pierced through her unbreakable barrier to cause confusion within her. Azel had used the earth sage, since Nibiris' barrier didn't extend below ground. He had used the energy within his foot to circumvent the barrier from below, while he acted as if he used some meaningful sword art. However, if he put too much power into his stomp, then there was a high chance Nibiris would react to it. To create a psychological disturbance, he used his mental wave to stimulate Nibiris' sense into believing she had received a light blow. At the same moment she became agitated, Azel had used another technique towards the swords touching Nibiris' barrier. The constantly changing magic pattern was used on a portion of Nibiris' barrier. He had mixed in his energy, so he could change the pattern as he wanted. Afterward, he kept distracting Nibiris, so she hadn't realized the fact that the powerful attack had ripped open the barrier. He kept up with attack to create a crucial weakness. He used his concealment technique to hide a nearby short sword and he controlled it remotely. He created a small gap and he had squeezed the sword through the barrier. When Nibiris was caught off guard, she unconsciously turned around to see what happened. This created a decisive crack in her defense, and he had attacked by mobilizing Arietta. Even as he did this, Azel had made plan in case Nibiris was able to block the attack. However, the barrier that was imprisoning us is gone. At his words, Nibiris' eyes widened. The curtain of darkness they had prepared beforehand using magical tools had been ripped apart and it was gone. Chapter 43. When I met someone who was dead. Part 8. Azel continued to speak. I know the barrier wasn't solely made to prevent us from escaping. I'm not sure of its exact purpose, but there must be a reason why you waited until this time to attack us. Nibiris bit her lips. Azel's words got to the heart of the matter. The curtain of darkness wasn't prepared to simply block Arietta from running away. She had put in all the effort to conceal what was happening inside the barrier from outside eyes. Azel grinned. I guess I'm right. Azel confirmed his conjecture was correct, when he saw Nibiris' reaction. He didn't know what her reasons were, but she had a reason for using a grandiose magic like the curtain of darkness to kidnap Arietta in secret. Nibiris' expression soon calmed down. Her face was filled with a cold fury as she glared at Azel. We've been dancing on the palm of your hand. However, don't think everything will turn out as you intended. If Nibiris acted wisely, she would have retreated right now. However, her pride wouldn't allow it. How could I fail at such an insignificant mission? I won't allow this to happen. After her skills were recognized, she had never failed a mission task to her. Her perfect career will be blemished from this. She wouldn't allow it. Only death awaits those who raise the dragon's ire. Nibiris let out a thick wave of darkness. Azel disappeared in front of her. Azel moved towards her using his instantaneous movement, and he swung his sword right on top of her barrier. Or that's what she had thought for a brief second. Clone. Nibiris was taken aback. Azel's clone had attacked her. His clone is able to attack like his real body. If he was using magic, then she would understand how he did it. One would just have to materialize magic at the clone's location. However, this attack wasn't carried out in that fashion. She most definitely felt the impact of a sword with magic imbued within it. This is impossible. She wasn't able to comprehend what was happening using her knowledge, so she froze for a moment. Azel used this hesitation to grab Arietta's hand, and they attempted an escape. Everyone run. I'll hit them from the side, so coordinate an escape. Azel shouted with his whispering. After fighting without support, Giles and Boar had defeated most of the monsters on their end, and they looked up in surprise. Azel ran into their midst, and he ruthlessly cut down any monsters near them. After a second delay, Giles and Boar surprisingly reacted swiftly. After cutting down the monsters frozen from Azel's sneak attack, Boar put Anora over his shoulder then he started running. Moza Nora, please pardon my action. Anora let out a scream, but Boar didn't have time to be considerate. Oh no, Nibiris realized a beat too late, 
and she was taken aback. Who could have guessed they would run away like this? I won't let you get away. Darkness erupted beneath Nibiru's feet. The darkness coalesced to form crawling tentacles. From below, a large shape that would be the body connecting to the tentacles revealed itself. It was like the corrupted being in that it chased after the party as if it was sliding across the ground. Azul's party started to run away. From the start, they all dispersed into different directions. This was a decision made by Azel. Azel surmised they would all die if they initially ran away in a group. He ordered everyone to disperse. Before everyone could carry out his instructions, an unexpected problem arose. It was something even Azel couldn't have foreseen. A light flashed in front of his eyes. Azel quickly raised his sword to block. The sound of an explosion rang out, and Azel was flung back. The impact spread through his entire body, and his body was briefly paralyzed. The existence giving off a fearsome aura cleared his throat, then he opened his mouth. Hum hum, I was on standby just in case. It seems I will be of some help, miss. He was a swordsman wearing a black armor that covered his entire body. Judging by his voice, he was an imposing male. His face wasn't visible, so his age couldn't be determined. He had a large body that was over two meters tall. As if it was a set to his armor, he held a black sword. As befitting his large two-meter frame, the sword was twice as large and twice as thick as a normal sword. Joran, why are you here? Nibirus, who was tracking the party, revealed her dismay. It seemed even she didn't realize the presence of the dark swordsman. Ah, I was here, since I also have some business in this country. Did the elders send you? No, the elders didn't order it, but... But, this old man's overly cautious nature brought me here. I will apologize if this offends you. You couldn't trust me to take care of her. For a moment, Nibiru's hurt pride made her angry. However, she regained her composure soon. No, I am in your debt. You made a wise decision. Thank you. The large dark knight named Duran looked towards Azel. Azel gritted his teeth. Kook, this bastard. He is strong. The pressure emitted by his entire body wasn't normal. Even if Azel had been ambushed, he had received enough damage to receive internal wounds. This person was the strongest spirit order practitioner he had encountered since he had woken up in this age. If it was only that woman from the dragon demon race, then I could have handled. Originally, Azel wanted the party to run away in different directions. He planned on running away with Arietta to lure Nibiris away. After putting a sufficient distance away from the enemy's troops, he planned on risking himself by blocking Nibirus as Arietta ran away. He would have done his utmost to delay her, then he would have extracted himself. That was his plan. However, when Duran made his appearance, that plan was scrapped. This is a hopeless situation. Shit. Azel wasn't omniscient and omnipotent. His constant self-assured appearance was a false front he put up to gain a psychological advantage against his enemies. Inside, he was desperately thinking of a way to break away from this situation. He merely acted on a faint hope. Duran was in the front, and Nibirus was in the rear. Will they be able to break away from this situation? If we ran away as we scattered. Hoo hoo. I can hear the gears in your head turning, shrimp. At that moment, Duran let out a cold laugh. Simultaneously, Duran's murderous intent swept over Azel. However, he didn't attack immediately. Duran spoke to Nibirus. I'll keep telling you this, miss. I'm not here, because I was worried about you failing in your mission. What are you saying? Even if you were successfully pulling off the plan, I would have joined in to wrap this up as soon as possible. Or I would have advised you to pull back. You want me to give up on the fishes I have already almost caught? Nibirus asked with an edge in her voice. Duran replied softly. I would recommend that course of action. It would be safer that way. I don't know your reason, but I won't do so. Then I will first respect my lady's wishes, and I will do my best to help you. However, if the event I am worried about comes to pass, then please listen to my request. Duran warned Nibirus that he didn't agree with her but he was also trying to be considerate of her pride. Nibirus was that important to the organization. She held an important status. 
This is why Duran personally treasured Nibiris. After deciding on their course of action, Duran asked a question. What would you like to do with everyone excluding the dragon demon princess, miss? We'll kill them all here. If the report about the dragon demon princess temperament is correct, then wouldn't she have some worth as a hostage? That may be true, but I wouldn't put too much trust in the information. No matter how noble a character she possesses, wouldn't she be filled with guilt if she realizes her current situation? Understood. Then, Duran's figure disappeared. In a blink of an eye, Duran appeared in front of the party. Duran appeared in front of each member of Azul's party. Everyone was surprised, so they reflexively attacked. However, everyone struck empty air. There was only one real body, and it was the one that had appeared in front of Anora. As Azel blocked his attack, sparks flew everywhere. Who? From within Duran's helmet, a sound of admiration leaked out. You were able to realize which one was my real body. You are pretty good for a shirm. Azel had ignored the clone that appeared in front of him, and he had immediately ran in front of Anora. Azel glared as his blade pressed against the other's sword. You attacked a weak child first. Your actions are quite dirty befitting a dark heretical organization. I was being merciful. What? You guys will all die here anyways. She would be tormented if she saw the dirty deeds I was going to inflict on all of you. Wouldn't it be a mercy if I killed her first? Duran wasn't making a sarcastic remark. He meant what he said. Since Nibiris decided to kill them all, he would follow her order. He would also have to kill Anora, so he would rather not draw it out. He was going to kill her before she realized what was happening. He considered it a mercy. Anyways, now that I see your skill, I can understand why you gave the miss so much trouble. However, Duran's figure disappeared. Azel quickly used his instantaneous movement to follow him. Both men disappeared. Sounds of steel clashing and sparks rang out from everywhere. The others couldn't even follow the two men's movements. It was a high-speed battle. Bohr and Giles couldn't pick up their movements at all. Arietta could barely follow the shapes with her eyes. Suddenly, Duran stopped in one place. Azel appeared right in front of him, and Azel brought down his sword. Hoop! Duran held firm like a boulder as he flung Azel's sword strike away. The surface beneath Azel broke, and he was flung away. Duran spoke. You were lacking in power. Even Duran was surprised by Azel's techniques. This age had already forgotten the great techniques of the past yet a young man possessed this level of skill. The only problem was his strength was too low compared to his skills. It wouldn't be a problem if he could overwhelm an opponent with his superior skill. But Duran had learned the secret techniques passed down through the organization. Moreover, you are quite tired from facing the young lady. Duran swung his sword down through empty air. A transparent force suddenly formed following the arc of his swing. The wave of power expanded into a crescent shape, and it shot towards Azul's party. He had merely swung his sword, yet the earth in front of him parted. Moreover, a shock wave that looked as if it would swallow the party whole was formed. At the same moment, Nibiris casted her magic. Lightning poured down towards everyone except Arietta. The wave of power Duran produced with his sword was timed exquisitely with the lightning as they struck. The surface of the ground shook as the sound of explosion rang out. Duran spoke as he saw the, the earth being flung in all direction. You are a very surprising shrimp. I knew my lady wouldn't have any trouble facing someone like the dragon demon princess. I guess it was all him. It is unpleasant, but I acknowledge his skill. The cloud of dust settled and Azul's figure came into view. Coo! Blood was running down Azul's face. The previous attacks was too well timed that Azel couldn't block it without taking damage. It would have been possible to dodge on his own, but he had to protect everyone in this party. This additional condition didn't give him much option. What should I do? He didn't see any way out. Duran was too big of an existence. His skill was at a level where Azel couldn't look down upon it, and his magical energy would overpower Azel. Also, the difference in equipment was too large. Duran had a suit of armor. His sword and equipment were enchanted with strong magic. I'll have to think of this as the worst-case scenario. 
Azel resolved this was the place where his bones would be buried. He couldn't take out everyone. He had no choice, but to decide on a priority list. It was at that moment. Arietta. From afar, a thunder-like sound rang out, and the shout shook the heavens. Chapter 44. Dragon Demon Duke. Part 1. After a moment, everyone stopped moving from surprise. The timing of the voice was too abrupt, and the volume was frightening. In the surrounding, the surprised birds flew up into the air, and a racket was heard when the animals ran away. During all of this, the voice rang out again. Where are you? It felt as if the sound would rupture one's eardrums. Honora fell to the floor as she covered her ears. Even though Giles and Boar used their spirit order to protect their eardrums, their eardrums still hurt. The first one to move was Azel. Azel and Duran crossed blades as sparks flew. Azel had used the brief opening to attack Duran. Princess. Azel accelerated as he called out to Arietta. Every time his heart pulsed an explosive magical energy was produced. His movements increased more and more in speed. This is the decisive moment for victory. The techniques he used after he overflowing his body with magical energy put an extreme burden on his body, and he had already used it once before. Azel's body and energy pulse still stung from pain. However, it was time to lay everything on the line now. This wasn't just about winning. This was for his survival. If he started thinking about the aftermath, he might be killed instead. Azel wouldn't act so foolishly. Kook. Impudent shrimp. Azel had gotten the drop on him. Duran was relentlessly pushed backwards. Azel's movement was so fast and chaotic that Duran didn't have a moment to think. Moreover, behind, Azel kept changing his location using his instantaneous movement. He was using this technique to travel a short distance, and he kept changing the rhythm of his attack. Blood-curdling attacks kept coming towards Duran. Where did a shrimp like him appear from? The essence of spirit order was to control the mind and senses. Azel was putting on a full display of this fact. Azel was threatening Duran with his mental power, and he used his ever-changing movements to confuse the other's senses. Once Azel gained an upper hand Duran didn't find the chance to transition from defense to offense. The light that rends the evil darkness. The white sword Arietta raised into the air let out a blinding light. The straight beam of light lit up the darkness, and it revealed their location. At the same moment, Azel disappeared from in front of Duran. He appeared in front of Nibiris. Nibiris barrier activated automatically, and the barrier blocked Azel's sword strike. Almost simultaneously, Nibiris reflexively shot a beam of light towards Azel. A sound of an explosion rang out, and Duran's scream could be heard. He had been hit by the beam of light shot by Nibiris. Nibiris was dismayed. She was sure she had attacked in an entirely different direction from Duran. Moreover, Duran would have had enough time to deal with such an attack. However, Duran hadn't been able to properly defend against it as he was hit. What did he do? Azel spun his body in front of the surprised Nibiris, then he activated his instantaneous movement. He let out a powerful strike from behind her. Nibiris gave up on attacking, and she focused on blocking the sword strike. Azel clicked his tongue. At the very least, I wanted to take care of you. I guess I was too greedy. Azel retreated backwards without any regret. Nibiris was still having a hard time recovering from the impact. What trick did he use this time? Azel asked the surprised woman. Do you want to continue this? It seems you exceeded your time limit. Nibiris glared at Azel. Azel laughed shamelessly as he let her gaze flow over him. The method Azel had used was quite simple. First, he disappeared from in front of Duran, then he ambushed Nibiris. At the same time, he had made a clone behind Duran. Duran snorted as he planned on ignoring Azel's clone, but the clone wasn't an illusion. It was the clone, that could attack like the real body, which had surprised Nibiris before. The startled Duran turned around to block the attack, and at that moment, Nibiris had shot her beam of light. Azel yelled out in delight inside when he saw this. This was the most favorable outcome that he assumed would happen. When magicians had to quickly cast something that could cause physical damage, they enjoyed casting a light beam or a lightning strike.
If Nibiris had used her lightning strike, then Azel's plan wouldn't have worked. However, Azel had blocked her previous lightning strike with an insulation technique. This was why Nibiris unconsciously chose to use the light beam attack. Moreover, a secondary trap was waiting for her. If I know what attack is coming, then it is quite easy for me to change the trajectory of the attack. In a fight between normal opponents, those with excellent skills could predict which attack would be coming next. Some also had the ability to slightly alter the opponent's attack. For the high-level spirit order practitioners, they could guess what magic was coming by looking at the opponent's magical wave. They could come up with a countermeasure using this method. Azel confirmed Nibiris was about to use her light beam attack, so he used his defensive key to curve the trajectory of the light beam. The timing had to be perfect. Duran had turned his body to block the clone that had shown up behind his back. Duran hadn't expected a mental attack, so Azel pounced. Azel shrugged his shoulders. If you sent a stronger attack then I could have killed that guy. How unfortunate. Duran grinded his teeth. Azel's machination resulted in him received a blow. However, he was a high-level spirit order practitioner, and his armor had excellent defensive capability. He hadn't suffered too much from the attack. You evil bastards. The thunderclap-like voice rang out much closer than before. Duran spoke. Let us retreat, miss. Is it because of him? Yes, the dragon demon duke. I guess the elder's nagging wasn't said for caution's sake. Nibiris bit her lips. The owner of the thunder-like voice was none other than the dragon demon duke. He was Rulan Kingdom's strongest swordsman. His name was Chiron Tarantos. Nibiris queried, how did that man find out about this? The Rulan royal family aren't all idiots. We are out of time, Miss, Kook. I understand. It happened at that moment. You dare lay your hand on my cute princess. Wait for me there. I'll sever your heads. The voice was much closer than a moment before. He was already within 500 meters, and a beam of light rose from him. At the same time, an oppressive magical wave flared out. Oh, dragon sword. Burn the evil darkness. After the shout, he came a 100 meter closer. When he brought down his sword in empty air, he once again closed a distance of 100 meters. He's attacking at this distance. Nibiris was taken aback. He had gotten much closer in a flash, but there was still 300 meters distance separating them. The dragon demon duke wasn't a magician. He was a famed swordsman, yet he was going to attack at this distance. Duran stepped in front of her in dismay. A dark magical energy poured out from his body, and he put all his power into a single strike. At the same time, a hail of light came flying towards them from a couple hundred meters away. It has this much power. Nibiris gasped. This was most definitely similar in nature as the technique used by Arietta's words of power. However, the degree of power couldn't even be compared. The difference was like the gap between an arrow and a ballista. An entire portion of the forest was leveled, and the words of power he shouted burned the darkness away. Ooh ah ah. Bor's body shook at the sight. It was a terrible power. Cold fear gripped him when Bor thought about the attack having just passed over his head. The light dispersed, and a large cloud of dust settled. The bewitched party members coughed. Azel was the only one, who was unperturbed. He clicked his tongued. Chet. They ran away. Bor was surprised at Azel's words. He queried. They aren't dead. I would have already killed them if they could be killed by an attack of that quality. He shouted from afar that he will be attacking. Wouldn't anyone be able to avoid it? No. Normally, people wouldn't be able to dodge. They are capable of dodging such an attack. It had a lot of power behind it, but his movement was too large and slow. He telegraphed his punch, and he attacked after he gave them a warning. Bor shook his head at Azel's retort. Bor couldn't accept Azel's words but he didn't have the energy to argue. Bohr decided to let it go. At that moment, a person showed up between the two of them. He suddenly showed up using instantaneous movement, and he slid across the ground into the cloud of dust. He arrived in such a hurry that he couldn't properly decelerate his speed. He slid into the land he had upturned. He slid for over 20 meters before he came to a stop within the dust cloud. Kook. 
I guess. I wasn't too late. From the cloud of dust, a voice gasping for air was heard. While everyone stared dumbly, Azel bowed his head. Your timing is quite exquisite. Thank you for your help. Who who? I suppose so. It seems. You were speaking some impudent words. Everyone thought the same thing as they listened to his words. Why don't you either catch your breath or talk in a leisurely manner? He was gasping as if he was about to expire, yet he got out all the words he wanted to say. He even tried to act like nothing was wrong, but everyone pitied his overly transparent attempt. Azel spoke. This is this and that is that. Well, you did run across a vast distance, so of course you would be in a rush. Who, finally, after catching his breath, the person stood up from inside the cloud of dust. The distance didn't seem too large on the map, so I thought I would be here in a short amount of time. However, I had to cross a mountain and a lake. It was quite difficult. It felt as if I was going to die. It has been a long while since I've gotten a good workout like this. Everyone in the party except Azel and Arietta flinched when they saw him. The reason being the man wasn't human. He was a young man of the dragon demon race with long black hair. Azel gave his respect to this person. It is an honor to meet you, dragon demon duke. The dragon demon duke was named Chiron Tarantos. He was called the living legend of the Rulan kingdom. When there weren't any battles, he only appeared during the official meetings. This is why not a lot of people knew what he looked like. Moreover, he had been semi-retired in recent years, so no one knew about his youthful appearance. This was why Giles and Bor was shocked when they saw him. Chiron was over 100 years old, but he looked to be in his MID-20s. Basically, he looked to be of similar age as Bor and Azel. Still, as a being from the dragon demon race, he had characteristics that was clearly different from humans, but that was it. Chiron was looked like a young man with long black hair. He had dark blue eyes that gave him a cool impression, and his ears were noticeably longer than Arietta's ears. On top of his ears, there were two black horns. It looked similar to a bull's horns, and it made him look strong and daunting. Chapter 45, Dragon Demon Duke. Part 2. After catching her breath, Arietta gave her greetings. Sensei. Oh, Arietta. I'm glad you are fine. The delighted Chiron turned angry when he saw the state Arietta was in. She didn't have any deep wounds, but Arietta had been totally wrecked by Niberus. These bastards dare to wound the precious body of Arietta, who I reared with the utmost care and affection. No. Please tell the truth. You didn't raise me with utmost care and affection. Arietta let out a sigh as she retorted. Chiron acted like the dull father of a daughter, but he was like a demon when he instructed Arietta. Chiron grumbled. It was all done for your sake. No matter how precious the child is one has to, to sever one's affection when teaching martial arts. Anyways, I, Chiron looked around his surrounding. He mumbled as he looked at the point where the strike he let out had landed. If I had a single more breath to spare, then I would have hit them for sure. How regretful. Chiron wasn't an idiot. He hadn't executed such an attack, so the enemy could deal with it. He hadn't told the party, but he had ran across a distance of 50 kilometers once Niberus' curtain of darkness enclosed Arietta's party. He had crossed mountains and lakes to run in a straight line towards this location. He had used all of his strength. His breath had run out, and he had been filled with worry about Arietta. He wasn't in a situation where he could carefully calculate his actions. Azel was oblivious to these facts, but he was still impressed with Chiron. It's pretty amazing he was able to pull off an attack of such caliber when he was out of breath. Chiron had exposed his existence when he let out a thundering yell. It was done, so he could find Arietta. It also drew the attention of the enemies towards him. When the distance narrowed, he intentionally let out a strong attack that could be noticed by the enemy. He was trying to push the enemies into backing off immediately. The skill he showed to achieve his goal was awe-inspiring. He had let out his attack from 300 meters away, but it wasn't as if he used his power without any control. When the attack was first shot out, it was like a thin line of thread. Magic had been compressed to its highest density, and as it flew closer to the enemy, 
it exploded into hail of light. To hit his enemy across a vast distance, he had let out a precisely controlled attack that almost lost no magic until it exploded. Moreover, the timing had been so exquisite that the explosion was limited to targeting only Niberus and Duran. If he was born during the Dragon Demon Wars, he could have made a name for himself. Chiron's strike left a deep impression on Azel. Moreover, those swords. Azel looked at the swords on Chiron's waist. He had a pair of black sword, and it was shaped like Arietta's sword. There was a gradual curve to the blades. It's emitting dragon demon magic. This was the reason why Azel had become interested. To the extent of Azel's knowledge, there were a lot of weapons with magic imbued within it. However, the only weapon that can emit dragon demon magic was a weapon called Dragon Maki. Chiron's sword wasn't a dragon Maki yet it was emitting dragon demon magic. Chiron clicked his tongue. Chet. It would have been great if you carried around at least one healer in your party. Since time is of the essence, you should apply this to your wounds. No scars will form. He took out a wooden bottle from inside his shirt, and he passed it to her. It was a healing medicine made by the alchemists. Arietta queried as she received it. So, sensei. Him, I'm very thankful for your timely help, but... How did you know I was here? It seemed everyone was curious, so their gazes focused on him. Chiron replied, The dragon demon queen asked me to find you. My mother did. Didn't you send word that you were attacked by a seditious group of people when you went to meet the western border guards? Yes, the dragon demon queen asked me to go check up on you, since you took a minimal number of escorts. Is that really all there is to it? As if Arietta couldn't accept his answer, she asked again. He said he came at the request of the Dragon Demon Queen, since she was worried. It seemed like a likely story on the surface, but Arietta knew the reason he gave was ridiculous. Of course, the Dragon Demon Queen could ask Chiron. However, Chiron would never leave his territory just because of a request made by the Dragon Demon Queen. If Chiron was someone who would cross vast distance, because he was worried about his pupil, then the throne would make numerous requests for his aid. The throne would use him with glee. Chiron smiled. I knew my pupil isn't stupid. Even if I had been stupid, I could guess what Sensei would do since I know you so well. Yes, as you probably guessed, I don't move unless there is a special reason. The Dragon Demon King's followers got involved this time. Moreover, they were powerful ones. Chiron hadn't known the name of the organization called Dragon's Shadow. Still, he had recognized they were Dragon Demon King's followers, and the fact that they were powerful fighter capable of posing a danger to Arietta. This made them worthy of his attention. What does this all mean? Unfortunately, I'm not in a position where I'm able to tell you. I will tell you one thing. I was motivated to move, because of the Dragon Demon King's followers. But, Arietta wanted to ask more questions, but she swallowed it when she saw Chiron's eyes. Her stern sensei's expression said he wouldn't allow any further questions on the subject. Instead, she asked a question regarding a different topic. How did you know I was in danger? The signal from you was severed. The throne treated the dragon demon princess as a precious commodity. This was why a special magic was designed to always locate where the dragon demon princess was at all times and it also showed if she was still alive. Chiron had borrowed a tool connected to this magic. Then the signal showing where Arietta was located was suddenly cut off. Chiron determined Arietta was in a life-threatening situation, so he came running here with all his might. Arietta spoke. Ah, that time. Still, it seemed the curtain of darkness casted by Niberus was the main reason why Chiron had come here. Niberus had been thorough in hiding her actions with the Curtain of Darkness. She probably would have never imagined her action had basically invited Chiron to her. Chiron spoke. If all your questions have been answered, then let's leave this place. This place is unsuitable for a camp. The party followed his words. The party decided to camp a fair distance away from their original location. It was dark, so they weren't able to travel very far. We have a lot of things to buy at the next town. Azel mumbled as he looked over the campfire. In the panic of battle, the party's horses had all been killed. 
Magic had exploded everywhere, and in the chaos, they had lost most of their belongings. Still, they had enough of their own possessions to camp one night in the outdoors. Originally, Azel had asked for the most difficult time to be on watch, but everyone insisted he take the first watch. Then everyone quickly went to sleep. Maybe it was the relief one felt after escaping from a near-death experience, but no one in the party could resist the fatigue that had washed over them when the tension melted away. Well, I'm not in a state where I can refrain from giving in to my tiredness. Azel was so tired that he wanted to immediately close his eyes and sleep. He used spirit order to force himself not to sleep. I have to train this damn body faster. Azel looked at his arms as he let out a sigh. In terms of being physically exhausted, he was much more tired than Giles or Bor. His body was too weak. His unconventional use of magical energy was allowing him to stay afloat. However, he felt the weakness of his body more acutely than his lack of magic. Why are you sighing? He heard a laid-back voice from between the party members. Azel replied without showing any signs of being surprised. You are using a very cumbersome method. Chiron was the one who had initiated the conversation. Chiron looked like he was sleeping, but he was faking it. Azel had been the only one, who hadn't been deceived. Your senses are quite good. It is. Azel shrugged his shoulders. It was a curious sight. Both of them hadn't decreased the volume of their voice, but no one woke up from their sleep. The situation didn't make any sense since everyone except Anora possessed very developed senses. The reason being Azel and Chiron was using a special technique. The technique allowed only one's opponent to hear one's voice. Chiron got up and he walked towards Azel. He wore armor, but it was as if a cat was walking. He didn't make any noise. When Chiron sat down in front of the campfire, he asked Azel a question. Why are you using such a cumbersome method? Azel knew Chiron had wanted to talk with him. However, he didn't know why Chiron had pretended to go to sleep. He had waited for everyone to fall asleep before he made his move. Chiron spoke. You aren't surprised at all. If something happens, I just accept what's happening then I roll with it. That's a good attitude to have. I taught that child to think like that too. You mean the princess? Yes. To answer your previous question. I wanted to speak to you while that child wasn't listening in. Him. He wanted to avoid Arietta's attention more than the others. He basically didn't want her to know he had shared a conversation with Azel. What's the reason? Is there a reason why Arietta shouldn't know about this conversation? He didn't know about the inner intrigues of the royal family. Sir Azel had a hard time understanding Chiron's behavior. Chiron asked a question. From your perspective, what do you think about Arietta? What's the meaning behind your question? Do you perhaps think I'm asking you to judge her appearance? I don't even need to listen you to answer such a question. She is a woman of matchless beauty. She is the best in this kingdom. No, she is the best in this continent. Are you perhaps trying to deny this fact? No, it isn't like. The princess is very beautiful. Isn't she? It isn't worth it to question such a fact. I'm asking about the child as a warrior. It seems you have participated in numerous battles so please give me your honest assessment. You want me to speak the truth? Yes. Don't sugarcoat it. Well, if you want to suck up to me, it is your own choice. However, you won't get far with me by doing that. Her potential is outstanding, and she displays great skill. She is much better than most her age. It was an honest assessment. If he considered her young age, Arietta showed an amazing level of achievement physically and mentally. It is as if, Chiron grinned. You are making an assessment as if you are looking down from a high place. Does this mean you are so skilled that you are able to assess Arietta in such way? Azel acknowledged he'd been had this time. Chiron had used Arietta as a topic of conversation to gain an insight into Azel. No matter how well Azel had hid his skill, his natural assessment of someone else revealed the standard he was assessing others by. Of course, there are those who pretended to be strong to cut down others, but Azel didn't show such an attitude when he was talking about Arietta. His assessment had been unaffected. Chapter 46, Dragon Demon Duke. Part 3. Azel asked a question. Didn't you already hear about me from the princess? I did. 
This is the first time I've seen the child be so chatty. This must mean you must have left a big impression on her. Arietta, in Chiron's memory, was a girl of few words. Moreover, she hadn't shown much interest in anyone except her family. Arietta, who was such a girl, showed a surprising amount of interest towards Azel. She excitedly spoke about Azel like a regular girl her age. From Chiron's perspective, it was a really weird experience. Chiron spoke. Arietta is a very good judge of character. I've taught her how to assess others, while excluding her feelings. However, when I hear about you from her, she is telling me some stories that are hard to believe. What do you mean? For example, the part where you have partial amnesia. Suddenly, he felt a strong overpowering feeling coming from Chiron. If he was a normal person, he probably would have stopped breathing. It wouldn't be strange if a normal person passed out from the pressure. The scary thing was the overpowering feeling was only focused on Azel. Azel admired him, when he realized Chiron wasn't affect anything else in his surrounding. He's good. Azel had been very disappointed after he woke up in this age. He hadn't met anyone, who had properly cultivated one's ability through actual battles. The exceptions were his enemies, Nibirus and Duran. Nibirus had the skill to back up her claim as a high-rank magician, and Duran was a properly trained spirit order practitioner. Chiron also presented himself to Azel as being comparable to Nibirus and Duran. He possessed strong dragon demon magic, but he also used high-level techniques as if it was nothing. Chiron was surprised more than Azel. What kind of a person is this bastard? He had poured out enough pressure to kill a human yet Azel didn't respond at all. It wasn't as if Azel was countering his pressure. It was as if the pressure didn't exist at all, and Azel was letting it all flow past him. Chiron was over 100 years old, but he had never seen someone respond to his pressure this way. Still, this one move revealed Azel possessed enough skill, and it made Chiron interested in him. Azel replied, Didn't you hear an ample amount of explanation from Arietta? I heard it. So why are you being so suspicious of me? No matter how I see it you are hiding too many things. Chiron had spoken to Arietta. He had also listened to Giles, Bohr and Honora about Azel. He heard all that had happened since Azel had been discovered inside the Balan forest. The more Chiron listened to the story he realized he knew nothing about him. He wasn't suspicious as to whether Azel was an enemy. Azel's attitude up until now gave a clear-cut answer. Chiron was worried since he couldn't understand Azel's true character. Azel asked a question. What do you think I'm trying to hide? A lot of things. First, it's your dragon demon magic. When Arietta first saw Azel, she had wondered why a human had the scent of dragon demon magic. Moreover, the scent of the dragon demon magic given off by Azel was much stronger than before. Chiron was able to detect it since he was sensitive to the smell. Moreover, I heard about the story detailing the dragon slayer's ritual. Yes, I'll just ask you a point-blank question. Did you kill the dragon? Azel didn't immediately answer the question as he kept his silence. After glaring at Azel for a moment, Chiron continued speaking. I've fought with dragons before. I've fought three of them. It was very rare for a dragon to show up in human territories. When they did show up, it mostly led to catastrophes. When dragons and humans fought, humans had always come out victorious. However, humans had to insert a massive amount of troops. It was a hollow victory that required massive sacrifice and damage to the troops. Chiron had the ability to contain such a situation. When the calamity called a dragon appeared, Chiron gladly stepped forward to minimize the damage. If I see through the prism of my experience, I find it hard to believe you killed a dragon. He acknowledged Azel possessed superb techniques as a spirit order practitioner. However, one cannot kill a dragon with just techniques. Even if an old man could master a technique to defeat a healthy young man, could he destroy a castle wall with it? Azel queried. Did you hear my explanation regarding that incident? You said another dragon appeared to kill the dragon. Isn't that what you said? Yes. Since the dragon is dead, that must be the most compelling answer. It's impossible for you to have killed the dragon. Therefore, you drew the attention of the dragon then you desperately ran away. 
Then you entered into a different dragon's territory, and the dragons started to fight. Azel thought along the same line, so he had given such an excuse. The story was a bit too fantastic, so it was a dubious explanation. However, who could argue with the result of what had happened? It wasn't as if Azel was making up a story to distinguish himself. What can someone say when the story entailed a dragon killing another dragon? Chiron spoke. I've heard about the dragon slayer's ritual from somewhere before. Is that so? I just didn't know what it was. No one in my acquaintances know what it truly means. There aren't any decent records left. Whenever I saw it mentioned, it was. Someone had initiated the dragon slayer's ritual. That was the extent of what was recorded in the records. I can only guess the ritual entails killing a dragon because it says so in the name. Azel listened carefully to Chiron's words. He was giving out precious information. He had killed dragons before yet he doesn't know about the dragon slayer's ritual. He isn't even human. He is a dragon demon with over 100 years under his belt yet. Him. From which point in time did the chain of knowledge break? Now Azel could surmise the severance of knowledge couldn't simply be explained by a historical event. From the conversation he had with Niberus, he could surmise the dragon demon king's worshippers had intentionally engineered such a result. Chiron continued to speak. Yet you knew all about it. Yes. Moreover, the dragon's shadow's female magician, Niberus, made a big deal about you knowing this fact. She did. This is why I'm suspicious of a possibility. What possibility? The possibility that you might have a hidden backer. A backer? Azel was a bit taken aback, since he hadn't thought Chiron would come up with such an explanation. Chiron spoke. What if there is a hidden backer powerful enough to slay the dragon? What if this was all planned out by him, and he sent you to Arietta? Do you like conspiracy theories? I don't like it. However, akin to the dragon demon king's worshippers, there are hidden evil forces, who try to influence the world from the darkness. Chiron didn't suspect Azel being a pawn of the dragon's shadow. The main reassowing being Chiron already suspected the reason behind the dragon's shadow attempted kidnapping of Arietta. If he was right about the reason behind the abduction, Azel had no reason to protect her. He would have struck from behind early on. Still, it doesn't guarantee you aren't part of some dangerous plot. You might be affiliated with another organization of dragon demon king worshippers, who is competing against the dragon's shadow. Him. How should I say this? Azel scratched his head. If you think about everyone in those terms, then you should be suspicious of every person in the world. Do you think you are in the same category as everyone else? If you insist there are hidden hands that work without the notice of the entire world, I agree it does make me look a little bit more suspicious. However, no matter how I try I won't be able to shed your suspicions. Even if I die in the process of protecting the princess, I wouldn't be able to shed the suspicion on me. I might be treated as someone who died by mistake while trying to hatch a plot. It's been a while since someone had the guts to make sarcastic remarks in front of me. I guess you prefer men, who empty their head, and agree with everything the duke says. Men who would agree with you even if you said the sun rises from the west. Both of them were laughing, but the atmosphere worsened. The pressure emitted by Chiron was kicked up a notch. However, Azel took it nonchalantly, and he started baiting Chiron. It was as if Azel was telling Chiron to try hitting him once if Chiron's temper got the better of him. Chiron was the first one to back off. He withdrew his pressure, then he relaxed his expression. Well, all right. My words were a little harsh. I'll acknowledge that. That was unexpected. Him. I thought you would at least hit me once as a test. Then you would send a counter, while saying, I got you, you bastard. You purposefully showed a hole in your defense. You also have a very twisted personality. It isn't something I want to hear from you. I've heard from Princess that you are famous for having a twisted personality. You are arrogant. You are a pup who doesn't know how scary the world is. Chiron snorted. He had a youthful appearance, but Chiron naturally acted like an old man. It wasn't just because he was over 100 years old. He held a position that was respected by everyone. Suddenly, Chiron put on a serious expression. Just know this. 
I'm currently in a position where I have to consider every absurd conspiracy theories as if it might happen in reality. The actions of the Dragon Demon King's followers can't be understood by conventional means, since they are lunatics. Azel now knew why Chiron insisted on hiding their conversation from Arietta. He didn't want to force his suspicions on her. After a brief silence, Chiron spoke. I hope you can share one thing with me. Tell me about the Dragon Slayer's ritual. Didn't you already hear about it from the princess? A human and a dragon fights one on one to the death. Then the winner takes something from the defeated side. The human gets the dragon's strength, and the dragon gets the human's wisdom. Correct. How does that make any sense? Chiron couldn't accept it. Each region had rituals with some spiritual meaning behind it. They were a product of the region's environment and history. Such cultural rituals gained significance between the gap in knowledge within society. It was quite absurd to Chiron that there existed a ritual between the humans and dragons. It would have made sense if a magician and a specific dragon performed the ritual after making a contract. However, this was a shared ritual where an unknown number of humans and unknown number of dragons can participate in it unconditionally. How could such a pact exist? Azel stroked his chin. Him. If I give you an explanation regarding the topic, then what will you give me in return? You dare ask for something back when you are just answering my question. I trust you are a fair person, since you are princess teacher. There is worth to knowledge. Isn't that so? Chiron furrowed his brows as he let out a sound of frustration at Azel's words. Chapter 47. Dragon Sword Duke. Part 4. It seemed the lesson I taught my student is grabbing at my ankles. All right, what do you want as a compensation for the knowledge? You don't have a personality where you would be tempted by materialistic goods. Please tell me about your swords. Azel pointed at the pair of swords mounted around Chiron's waist. Chiron put on a peculiar expression. Are you sure you are fine with just that? Yes. You are taking a loss on this deal. I'll accept it in any case. You can't back out now. Why? After a brief investigation, you would have been able to find out this information. Compared to what you are about to tell me, the price is very cheap. Chiron was nicknamed the Dragon Sword Duke, because of the dual swords he used. Those swords were too famous, so there weren't any secrets that wasn't known to the public. Azel let out a bitter laugh. I don't care. Then I'll tell you about it. The swords are dragon swords. Dragon sword. From one to ten, the ingredients were all extracted from a dragon's corpse. Moreover, these are magical swords forged with my blood. That is why I can feel dragon demon magic from them. Yes. Is that why you were interested in them? Yes. I've never seen a sword tinged with dragon demon magic. Of course. There are only few in existence on this world. It is something I reconstructed after I saw the old records. The old records. It was a record about the dragon demon war. What? Azel was confused. Weapons like the dragon swords didn't exist in his era. Chiron spoke. There weren't any detailed descriptions, but I was able to find a passage saying the heroes of that age used weapons emitting dragon demon magic to fight against the dragon demon king's forces. However, I didn't know what those weapons were made out of, or how to make them. For years, I gathered damaged records and through endless research, I found a story saying a dragon had to be killed to make the weapon. This was why I guessed Dragon Slayer's ritual was part of the process. This was why Chiron killed a dragon with helpers. They used the corpse to research a way they could make weapons with dragon demon magic imbued within it. These two dragon swords were the result of over 30 years of research. Azel was speechless. This basically means they completely forgot about the Dragon Slayer's ritual and the Dragon Maki. At the time of the Dragon Demon War, Azel wasn't the only user of the Dragon Maki. If he included those killed in the war, there were 20 of them. Yet, all the records about them and the Dragon Maki disappeared. Even if the fall of the Nadic Empire caused confusion, and the Great Darkness was present, everything about this was unnatural. His suspicion deepened as he suspected the Dragon Demon King's worshippers secretly severed the knowledge on this subject. Anyways, they tried to duplicate the Dragon Maki using such a method. Impressive. If Carlos had been alive, 
Azel wanted to hear his opinion on this subject. At the time, Carlos thought about mass producing large and beautiful magical energy, but he had never thought about reproducing the quick flames of the dragon Maki. This attempt at replicating Dragon Maki came at an era when all the knowledge about the Dragon Maki had been severed. Chiron spoke. Now it's your turn. Do you know the goal of the mages to seek for a way to ultimately save mankind? I know about it. The great flood of the world raked across this world, and it forever left a wound on this world. It was what every magician wanted. They wanted to change the world with their own magic. This wasn't a figure of speech. The magicians genuinely believed they could change the world through magic. They weren't trying to use magic to change how a person thinks or acts. They wanted to change the fundamental laws of the world. Azel spoke. You like speaking in poetic expressions. My magician friends are all full of pretentiousness. It's almost pathological. If one was a talented magician, one must act with bluster to meet the expectation of the masses. This is a tradition passed down by the Archmage Carlos. Him, what's wrong? Why is your expression like that? No, it's nothing. For a moment, he almost let out a choking sound. Carlos had always spoke that way when he was bragging about himself. No way. Everything about the Dragon Slayer's ritual and Dragon Maki was forgotten yet such words from Carlos survived. Moreover, it had turned into a tradition. It really was a terrible thing. Azel spoke as his body shuddered. The magicians sincerely believe such works are possible. Moreover, the Dragon Slayer's ritual is the proof. Him, since time immemorial, a great magician made a deal that was both beneficial to the humans and the dragons. Humans thirsted for strength, and the dragons thirsted for wisdom. The ritual puts what both sides wants on the line. It was a promise made between the two races. At the same time, it was made into a law of this world. Unlike the humans, dragons didn't pass down their knowledge. However, all the dragons including the newly born dragons knew about the dragon slayer's ritual. Chiron's eyes opened as if he couldn't believe what he had just heard. What kind of nonsensical story is that? Anyways, this is the only answer I can give to the question posed by you. Him. Chiron frowned. It sounded like a fantastical delusion but he didn't have any evidence to dispute what he had been told. Azel referenced the Dragon Slayer's ritual in his fight against the Earth Dragon to get its attention, and the Dragon Demon King's worshippers obsessed over this fact. Chiron asked a question. So let's say anyone could go look for a dragon, and they initiate the Dragon Slayer's ritual. Do you mean to say the dragon's power could be obtained by winning a one-on-one -on -one battle to the death? Not everyone could do it. It is only possible for humans. Ah, it is possible for the dragon demons to do it. They barely qualify for the requirement needed for the contract. Basically, it's impossible for me to test it out. Yes. Him. It's hard to believe that story. Chiron grumbled, but he didn't ask any more questions. After thinking for a brief moment, Chiron stood up. Let's end this here today. Are you sure that's all for today? Yes. Chiron didn't speak any further and he returned to lie down in his beddings. Then he immediately fell asleep. Azel looked at him for a brief moment before he turned his gaze towards the campfire as he started to think. The dragon slayer's ritual. He suddenly thought about the conversation he had in the past. He had a dream. He acknowledged it happened far from the current world. It was a memory from the distant past. Ah, it was right around this time. As a high-level spirit order practitioner, he could guide the intent of his dreams. He could also change the content of his dreams. During the process of gaining control over his mind, he had learned a technique where he could create a dream using a specific memory. Azel used this technique to recreate a snippet of his past as a dream. I'll change the world someday. He had a friend who always said those words. If someone else had said it, he would have laughed it off after calling the person out as being immature. However, this was Carlos. It wasn't a dream of an immature boy, who was ignorant of reality. Azel acknowledged the dreams of those with the ability to achieve it. This was why Azel asked the question, How do you want to change it? Him. I haven't come up with a concrete idea yet. 
What I can do and what I want to do isn't matching up yet. What if we could prevent those of the dragon demon race from being born into this world? If that was possible, then this damn war would be over. However, the birth of the dragon demon race itself was caused by magic changing the world. I'm not sure it'll be possible to reverse that change. Still, it is something worth researching about. The magicians considered the birth of the dragon demon race to be the result of a mighty magic. It was the very first magic that made an indelible imprint on this world. Moreover, everyone believed the dragon demon king Atain was the founder of mages. Azel snorted. Don't take my words too seriously. How would it be possible to change the entire race into being sterile? Is that how you see it? It seems I have to throw away my opinion that you are a dumb swordsman. It seems you are quite extraordinary. Carlos was astonished. Then he spoke as if suddenly thought of something. Still, it might be possible using another method. Like the dragon slayer's ritual, we might be able to impose a contract between humans and the dragon demon race. The dragon slayer's ritual. I don't know what that particular mage was thinking when he made that up. You, who have benefited the most from the dragon slayer's ritual, shouldn't speak of it in those terms. The fact that I benefited from the ritual is a separate issue. Still, what kind of a person thought up a ritual where a human has to fight against a dragon one-on-one? -on -one? Did he think it was fair fight? The mage was too much of a romantic. I think he believed good would always triumph over everything. What? Azel looked at Carlos as if he had heard something outrageous. Carlos let out a bitter laugh. I know it sounds strange. However, I really think that was his mindset. The mage was blinded by his romanticized ideals. What makes you say that? The era when the dragon slayer's ritual was formed was much more barbaric. Moreover, the relationship between the humans and dragons were completely different. The dragons used to live in places where humanity had never trodden. It was rare for them to show themselves to the world. However, Carlos had researched the old records. He found out that the dragons were entirely different being before the dragon slayer's ritual. In the past, the dragon had no natural enemies, so they were the tyrants of nature. They didn't hesitate to expand their territories, and any humans in their path was ruthlessly killed. Moreover, at the time, humans had no way of stopping the dragons. Through the dragon slayer's ritual, the dragons learned humans were beings worthy of respect. Moreover, when there were problems at the time, people didn't think through it logically like today. That bastard killed a member of your family. Then you have the right to strike him down with a rock. You have a problem. Then the person, who wins in the fight, was in the right. The world worked in such a way. It doesn't sound too different from the current times. Even in Azul's era, the monarchs all insisted they were in the right. If one said the other was wrong, then war would be waged. The knights insulted each other as battle raged. Carlos laughed bitterly. It was way worse back then. At least, the losing side doesn't lose their women to be raped anymore. In the past, it didn't matter if they were children or adult. People have enough rights where such acts don't happen anymore. Somewhere in this world, people still live that way. In that era, that way of life was the norm. They didn't even have a common language where the two races to communicate with each other, yet they were able to come up with a ritual that involved a one-on-one -on -one battle. It changed the relationship between the two races dramatically. If both sides didn't have good intent in their heart, it would have been impossible to achieve such a feat. So you are saying it was a very barbaric era, and the ritual was in line with the common sense of that time. Yes, they thought and acted in an entirely different way from our era. I think your explanation is extremely romanticized. Well, whatever. Azel needed a lot of power to win against his enemies in the Dragon Demon War. This was why he challenged dragons to take their powers. He washed blood with blood as he stole the dragon's power. From his perspective, he couldn't agree with Carlos' explanation. Someday I will change the world. Carlos spoke as he looked into the distance. I want to turn the bad part into good. After this damn war ends, I want to change the world for somebody. You should drop that line as you look profoundly into your lover. Azel grumbled. Chapter 48 Guardian Shadows. Part 1. Nibiris was inside the darkness, 
lost in her feeling of humiliation. I never expected this to turn out like this. A voice flew in from a distance location. We suffered a great loss. Now that it has turned out like this, we have to give up on the dragon demon princess. We have no choice, since the dragon sword duke has appeared. Now that the guardian shadows are on the move, we can't provoke them any longer. We needed to quickly kidnap the dragon demon princess before this happens. At the very least, we are fortunate, since we didn't lose Niberus. Sir Duran, I express my respects to you for your wise decision. It was nothing. Duran, who was in the same room as Niberus, responded with humility. He was originally on a different mission inside the Rulan Kingdom. However, when he received the information about the Dragon Sword Duke leaving his territory to head towards the Dragon Demon Princess, he moved quickly. If he had delayed his travels even by a little bit, he would have been late. Niberus. Yes. Do not be devastated by this. This was within the parameter of our predictions. It isn't as if we didn't gain anything from this. What did you just say? Niberus eyebrows rose. The higher-ups sent her out even though they had anticipated that she might fail. Our foundation within the Rulan Kingdom is especially frail. This is why we don't have much information regarding what goes on inside the kingdom. This is why he didn't know about the magic placed on the dragon demon princess. In the first place, you were sent on a gambit with a low probability. The fact that you came back without injury proves that you were outstanding. Niberus pride was strong, and she had wanted to prove her skill by kidnapping the dragon demon princess. She hadn't considered that this task would be hard. However, she was one of the younger members of the organizations. Unlike her, the hidden elders knew how scary the world could be. The plan had been to kidnap a member of the royal family in secret. They had to prevent their hidden, secret organization from being exposed to the world at all costs. Even with perfect preparations, this mission wasn't considered to be a given. They had gone forward with minimal information, so that the outcome shouldn't have surprised them. First, pull back from the Rulan Kingdom with Duran. But, since we've been exposed to the Dragon Sword Duke, the Rulan Kingdom's guardian shadows will be on the move. You still don't know how scary they could be. This mission didn't simply end without consequences when they had failed to kidnap the dragon demon princess. Now, the enemy knew the information the organization had been desperately trying to keep a secret. It was the fact that they had powerful pieces like Niberus and Duran within their organization. This information was now known to the enemies. We'll give you an opportunity to make up for this business at a later date. Pull back for now. Him. Niberus was dissatisfied but the elder's attitude was too resolute. She couldn't be stubborn. She bit her lips. Who cares about the dragon sword duke? Currently, she regretted immediately running away in surprise when then the dragon sword duke appeared. If she had joined powers with Duran, she thought that they could have easily suppressed him. We'll leave everything to you, Sir Duran. Understood. After hearing Duran's answer, the elder's voices became more distant. When the silence settled into the darkness, Duran spoke to Niberus. Miss, I understand your feeling. What do you understand? You can't accept the reason why we have to work to this extent to ensure our safety. However, you have to understand there is a reason why we are so afraid. The Guardian Shadows are a legitimately scary existence. If we didn't didn't have any reasons to fear them, we would have already conquered the world. In truth, they had almost succeeded once before. They actively imposed their influence on the entire continent as they revised the continent's history. Their goal had been to wipe out all the knowledge that could be passed on. We have to finish our preparation for the day our king returns. Then the world will be afraid of us. Duran thought about the past as he stroked his face. Inside the darkness, his hand touched his wrinkled face and he felt the permanent scars that couldn't be erased. It had been etched onto him like brands. After meeting up with Chiron, they spent a single night inside the forest. Then, the party moved at a slow pace. The party decided they didn't need to be worried about the enemies attacking them. They arrived at a country village after crossing the mountain. They purchased a sickly horse and a run-down carriage there. It was very questionable to call it a carriage,
but they were able to reach the busiest city in the vicinity because of it. I guess I have to say goodbye to this carriage. Azel spoke as he walked alongside the carriage. The party had acquired the carriage for Anora. If they had to travel matching Anora's foot speed, it would have taken them two to four additional days to get here. While they were coming here, Chiron's attitude took Azel by surprise. He is a duke yet he is very easy going. He had traveled with them until this point, but the duke didn't show any signs of discontent. Everyone was uncomfortable around him as they kept their eyes on Chiron. However, he didn't show any signs of discontent at the shabby carriage or the slow travel speed. Arietta laughed when Azel brought up this point. My teacher still goes into the mountain occasionally to live like an uncivilized person when he feels like it. He wouldn't show any displeasure at such a minor setback. Even though he is a duke, he said he liked. He could turn his surrounding inside out since he was able to use his strength in earnest. That is why I had to learn how to live out in the wild from time to time. We lived in a very impoverished state when we were in the mountains. I understand now. He was the one responsible for giving such lessons to Arietta. It shouldn't have surprised Azel that the duke acted in an informal manner. It was incongruous with his station. The party checked into an inn that geared towards serving nobles. Azel asked Arietta a question. Don't we have to visit the lord here? There is no lord in this territory. What? Count Renning is working from the palace, so one of his relative is working here as a proxy. If we go to him, we'll be treated well. However, it would be annoying and our schedule would be further delayed. Azel looked towards Chiron but it seemed he was of the same mind as Arietta. The teacher and the student didn't want a raucous reception, even though they were both of very high stations. They were very similar in the fact that they hated those kinds of events. Honora spoke to Azel. Sir Azel, could you accompany me on my errand? Ha! Huh, where are you going? I have to buy various items, and I'm going to see if we can hire a healer. Ah, you want me as a mule? Wouldn't it better if you thought of it as guarding me? In the end, I'll probably have to carry everything. You want to take only me? Yes. Why? What about Sir Bore and Sir Giles? Him. That is. Honora laughed as if she was put in an awkward situation. They both do not know about how the world works. Also, problem might arise if the identity of the princess and the duke was spread. It really was a cold assessment. However, Azel could only agree with her. Bohr and Giles gave off signs of being a noble's sheltered son. This had been very obvious with Bohr, but Azel thought Giles was also a bit ignorant of the world. Nothing good could come out of them accidentally letting something slip to a civilian. Him, he exited the inn with Honora and suddenly felt someone's gaze on him. He subtly turned his head, but he didn't see anyone. These bastards are very talented in hiding themselves. Maybe they are dragon demon king worshippers. Even if he couldn't see anyone, Azel wasn't fooled. He was sure someone was watching him. It wasn't just one person. There were several of them. At a glance, he couldn't locate them. It meant they were very adept at hiding themselves. Him. Even if they are dragon demon king worshippers, they aren't a problem since the dragon sword duke is with Arietta. Azel and Honora were the ones in trouble. If they ran into a problem, he had to make sure Honora would be unhurt. Azel walked as these thoughts ran through his head when Honora asked him a question. What are you thinking about? Him, I'm not really thinking about anything. Why, you are looking at the people with amazement in your eyes. Did I really do that? Azel was confused. Did his eyes unconsciously give something away? It was understandable. Two hundred years had passed since his era. He couldn't help but marvel at the sight of the city. It looked similar from before, but there were also a lot of unfamiliar sights. He had been very busy recently, but Azel had been thrown into this world less than one month ago. He tried to accept and adapt to his situation, but at times, he couldn't help but become overwhelmed by what he felt. Honora spoke. Oh ye, Sir Azel. There is something I want to tell you. What is it? Thank you. You protected the princess and I moreover. Thank you for taking care of me at night. I have no idea what you are talking about. Azel feigned ignorance, which caused Honora to puff up her cheeks. I know all about it. What exactly do you know about? 
The content of my dreams were blatantly changed. Did you think I wouldn't notice? It's all Sir Azel's doing. After being ambushed by Niberus, Honora had been gripped by nightmares. No matter how brave she was, Honora was still a young girl. She couldn't stay composed after experiencing such an event. However, she was tormented by her nightmares for only a moment. From a certain point in time, her nightmares disappeared, and it was replaced with peaceful memories of her past. She saw the plains of her homeland she loved, and she remembered the fun times she had playing there. No matter how she saw it, she couldn't help but notice that someone had manipulated her dreams. She didn't know about spirit order or magic, but there was something Honora was sure of. Azel spoke. I'm not a magician, so how could I manipulate someone else's dream? You can do it. Hey, I can't, I already know you can do it. I felt it. It was Sir Azel. Him, you felt it. Every person has a different feel to them. I felt your signature, Sir Azel. Azel was a bit surprised as he looked at Honora. She was right. Azel had manipulated her dreams. Since he was intervening with a normal person's mind, he hadn't been cautious. He hadn't been careful to change the content of the dream within its natural flow. Instead he had forcefully guided her dreams towards comforting memories. He also didn't erase the scent of his energy within the subconsciousness of her sleeping mind. Still, it was surprising for a normal person like Honora to feel his energy. Honora spoke. Anyways, I just want to say thank you. Sir Azel is really good at taking care of other people. Do you perhaps have a lot of siblings? No, I don't have any siblings. Although, I do have kids. So that's how it is. A. Honora was naturally nodding her head, when she became surprised. He had children. Azel was a married man. My God. You are married. Does it look like I'm married? I never thought about it. You are old enough that it wouldn't be strange if you were wed, but. It was the same in Azel's era. One went through one's coming of age ceremony at 15, and most married before one reached 20 years old. If Azel was a noble, it would be rare to find an unmarried man of his age. Azel spoke. I'm not married. Then how do you have children? Honora's gaze was turning curious as she looked at Azel. Azel grinned. Chapter 49. Guardian Shadows. Part 2. Don't look at me like that with those eyes. They were adopted. Adopted children. The children became orphans for various reasons, but I adopted them. Actually, there were other people who acted as their actual parents. Still, the children was a shining beacon in his memories. During the Dragon Demon War, Azel had seen a lot of tragedy. During this time, he had adopted children, whose fate brushed against his, and he had sent him to the lands owned by him, Marquis Kazark. After he killed Atain to end the Dragon Demon War, he was slowly dying from the curse. So he had retreated back into his territories for two years. During that time, he had made a lot of memories with his adopted children. They were like a real family during that time. He rode horses with them. They raced across the plains, and they found secret locations where other people wouldn't even dare to visit. He also taught them martial arts. There was once a time when he had lived in such a way. Honora, who had listened without interrupting him, spoke. Sir Azel must have been a noble. Is that so? Unless you are a noble, the activities you described is impossible. Moreover, it sounds like your family was prosperous. You really can't remember the details. Yes, I really want to remember it all. If I really turn out to be a noble, Muzanora has to treat me well. Him, sir I just have to stop calling you Arjushi. You are pretty quick on the uptake. Azel couldn't help, but laugh when Honora looked up at him in a cute manner. After purchasing the items, they visited a clinic. When they returned to their place of lodging with the healer, the sun was setting. Honora spoke in an excited manner. Wow, I want to always shop with someone like Sir Azel. So you want a strong servant? Azel grumbled. While they walked, she had bought needed travel items, and ingredients for food. The amount she bought wasn't a joke. These items would be divvied up between the horses during the travel, yet he had to hold it all right now by himself. Azel held a burden that was bigger than the size of his body. He acrobatically held it all with both hands, which caused a spectacle. 
People in the street stopped to watch him. Giles was surprised at the amount of luggage Azelle had brought. You carried all of this by yourself. Maybe we should have gone too. I didn't know she would buy this much. He couldn't tell Giles about Honora's cold assessment of him. So Azelle gave an ambiguous answer. Honora and the healer went to meet Harrietta, and Azelle went out to the garden in the back of the inn. Since this place catered to the nobles, the building was luxurious, and it had a pretty large garden. Him. He found Chiron there. The man had taken off his armor, and he had hidden his horn, ears and dragon demon stone. Chiron sat in an outdoor table disguised as a human, and he was drinking alcohol. Azel spoke. That's quite the disguise. If I show my real appearance in such a crowded place, it would be annoying to operate in that location. Unlike Arietta, who was basically a propaganda tool for the throne, Chiron often worked under the radar. This was why he spent a lot of his money making this personal magic tool that disguised his outer appearance. Chiron queried, Did you bring a healer? Yes. Musa Nora created a big fuss asking for a female healer, so it took some time. She is young, but she is quite good at her job. Do you want a cup? I won't refuse, but do you think I can ask you a question before that? By the way you are speaking, it seems your words will make me lose appetite for alcohol. What if I say no? Then I won't ask. If you are meekly backing off like this, then it must not be something important. No. I'll just give up on getting a glass of alcohol from the Duke, then I'll pursue the matter by myself. They seem to outstanding at hiding themselves, but if I chase after them myself. In a flash, the atmosphere froze. Azel looked at him with a smiling face, and Chiron glared back with a rigid expression on his face. The pressure emitted by him was so enormous that the air started to vibrate a little bit. However, Azel sloughed it off nonchalantly. Chiron spoke. You are quite adept at fending off my pressure. You are like a ghost, and it's putting me in a foul mood. I've had a lot of occasions where I received such pressures. If I'm flattened by this, then I would have been dead long ago. You are really too impudent. Normally, a person would be too afraid at the prospect of dying. If you were someone I could deal with by being polite, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. To tell you the truth, Azel sat across Chiron without asking for permission. Shouldn't I be a bit suspicious? There are unseen beings circling around us. Our party members don't know about their existence, yet their presence disappeared after meeting with you. It hasn't been too long since we were monitored and chased by the Dragon Demon King worshippers. I believe I have valid reasons to bring up this issue even though it might sour your taste for the alcohol. Who? Chiron tossed the rest of the alcohol into his mouth, as if he was annoyed. Then he glared at Azel. It was at that moment. Dragon demon magic. Azel flinched. Between the trees of the garden, he heard a voice that was akin to children whispering. He was this close to me. The voice was coming from a location only 20 meters away from Azel. How could he not realize someone had gotten so close to him? You are a human yet. The well of dragon demon magic. He was sure a single person was speaking, yet it sounded as if multiple people were whispering at the same time. It was a very strange voice. He would be a great subject for a horror story for the masses. Azel glared at the location with sharp eyes. Is he a specter? The other person wasn't a human. He was sure of it. The person had on a similar outfit as those from the dragon's shadow. He had a white robe with a hood covering his face. The shadow casted by the hood obscured his face. That wasn't the only oddity. Below the robe, Azel couldn't see his feet, and no hands were protruding out from his sleeves. How strange. Is there a real body underneath the robe? Azel furrowed his eyebrows, then he awakened his magic. Slowly, he moved so his opponent wouldn't realize it. He stealthily. Yet this. This feeling isn't wholly unfamiliar. What is this? The faceless specter's presence agitated some memory in Azel's mind. He was sure this was the first time he'd seen this being yet he felt a sense of deja vu. At that moment, Chiron spoke. Stop it. He isn't an enemy. Do you really think I would believe those words? Suddenly, another being could be detected by Azel's senses. He had appeared like a ghost, and he had the same outfit as the first spectre. The only difference was the size of their body. 
One was small like a child, and the other was a giant over two meters tall. As they glided across the floor, they spoke in their whispering voices. Is he a defender of the prophecy? No. Still, he has it. The dragon demon magic. Strange. Very strange. This kind of human hasn't existed for a long time. Azel couldn't see their faces, but he knew they were speaking about him. He could feel their gaze. Their eyes bore into Azel. Chiron spoke. Stop there. If you approach any further, this friend might attack you. We won't die easily. However, it isn't as if you can't be killed. Don't you have unfinished businesses? It would be best if you don't do anything that might result in you losing your strength. He isn't. He isn't strong enough to harm us. However, he has dragon demon magic. He is hiding it. Maybe we aren't reading him correctly. A human. There used to be. Really? Long time ago. They babbled as if they weren't sane. However, they circled around at a distance of 10 meters, and they didn't approach Azel any further. Chiron spoke. That's surprising. I've never seen him show so much interest in a single person. What are they? Azel asked in a nonchalant manner. Of course, he circulated his magical energy inside, so he could attack at any given moment. Chiron spoke. Guardian Shadows. You just gave me their name, and I still have no idea what they are. It would be difficult for me to tell you anything more. The fact that you even know about their existence. It makes me wonder what I should do with you. The Spectre, who had kept his silence since he first appeared, spoke. You can tell him. What? Chiron was surprised. This meant the Spectre's words was quite out of the norm. He isn't connected with us. Maybe the prophecy. The prophecy. What is that? Chiron frowned as he asked the question, but the spectres kept their mouths shut. Moreover, when the babbling by the spectres stopped, a very ominous silence descended on them. Him. Chiron didn't like it, but it was pointless to glare at the guardian shadows. A common sense approach didn't work with them in the first place. Eventually, Chiron gave up, and he gave an explanation to Azel. They are like a suppression system that prevents the Dragon Demon King worshippers from operating out in the open. The Dragon Demon King worshippers can't reveal themselves because of these things. Didn't you think what you experienced this time around was a bit unusual? Chiron answered a question with a question. Azel queried. What do you mean? The people, who ambushed your party, were very powerful. Each individual had a massive amount of power that is rarely seen. They easily used monsters as disposable soldiers. Why would those bastards with such power try so hard to hide their activities from the eyes of the people? I'm not sure. Isn't it because they were just a small elite unit inside the secret organization? Truthfully, Azel didn't entirely grasp how everything operated in this era, so he didn't get the point Chiron's question was trying to make. If one possessed powerful strength, then one could cause chaos in the world even without the help of others. However, it seemed the dragon's shadow were trying to look out for their own safety. What was weird about that? Chiron put on an expression as if he couldn't believe what Azel had said. Are you really dumber than I thought or did you really lose your memories? It is the latter. If you don't have anything worth saying then at the very least, think a little bit harder. If those bastards rampaged through the countryside, do you think anyone could stop them? Him. There will be a massive loss of lives. Only after they caused massive damage will anyone with strength hear about it. Only after the fact will anyone chase after the culprit. Azel slowly understood what Chiron was trying to say. Still, the power of the dragon demon king worshippers were a bit too strong for him to accept his explanation as the only reason. Either Niberus and Juran could be considered a one-man army. The members of the Dragon's Shadow from the first ambush had enough power to demolish a small town in the countryside. Moreover, they recruited the help of a dragon. They were capable of taking care of their own business. However, they used some method to train monsters to act as their hunting dogs, and they had been used as disposable soldiers. Moreover, a dragon was enticed to move on their behest. Now that I hear your words, they seem to be excessively cautious. However, isn't it because they are worried about the aftermath? Chapter 50. Guardian Shadows. Part 3. Why can't you accept this fact? For instance, when the woman named Niberus ambushed the party, 
Why did she go through all the trouble of setting up a stage where there weren't many inhabitants? Truthfully, with the amount of power she possessed, couldn't she have easily wiped a country village off of the map, while conducting her business? Him, he was right. No matter how he looked at it he couldn't understand why Nibiris went through such a complicated process to mount her surprise attack. Chiron spoke. Those bastards have to be careful to avoid attention from human eyes. If humans other than the dragon demon king worshippers spotted them, then the guardian shadows will become aware of their existence. The guardian shadows will hunt him down. What? Ah, of course, the system isn't foolproof. For example, I am a member of the guardian shadows. If I saw a dragon demon king worshipper, then it is the same as all the guardian shadows witnessing it. However, if a civilian spots a dragon demon king worshipper, there is a good chance the guardian shadows might overlook it. However, as the number of spectator increases, the chance of the guardian shadows noticing goes up. No. Wait a moment. That wasn't the question I wanted to ask you. What is it? It is as if you said. Azel understood the meaning of Chiron's words, so he shuddered. The clueless civilians. Anyone who isn't a dragon demon king worshipper is being used as surveillance network. Yes, Azel was struck dumb. Azel almost never showed his unrest, but he couldn't help looking at Chiron with a dumbfounded expression. Who could do such a thing? Excluding the dragon demon king worshippers, someone was using everyone as a tool for surveillance. Moreover, this person used the information to move these ghost-like apparitions to stop the dragon demon king worshippers. If the person capable of pulling this off said he was a god, Azel would have believed it. After a moment, Azel asked a question. Do you really think that makes any sense? I understand my explanation might sound like bullshit. So, the problem is it is the truth. I know it's hard to believe. Even I had a hard time believing it. The guardian shadows exist to stop the prophecy told by the dragon demon king worshippers. Prophecy. There is a prophecy saying that the dragon demon king Atane will overcome death to return to this land, and he will make world right. It really sounds like a prophecy that would be given by an evil church. Isn't it? However, those bastards accept it as absolute truth, so they are growing their power for the days to come. Unfortunately, unlike the other evil churches, they have a great amount of power. There are too many organizations to grasp anything of substance. There are a lot of organizations. Azel was confused, so he asked the question. There were a lot of organizations, not members. Chiron spoke. Yes. For example, I've never heard of the Dragon's Shadow, who ambushed you guys. They seem to be an organization with a level head and some ambition, and they had high-quality troops. Azel could easily take care of them, but all of the Dragon's Shadow members that showed up would be able to suppress the likes of Giles and Bor. Bor and Giles were quadruple masters with powerful battle capability, but the opponents were a step above them. Each of them were capable enough to easily deal with Arietta. It is well known that their headquarters are located in the Field of Darkness, but the members of the Dragon Demon King worshippers are divided into numerous organizations. They are structured in a very complex manner. Even if there were a lot of them, no one knows which organizations are the core groups. It makes it hard to deal with the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Him. If it wasn't for the Guardian Shadows, the world would be in a worse place right now. Moreover, the Dragon Demon King worshippers would boldly act out in the open. Him. Still, there is a part one don't understand. What is it? When the dragon's shadow ambushed the princess, we found out the ambushes were dragon demon king worshippers. However, the guardian shadows didn't show up. When you guys realized who they were, were the southern border guards with you? No. It was only the four of us, including the princess and I. That's probably why. Didn't I tell you in the beginning? This system isn't foolproof. There is a higher chance the Guardian Shadows will realize what is happening when numerous people witness the event. Moreover, the more people there are the more detailed report they could get. Instead of the countryside, the surveillance net is much stronger in a major city. It can't be helped, but the power of the surveillance is weakened in a place like the Balan Forest. Him. I guess so. When he heard Chiron's explanation, 
He understood why the dragon demon king worshippers acted the way they did. They had attacked the party at the Balin Forest and the Mountain Road where there weren't a lot of people. Moreover, they even tried to seal off an area from any outside observation. This was all done, because they were afraid of the Guardian Shadows. Azel queried, so who made such an amazing system? I would believe it if you said it was made by the God of Magic. I have no idea. What? I have no idea where the Guardian Shadows were born from. Someone might know what's the driving force behind him is, but I'm not the one in the know. What do you mean? The Guardian Shadows choose their successes from the living. However, it isn't as if we all know who the other members are. Basically, you can't really call it an organization. The whole thing is a mess. I can't deny your statement. It is as it is. There are only five people in this country, who know about them. Are you included in this number? Yes. There are only five. Each one of us are equal to 100 warriors, and we have vast influence over the world. However, we aren't enough to stop the Dragon Demon King worshippers. This is why the Guardian Shadows exist. The Guardian Shadow is the name of your organization, and it also is the name of these two beings. Yes. Him. Azel frowned as he looked at the Guardian Shadows. No matter how he tried he couldn't discern their true forms. It had been a really long time since he had felt these emotions. Chiron asked the Guardian Shadows. Do you want this friend to join as a member of the Guardian Shadows? This must be the reason why they showed themselves. It must be why they wanted him to give an explanation. The Guardian Shadows weren't capable of giving precise explanations, so members like Chiron had to explain everything to his fellow comrades. Of course, in the case I refused the offer, I had to swear a pact of silence before I heard their pitch. The pact of silence was a magic rite, and even Chiron couldn't break it. They had revealed the truth to Azel without making the pact, so truthfully, Chiron was a little bit annoyed. There were too many quirks in their actions that he couldn't comprehend their actions. No. What? Not right now. Not yet. We will watch. After saying those words, the guardian shadows disappeared like smoke. Azel spoke within the silence. They suddenly appear and disappear out of thin air. Moreover, they put a hairs on people, so people can't approach them. They are like the dragon demon king worshippers where they try their best to hide from the masses. From the moment the guardian shadows showed up, no one entered the garden. Moreover, even those who looked out the windows from the other buildings saw an intricately disguised illusion instead of reality. The guardian shadows had casted a barrier around them. Chiron continued to speak. Anyways, they only show themselves to the members of the organization. This time they came here because of me. They received direction information from me instead of the people. Can you have a proper conversation with them? Sometimes it is hard to understand their words, but they understand my words. Of course, I'm not sure about that fact either. Him. I have no idea why they revealed themselves, while putting their trust in you. Anyways, doesn't this prove I'm a trustworthy person regarding the dragon demon king worshippers? Him. Chiron put on a dissatisfied expression at those words. He looked at Azel for a moment, then he spoke. Unfortunately, you are right. I don't know how I should feel about you adding, unfortunately, to those words. Shut up. Just let me pour you some alcohol. Chiron grumbled as he poured Azel the alcohol. After obtaining horses, and equipments needed for the journey, the pace of the travel increased once again. They had already left the territory of the southern border guards, and Bor took on the role of deciding which roads they should take. We were delayed two days from our original schedule. It would be best if we restocked our food from the Marquis Ventar. We'll do so. Arietta passively accepted the suggestion. Before she would have chosen the quickest route, but they could travel at a leisurely pace, since Chiron had joined them. After several days, Bor and Giles started to get antsy. They had recuperated for a couple days after feeling the aftereffects of battle, but the two of them were martial artists in their prime. They lived to train their body, so they were overflowing with energy from just riding the horses. On the fourth day, they were almost at the Marquis Ventar's territory, and Azel once again started his sparring sessions with Giles and Bor. Since you guys weren't annoying me these days, I was having a good time. 
Stop being so heartless. Although, Sir Azel does have the skill to back up your behavior. Boar grumbled. Now Boar was able to interact with others in a comfortable manner. Giles smirked as he butted in. Since Sir Azel finds us annoying, why don't we play by ourselves? That might be the better option. Sir Azel could entertain the princess. Hey, hey, before anyone knew it, Giles and Boar had become friends, and Azel could only look on in disbelief. When they were departing for the trip, their relationship had been very rocky. After experiencing several life and death situations, they must have gotten quite close. It was at that moment. A training session. Do you mind if I join? Ah, Duke. Boar was surprised. Before anyone knew it, Chiron had appeared. Boar spoke in a humble manner. How can we dare? I heard from Arietta that you guys entertained that child. Why would it be different with me? Chiron put on a wide smile. He was called the Dragon Sword Duke, and in his territory, he sparred frequently with the knights under his command. The Duke wanted to train himself, but he also wanted to give instructions to his knights. I'm used to participating in sparring matches. You won't be injured from me using excessive force. But, in my territory, people line up to spar with me. Now that I come outside, I'm treated like cold rice. That isn't true. The fact that the Duke is willing to spar us is an honor in itself. Giles and Boar displayed a grateful attitude. Chiron was a living legend in the Rulan Kingdom, and he was the idol of every young knight.